Chapter 27 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 27 Buell and Bragg. Perryville. Rosecrans and Murfreesboro. Grant's Vicksburg Experiments. Grant's May Battles. Siege and Surrender of Vicksburg. Lincoln to Grant. Rosecrans's March to Chattanooga. Battle of Chickamauga. Grant at Chattanooga. Battle of Chattanooga. Burnside at Knoxville. Burnside repulses Longstreet. From the Virginia campaigns of 1863, we must return to the Western campaigns of the same year, or, to be more precise, beginning with the middle of 1862, when, in July of that year, Halleck was called to Washington to become General-in-Chief. The principal plan he left behind was that Buell, with the bulk of the forces which had captured Corinth, should move from that place eastward to occupy eastern Tennessee. Buell, however, progressed so leisurely that before he reached Chattanooga, the Confederate General Bragg, by a swift northward movement, advanced into eastern Kentucky, enacted the farce of appointing a Confederate governor for that state, and so threatened Louisville that Buell was compelled abruptly to abandon his eastward march and, turning to the north, run a neck-and-neck -neck race to save Louisville from rebel occupation. Successful in this, Buell immediately turned and, pursuing the now retreating forces of Bragg, brought them to bay at Perryville, where, on October 8, was fought a considerable battle from which Bragg immediately retreated out of Kentucky. While on one hand Bragg had suffered defeat, he had on the other caused Buell to give up all idea of moving into East Tennessee, an object on which the President had specially and repeatedly insisted. When Halleck specifically ordered Buell to resume and execute that plan, Buell urged such objections, and intimated such unwillingness, that on October 24, 1862, he was relieved from command, and General Rosecrans was appointed to succeed him. Rosecrans neglected the East Tennessee orders as heedlessly as Buell had done, but, reorganizing the Army of the Cumberland, and strengthening his communications, marched against Bragg, who had gone into winter quarters at Murfreesboro. The severe engagement of that name, fought on December 31, 1862, and the three succeeding days of the new year, between forces numbering about 43,000 on each side, was tactically a drawn battle. But its results rendered it an important Union victory, compelling Bragg to retreat, though for reasons which he never satisfactorily explained, Rosecrans failed for six months to follow up his evident advantages. The transfer of Halleck from the West to Washington in the summer of 1862 left Grant in command of the District of West Tennessee. But Buell's eastward expedition left him so few movable troops that during the summer and most of the autumn he was able to accomplish little except to defend his department by the repulse of the enemy at Iuka in September and at Corinth early in October, Rosencrantz being in local command at both places. It was for these successes that Rosencrantz was chosen to succeed Buell. Grant had doubtless given much of his enforced leisure to studying the great problem of opening the Mississippi a task which was thus left in his own hands, but for which, as yet, he found neither a theoretical solution, nor possessed an army sufficiently strong to begin practical work. Under the most favorable aspects, it was a formidable undertaking. Union gunboats had full control of the great river from Cairo as far south as Vicksburg, and Farragut's fleet commanded it from New Orleans as far north as Port Hudson. But the intervening link of two hundred miles between these places was in as complete possession of the Confederates, 
giving the rebellion uninterrupted access to the immense resources in men and supplies of the trans-Mississippi country, and effectually barring the free navigation of the river. Both the cities named were strongly fortified, but Vicksburg, on the east bank, by its natural situation on a bluff two hundred feet high, rising almost out of the stream, was unassailable from the river front. Farragut had, indeed, in midsummer passed up and down before it with little damage from its fire, but in return his own guns could no more do harm to its batteries than they could have bombarded a fortress in the clouds. When, by the middle of November 1862, Grant was able to reunite sufficient reinforcements, he started on a campaign directly southward toward Jackson, the capital of Mississippi, and sent Sherman, with an expedition from Memphis, down the river to the mouth of the Yazoo, hoping to unite these forces against Vicksburg. But before Grant reached Granada, his railroad communications were cut by a Confederate raid, and his great depot of supplies at Holly Springs, captured and burned, leaving him for two weeks without other provisions than such as he could gather by foraging. The costly lesson proved a valuable experience to him, which he soon put to use. Sherman's expedition also met disaster. Landing at Milliken's Bend, on the west bank of the Mississippi, he ventured a daring storming assault from the east bank of the Yazoo at Haines Bluff, ten miles north of Vicksburg, but met a bloody repulse. Having abandoned his railroad advance, Grant next joined Sherman at Milliken's Bend in January 1863, where also Admiral Porter, with a river squadron of seventy vessels, eleven of them ironclads, was added to his force. For the next three months, Grant kept his large army and flotilla busy with four different experiments to gain a practicable advance toward Vicksburg, until his fifth highly novel and to other minds, seemingly reckless and impossible plan secured him a brilliant success and results of immense military advantage. One experiment was to cut a canal across the tongue of land opposite Vicksburg, through which the flotilla might pass out of range of the Vicksburg guns. A second was to force the gunboats and transports up the tortuous and swampy Yazoo to find a landing far north of Haines Bluff. A third was for the flotilla to enter through Yazoo Pass and Coldwater River, two hundred miles above, and descend the Yazoo to a hoped-for landing. Still a fourth project was to cut a canal into Lake Providence, west of the Mississippi, seventy miles above, find a practicable waterway through two hundred miles of bayous and rivers, and establish communication with Banks and Farragut, who were engaged in an effort to capture Port Hudson. The time, the patience, the infinite labor, and enormous expense of these several projects were utterly wasted. Early in April, Grant began an entirely new plan, which was opposed by all his ablest generals, and, tested by the accepted rules of military science, looked like a headlong venture of rash desperation. During the month of April, he caused Admiral Porter to prepare fifteen or twenty vessels, ironclads, steam transports and provision barges, and run them boldly by night past the Vicksburg and, later, past the Grand Gulf batteries, which the Admiral happily accomplished with very little loss. Meanwhile, the General, by a very circuitous route of seventy miles, marched an army of thirty-five thousand down the west bank of the Mississippi and, with Porter's vessels and transports, crossed them to the east side of the river at Bruinsburg. From this point, with an improvised train of country vehicles to carry his ammunition, and living meanwhile entirely upon the country, as he had learned to do in his baffled Granada expedition, he made one of the most rapid and brilliant campaigns in military history. In the first twenty days of May he marched one hundred and eighty miles, and fought five winning battles, respectively Port Gibson, Raymond, Jackson, Champions Hill, and Big Black River, in each of which he brought his practically united force against the enemy's separated detachments, capturing altogether eighty-eight guns and over six thousand prisoners, and shutting up the Confederate General Pemberton in Vicksburg. 
by a rigorous siege of six weeks, he then compelled his antagonist to surrender the strongly fortified city with 172 cannon, and his army of nearly 30,000 men. On the 4th of July, 1863, the day after Meade's crushing defeat of Lee at Gettysburg, the surrender took place, citizens and Confederate soldiers doubtless rejoicing that the old national holiday gave them escape from their caves and bomb-proofs, and full Yankee rations to still their long-endured hunger. The splendid victory of Grant brought about a quick and important echo. About the time that the Union army closed around Vicksburg, General Banks, on the lower Mississippi, began a close investment and siege of Port Hudson, which he pushed with determined tenacity. When the rebel garrison heard the artillery salutes which were fired by order of Banks to celebrate the surrender of Vicksburg, and the rebel commander was informed of Pemberton's disaster, he also gave up the defense, and on July 9 surrendered Port Hudson with 6,000 prisoners and 51 guns. Great national rejoicing followed this double success of the Union arms on the Mississippi, which, added to Gettysburg, formed the turning tide in the War of the Rebellion, and no one was more elated over these western victories, which fully restored the free navigation of the Mississippi, than President Lincoln. Like that of the whole country, his patience had been severely tried by the long and ineffectual experiments of Grant. But from first to last, Mr. Lincoln had given him firm and undeviating confidence and support. He not only gave the general quick promotion, but crowned the official reward with the following generous letter. Quote, My dear General, I do not remember that you and I ever met personally. I write this now as a grateful acknowledgment for the almost inestimable service you have done the country. I wish to say a word further. When you first reached the vicinity of Vicksburg, I thought you should do what you finally did. March the troops across the neck, run the batteries with the transports, and thus go below. And I never had any faith, except a general hope that you knew better than I, that the Yazoo Pass expedition and the like could succeed. When you got below and took Port Gibson, Grand Gulf, and vicinity, I thought you should go down the river and join General Banks, and when you turned northward, east of the Big Black, I feared it was a mistake. I now wish to make the personal acknowledgment that you were right and I was wrong. End of quote. It has already been mentioned that General Rosecrans, after winning the Battle of Murfreesboro at the beginning of 1863, remained inactive at that place nearly six months, though, of course, constantly busy recruiting his army, gathering supplies, and warning off several troublesome Confederate cavalry raids. The defeated General Bragg retreated only to Shelbyville, ten miles south of the battlefield he had been obliged to give up and the military frontier thus divided Tennessee between the contestants. Against repeated prompting and urging from Washington, Rosecrans continued to find real or imaginary excuses for delay until midsummer when, as if suddenly awaking from a long lethargy, he made a bold advance and by a nine days campaign of skillful strategy forced Bragg into a retreat that stopped only at Chattanooga, south of the Tennessee River, which, with the surrounding mountains, made it the strategical center and military key to the heart of Georgia and the South. This march of Rosecrans, ending the day before the Vicksburg surrender, again gave the Union forces full possession of Middle Tennessee down to its southern boundary. The march completed, and the enemy thus successfully maneuvered out of the state, Rosecrans once more came to a halt, and made no further movement for six weeks. The President and General Halleck were already out of patience with Rosecrans for his long previous delay. Bragg's retreat to Chattanooga was such a gratifying and encouraging supplement to the victories of Vicksburg and Port Hudson that they felt the Confederate Army should not be allowed to rest, recruit, and fortify the important gateway to the heart of the Southern Confederacy, and early in August sent Rosecrans peremptory orders to advance. 
This direction seemed the more opportune and necessary, since Burnside had organized a special Union force in eastern Kentucky, and was about starting on a direct campaign into East Tennessee. Finally, obeying this explicit injunction, Rosecrans took the initiative in the middle of August by a vigorous southward movement, threatening Chattanooga from the north, he marched instead around the left flank of Bragg's army, boldly crossing the Cumberland Mountains, the Tennessee River, and two mountain ranges beyond. Bragg, seriously alarmed lest Rosecrans should seize the railroad communications behind him, hastily evacuated Chattanooga, but not with the intention of flight, as Rosecrans erroneously believed and reported. When on September 9, the left of Rosecrans's army marched into Chattanooga without firing a shot, the Union detachments were so widely scattered in separating mountain valleys, in pursuit of Bragg's imaginary retreat, that Bragg believed he saw his chance to crush them in detail before they could unite. With this resolve, Bragg turned upon his antagonist, but his effort at quick concentration was delayed by the natural difficulties of the ground. By September 19, both armies were well gathered on opposite sides of Chickamauga Creek, eight miles southeast of Chattanooga, each commander being as yet, however, little informed of the other's position and strength. Bragg had over 71,000 men, Rosecrans, 57,000. The conflict was finally begun, rather by accident than design, and on that day and the 20th was fought the Battle of Chickamauga, one of the severest encounters of the whole war. Developing itself without clear knowledge on either side, it became a moving conflict, Bragg constantly extending his attack toward his right, and Rosecrans meeting the onset with prompt shifting toward his left. In this changing contest, Rosecrans's army underwent an alarming crisis on the second day of the battle. A mistake or miscarriage of orders opened a gap of two brigades in his line, which the enemy quickly found, and through which the Confederate battalions rushed with an energy that swept away the whole Union right in a disorderly retreat. Rosecrans himself was caught in the panic and, believing the day irretrievably lost, hastened back to Chattanooga to report the disaster and collect what he might of his flying army. The hopeless prospect, however, soon changed. General Thomas, second in command and originally in charge of the center, had been sent by Rosecrans to the extreme left and had, while the right was giving way, successfully repulsed the enemy in his front. He had been so fortunate as to secure a strong position on the head of a ridge around which he gathered such remnants of the beaten detachments as he could collect, amounting to about half the Union army, and here, from two o'clock in the afternoon until dark, he held his semicircular line against repeated assaults of the enemy, with a heroic valor that earned him the sobriquet of the Rock of Chickamauga. At night, Thomas retired under orders to Rossville, halfway to Chattanooga. The President was, of course, greatly disappointed when Rosecrans telegraphed that he had met a serious disaster, but this disappointment was mitigated by the quickly following news of the magnificent defense and the successful stand made by General Thomas at the close of the battle. Mr. Lincoln immediately wrote in a note to Halleck, Quote, I think it is very important for General Rosecrans to hold his position at or about Chattanooga, because, if held, from that place to Cleveland, both inclusive, it keeps all Tennessee clear of the enemy, and also breaks one of his most important railroad lines. If he can only maintain this position, without more, this rebellion can only eke out a short and feeble existence, as an animal sometimes may with a thorn in its vitals. End of quote. And to Rosecrans he telegraphed directly, bidding him be of good cheer, and adding, quote, we shall do our utmost to assist you. End quote. To this end, the administration took instant and energetic measures. On the night of September 23, the President, General Halleck, several members of the Cabinet, and leading Army and railroad officials met in an improvised council at the War Department and issued emergency orders under which two Army Corps from the Army of the Potomac 
numbering twenty thousand men in all, with their arms and equipments ready for the field, the whole under command of General Hooker, were transported from their camps on the Rapidan by railway to Nashville and the Tennessee River in the next eight days. Burnside, who had arrived at Knoxville early in September, was urged by repeated messages to join Rosecrans, and other reinforcements were already on the way from Memphis and Vicksburg. All this help, however, was not instantly available. Before it could arrive, Rosecrans felt obliged to draw together within the fortifications of Chattanooga, while Bragg quickly closed about him, and by practically blockading Rosecrans's river communication, placed him in a state of siege. In a few weeks, the limited supplies brought the Union army face to face with famine. It having become evident that Rosecrans was incapable of extricating it from its peril, he was relieved and the command given to Thomas, while the three western departments were consolidated under General Grant, and he was ordered, personally, to proceed to Chattanooga, which place he reached on October 22. Before his arrival, General W. F. Smith had devised and prepared an ingenious plan to regain control of river communication. Under the orders of Grant, Smith successfully executed it, and full rations soon restored vigor and confidence to the Union troops. The considerable reinforcements under Hooker and Sherman coming up put the besieging enemy on the defensive, and active preparations were begun, which resulted in the famous battle and overwhelming Union victory of Chattanooga on November 23, 24, and 25, 1863. The city of Chattanooga lies on the southeastern bank of the Tennessee River. Back of the city, Chattanooga Valley forms a level plain about two miles in width to Missionary Ridge, a narrow mountain range 500 feet high, generally parallel to the course of the Tennessee, extending far to the southwest. The Confederates had fortified the upper end of Missionary Ridge to a length of five to seven miles opposite the city lining its long crest with about thirty guns, amply supported by infantry. This formidable barrier was still further strengthened by two lines of rifle pits, one at the base of Missionary Ridge next to the city, and another with advanced pickets still nearer Chattanooga northward. The enemy strongly held the end of Missionary Ridge, where the railroad tunnel passes through it. Southward they held the yet stronger point of Lookout Mountain, whose rocky base turns the course of the Tennessee River in a short bend to the north. Grant's plan in rough outline was that Sherman, with the Army of the Tennessee, should storm the northern end of Missionary Ridge at the railroad tunnel. Hooker, stationed at Wahatchee, 13 miles to the southwest, with his two corps from the Army of the Potomac, should advance toward the city, storming the point of Lookout Mountain on his way and Thomas, in the city, attacked the direct front of Missionary Ridge. The actual beginning slightly varied this program, with a change of corps and divisions, but the detail is not worth noting. Beginning on the night of November 23, Sherman crossed his command over the Tennessee, and on the afternoon of the 24th, gained the northern end of Missionary Ridge, driving the enemy before him as far as the railroad tunnel. Here, however, he found a deep gap in the ridge, previously unknown to him, which barred his further progress. That same afternoon, Hooker's troops worked their way through mist and fog up the rugged sides of Lookout Mountain, winning the brilliant success which has become famous as the Battle Above the Clouds. That same afternoon, also, two divisions of the center, under the eyes of Grant and Thomas, pushed forward the Union line about a mile, seizing and fortifying a hill called Orchard Knob, capturing Bragg's first line of rifle pits and several hundred prisoners. So far everything had occurred to inspirit the Union troops and discourage the enemy. But the main incident was yet to come, on the afternoon of November 25. All the forenoon of that day Grant waited eagerly to see Sherman making progress along the north end of Missionary Ridge, not knowing that he had met an impassable valley. Grant's patience was equally tried at hearing no news from Hooker, 
though that general had successfully reached Missionary Ridge and was ascending the gap near Rossville. At three o'clock in the afternoon, Grant at length gave Thomas the order to advance. Eleven Union brigades rushed forward with orders to take the enemy's rifle pits at the base of Missionary Ridge and then halt to reform. But such was the ease of this first capture, such the eagerness of the men who had been waiting all day for the moment of action, that, after but a slight pause, without orders, and moved by a common impulse, they swept on and up the steep and rocky face of Missionary Ridge, heedless of the enemy's fire from rifle and cannon at the top, until in fifty-five minutes after leaving their positions they almost simultaneously broke over the crest of the ridge in six different places, capturing the batteries and making prisoners of the supporting infantry, who, surprised and bewildered by the daring escalade, made little or no further resistance. Bragg's official report soundly berates the conduct of his men, apparently forgetting the heavy loss they had inflicted on their assailants, but regardless of which the Union veterans mounted to victory in an almost miraculous exultation of patriotic heroism. Bragg's Confederate army was not only beaten, but hopelessly demoralized by the fiery Union assault, and fled in panic and retreat. Grant kept up a vigorous pursuit to a distance of twenty miles, which he ceased in order to send an immediate strong reinforcement under Sherman to relieve Burnside, besieged by the Confederate General Longstreet at Knoxville. But before this help arrived, Burnside had repulsed Longstreet, who, promptly informed of the Chattanooga disaster, retreated in the direction of Virginia. Not being pursued, however, this general again wintered in East Tennessee, and for the same reason the beaten army of Bragg halted in its retreat from Missionary Ridge at Dalton, where it also went into winter quarters. The Battle of Chattanooga had opened the great central gateway to the south, but the rebel army, still determined and formidable, yet lay in its path, only twenty-eight miles away. End of chapter 27 Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois Chapter 28 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John George Nicolay. Chapter 28. Grant, Lieutenant General. Interview with Lincoln. Grant visits Sherman. Plan of campaigns. Lincoln to Grant. From the wilderness to Cold Harbor. The move to City Point. Siege of Petersburg, Early Menaces Washington, Lincoln Under Fire, Sheridan in the Shenandoah Valley. The army rank of lieutenant general had, before the Civil War, been conferred only twice on American commanders, on Washington for service in the War of Independence, and on Scott for his conquest of Mexico. As a reward for the victories of Donelson, Vicksburg, and Chattanooga, Congress passed, and the President signed in February 1864, an act to revive that grade. Calling Grant to Washington, the President met him for the first time at a public reception at the Executive Mansion on March 8, when the famous general was received with all the manifestations of interest and enthusiasm possible in a social state ceremonial. On the following day, at one o'clock, the general's formal investiture with his new rank and authority took place in the presence of Mr. Lincoln, the cabinet, and a few other officials. "'General Grant,' said the president, "'the nation's appreciation of what you have done, and its reliance upon you for what remains to do in the existing great struggle, are now presented with this commission constituting you lieutenant general in the Army of the United States.' With this high honor devolves upon you, also, a corresponding responsibility. As the country herein trusts you, so, under God, it will sustain you. I scarcely need to add that with what I here speak for the nation goes my own hearty personal concurrence. General Grant's reply was modest, and also very brief. Mr. President, I accept this commission with gratitude for the high honor conferred. 
With the aid of the noble armies that have fought on so many fields for our common country, it will be my earnest endeavor not to disappoint your expectations. I feel the full weight of the responsibilities now devolving on me, and I know that if they are met, it will be due to those armies, and above all to the favor of that providence which leads both nations and men. In the informal conversation which followed, General Grant inquired what special service was expected of him, to which the President replied that the country wanted him to take Richmond, and being asked if he could do so, replied that he could if he had the troops, which he was assured would be furnished him. On the following day, Grant went to the Army of the Potomac, where Meade received him with frank courtesy, generously suggesting that he was ready to yield the command to any one Grant might prefer. Grant, however, informed me that he desired to make no change, and, returning to Washington, started west without a moment's loss of time. On March 12, 1864, formal orders of the War Department placed Grant in command of all the armies of the United States, while Halleck, relieved from that duty, was retained at Washington as the President's Chief of Staff. Grant frankly confesses in his memoirs that when he started east, it was with a firm determination to accept no appointment requiring him to leave the west. But when I got to Washington and saw the situation, it was plain that here was the point for the commanding general to be. His short visit had removed several false impressions, and future experience was to cure him of many more. When Grant again met Sherman in the west, he outlined to that general, who had become his most intimate and trusted brother officer, the very simple and definite military policy which was to be followed during the year 1864. There were to be but two leading campaigns. Sherman, starting from Chattanooga, full master of his own movements, was to lead the combined western forces against the Confederate army under Johnston, the successor of Bragg. Grant would personally conduct the campaign in the east against Richmond, or rather against the rebel army under Lee. Meade would be left in immediate command of the Army of the Potomac to execute the personal daily directions of Grant. The two Confederate armies were 800 miles apart, and should either give way, it was to be followed without halt or delay to battle or surrender, to prevent its junction with the other. Scattered as a large portion of the Union forces were in garrisons and detachments at widely separated points, there were, of course, many details to be arranged, and a few expeditions already in progress. But these were of minor importance, and for contributory rather than main objects, and need not here be described. Returning promptly to Washington, Grant established his headquarters with the Army of the Potomac at Culpeper, and for about a month actively pushed his military preparations. He seems at first to have been impressed with a dread that the President might wish to influence or control his plans. But the few interviews between them removed the suspicion which reckless newspaper accusation had raised, and all doubt on this point vanished when, on the last day of April, Mr. Lincoln sent him the following explicit letter. Not expecting to see you again before the spring campaign opens, I wish to express in this way my entire satisfaction with what you have done up to this time, so far as I understand it. The particulars of your plan I neither know nor seek to know. You are vigilant and self-reliant, and, pleased with this, I wish not to obtrude any constraints or restraints upon you. While I am very anxious that any great disaster or capture of our men in great numbers shall be avoided, I know these points are less likely to escape your attention than they would be mine. If there is anything wanting which is within my power to give, do not fail to let me know it. And now, with a brave army and a just cause, may God sustain you. Grant's immediate reply confessed the groundlessness of his apprehensions. From my first entrance into the volunteer service of the country to the present day, I have never had cause of complaint have never expressed or implied a complaint against the administration or the Secretary of War for throwing any embarrassment in the way of my vigorously prosecuting what appeared to be my duty. Indeed, since the promotion which placed me in command of all the armies, and in view of the great responsibility and importance of success, I have been astonished at the readiness with which everything asked for has been yielded, without even an explanation being asked. Should my success be less than I desire and expect, the least I can say is, the fault is not with you. 
The Union Army under Grant, 122,000 strong, on April 30, was encamped north of the Rapidan River. The Confederate Army under Lee, numbering 62,000, lay south of that stream. Nearly three years before, these opposing armies had fought their first battle of Bull Run, only a comparatively short distance north of where they now confronted each other. Campaign and battle between them had surged far to the north and to the south, but neither could as yet claim over the other any considerable gain of ground or of final advantage in the conflict. Broadly speaking, relative advance and retreat, as well as relative loss and gain of battlefields, substantially balanced each other. Severe as had been their struggles in the past, a more arduous trial of strength was before them. Grant had two to one in numbers. Lee the advantage of a defensive campaign. He could retire toward cumulative reserves and into prepared fortifications, knew almost by heart every road, hill, and forest of Virginia, had for his friendly scout every white inhabitant. Perhaps his greatest element of strength lay in the conscious pride of the Confederate Army that through all fluctuations of success and failure it had for three years effectually barred the way of the Army of the Potomac to Richmond. But to offset this, there now menaced it what was before absent in every encounter, the grim, unflinching will of the new Union commander. General Grant devised no plan of complicated strategy for the problem before him, but proposed to solve it by plain, hard, persistent fighting. He would endeavor to crush the army of Lee before it could reach Richmond or unite with the army of Johnston, or, failing in that, he would shut it up in that stronghold and reduce it by a siege. With this in view, he instructed Meade at the very outset, Lee's army will be your objective point. Where Lee goes, there you will go also. Everything being ready, on the night of May 4, Meade threw five bridges across the Rapidan, and before the following night, the whole Union army, with its trains, was across the stream, moving southward by the left flank, past the right flank of the Confederates. Sudden as was the advance, it did not escape the vigilant observation of Lee, who instantly threw his force against the flanks of the Union columns, and for two days there raged in that difficult, broken, and tangled region known as the Wilderness, a furious battle of detachments along a line five miles in length. Thickets, swamps, and ravines rendered intelligent direction and concerted maneuvering impossible, and furious and bloody as was the conflict, its results were indecisive. No enemy appearing on the 7th, Grant boldly started to Spotsylvania Courthouse, only, however, to find the Confederates ahead of him, and on the 8th and ninth, these turned their position, already strong by nature, into an impregnable entrenched camp. Grant assaulted their works on the 10th, fiercely but unsuccessfully. There followed one day of inactivity, during which Grant wrote his report, only claiming that after six days of hard fighting and heavy losses, the result up to this time is much in our favor, but expressing, in the phrase which immediately became celebrated, his firm resolution to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. On May 12, 1864, Grant ordered a yet more determined attack, in which, with fearful carnage on both sides, the Union forces finally stormed the earthworks, which have become known as the Bloody Angle. But finding that other and more formidable entrenchments still resisted his entrance to the Confederate camp, Grant once more moved by the left flank past his enemy toward Richmond. Lee followed with equal swiftness along the interior lines. Days passed in an intermitting and about equally matched contest of strategy and fighting. The difference was that Grant was always advancing and Lee always retiring. On May 26, Grant reported to Washington, Lee's army is really whipped. The prisoners we now take show it, and the action of his army shows it unmistakably. A battle with them outside of entrenchments cannot be had. Our men feel that they have gained the morale over the enemy, and attack him with confidence. I may be mistaken, but I feel that our success over Lee's army is already assured. That same night, Grant's advance crossed the Pamunkey River at Hanover Town, and during another week, with a succession of marching, flanking, and fighting. Grant pushed the Union army forward to Cold Harbor. Here, Lee's entrenched army was again between him and Richmond, and on June 3, Grant ordered another determined attack in front to break through that constantly resisting barrier. 
but a disastrous repulse was the consequence. Its effect upon the campaign is best given in Grant's own letter, written to Washington on June 5. My idea from the start has been to beat Lee's army, if possible, north of Richmond. Then, after destroying his lines of communication on the north side of the James River, to transfer the army to the south side and besiege Lee in Richmond, or follow him south if he should retreat. I now find, after over thirty days of trial, the enemy deems it of the first importance to run no risks with the armies they now have. They act purely on the defensive behind breastworks, or feebly on the offensive immediately in front of them, and where, in case of repulse, they can instantly retire behind them. Without a greater sacrifice of human life than I am willing to make, all cannot be accomplished that I had designed outside of the city. During the week succeeding the severe repulse at Cold Harbor, which closed what may be summed up as Grant's campaign against Richmond, he made his preparations to enter upon the second element of his general plan, which may be most distinctively denominated the Siege of Petersburg, though in fuller phraseology it might be called the Siege of Petersburg and Richmond combined. But the amplification is not essential, for, though the operation and the siege works embraced both cities, Petersburg was the vital and vulnerable point. When Petersburg fell, Richmond fell of necessity. The reason was that Lee's army, enclosed within the combined fortifications, could only be fed by the use of three railroads centering at Petersburg, one from the southeast, one from the south, and one with general access from the southwest. Between these, two plank roads added a partial means of supply. Thus far, Grant's active campaign, though failing to destroy Lee's army, had nevertheless driven it into Richmond, and obviously his next step was either to dislodge it or compel it to surrender. Cold Harbor was about ten miles from Richmond, and that city was enclosed on the Washington side by two circles of fortifications devised with the best engineering skill. On June 13, Grant threw forward an army corps across the Chickahominy, deceiving Lee into the belief that he was making a real direct advance upon the city, and so skillfully concealed his intention that by midnight of the 16th he had moved the whole Union army with its artillery and trains about twenty miles directly south and across the James River on a pontoon bridge over two thousand feet long to City Point. General Butler, with an expedition from Fortress Monroe, moving early in May, had been ordered to capture Petersburg, and though he failed in this, he had nevertheless seized and held City Point, and Grant thus effected an immediate junction with Butler's force of 32,000. Butler's second attempt to seize Petersburg while Grant was marching to join him also failed, and Grant, unwilling to make any needless sacrifice, now limited his operations to the processes of a regular siege. This involved a complete change of method. The campaign against Richmond, from the crossing of the Rapidan and the Battle of the Wilderness to Cold Harbor and the change of base to City Point, occupied a period of about six weeks of almost constant swift marching and hard fighting. The siege of Petersburg was destined to involve more than nine months of mingled engineering and fighting. The Confederate Army, forming the combined garrisons of Richmond and Petersburg, numbered about 70,000. The army under Grant, though in its six weeks' campaign it had lost over 60,000 in killed, wounded, and missing, was again raised by the reinforcements sent to it, and by its junction with Butler, to a total of about 150,000. With this superiority of numbers, Grant pursued the policy of alternately threatening the defenses of Lee, sometimes south, sometimes north of the James River, and at every favorable opportunity pushing his siege works westward in order to gradually gain and command the three railroads and two plank roads that brought the bulk of absolutely necessary food and supplies to the confederate armies and the inhabitants of petersburg and richmond it is estimated that this gradual westward extension of grant's lines redoubts and trenches when added to those threatening richmond and petersburg on the east finally reached a total development of about forty miles the catastrophe came when Lee's army grew insufficient to man his defensive line along this entire length, and Grant, finding the weakened places, eventually broke through it, compelling the Confederate general and army to evacuate and abandon both cities and seek safety in flight. The central military drama, the first two distinctive acts of which are outlined above, 
had during this long period a running accompaniment of constant underplot and shifting and exciting episodes. The Shenandoah River, rising northwest of Richmond, but flowing in a general northeast course to join the Potomac at Harper's Ferry, gives its name to a valley twenty to thirty miles wide, highly fertile and cultivated, and having throughout its length a fine turnpike, which in anti-railroad days was an active commercial highway between north and south. Bordered on the west by the rugged Allegheny Mountains, and on the east by the single outlying range called the Blue Ridge, it formed a protected military lane or avenue, having vital relation to the strategy of campaigns on the open Atlantic slopes of central Virginia. The Shenandoah Valley had thus played a not unimportant part in almost every military operation of the war, from the first battle of Bull Run to the final defense of Richmond. The plans of General Grant did not neglect so essential a feature of his task. While he was fighting his way toward the Confederate capital, his instructions contemplated the possession and occupation of the Shenandoah Valley as part of the system which should isolate and eventually besiege Richmond but this part of his plan underwent many fluctuations. He had scarcely reached City Point when he became aware that General Lee, equally alive to the advantages of the Shenandoah Valley, had dispatched General Early with 17,000 men on a flying expedition up that convenient natural sally port, which was for the moment undefended. Early made such speed that he crossed the Potomac during the first week of July, made a devastating raid through Maryland and southern Pennsylvania, threatened Baltimore, and turning sharply to the south, was, on the eleventh of the month, actually at the outskirts of Washington City, meditating its assault and capture. Only the opportune arrival of the Sixth Army Corps under General Wright, on the afternoon of that day, sent hurriedly by Grant from City Point, saved the Federal capital from occupation and perhaps destruction by the enemy. Certain writers have represented the government as panic-stricken during the two days that this menace lasted, but neither Mr. Lincoln, nor Secretary Stanton, nor General Halleck, whom it has been even more the fashion to abuse, lacked coolness or energy in the emergency. Indeed, the President's personal unconcern was such as to give his associates much uneasiness. On the 10th he rode out, as was his usual custom during the summer months, to spend the night at the soldiers' home in the suburbs. But Secretary Stanton, learning that Early was advancing in heavy force, sent after him to compel his return to the city, and twice afterward, intent on watching the fighting which took place near Fort Stevens, he exposed his tall form to the gaze and bullets of the enemy, in a manner to call forth earnest remonstrance from those near him. The succeeding military events in the Shenandoah Valley must here be summed up in the brief statement that General Sheridan, being placed in command of the Middle Military Division, and given an army of thirty or forty thousand men, finally drove back the Confederate detachments upon Richmond, in a series of brilliant victories, and so devastated the southern end of the valley as to render it untenable for either army, and by the destruction of the james river canal and the virginia central railroad succeeded in practically carrying out grant's intention of effectually closing the avenue of supplies to richmond from the northwest end of chapter twenty eight Chapter 29 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 29 Sherman's Meridian Expedition. Capture of Atlanta. Hood supersedes Johnston, Hood's invasion of Tennessee, Franklin and Nashville, Sherman's march to the sea, capture of Savannah, Sherman to Lincoln, Lincoln to Sherman, Sherman's march through the Carolinas, the burning of Charleston and Columbia, arrival at Goldsboro, junction with Schofield, visit to Grant. While Grant was making his marches, fighting his battles, and carrying on his siege operations in Virginia, Sherman in the West was performing the task assigned to him by his chief to pursue, destroy, or capture the principal Western Confederate Army, now commanded by General Johnston. 
The forces which under Bragg had been defeated in the previous autumn at Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge had halted as soon as pursuit ceased and remained in winter quarters at and about Dalton, only 28 or 30 miles on the railroad southeast of Chattanooga, where their new commander, Johnston, had, in the spring of 1864, about 68,000 men with which to oppose the Union advance. A few preliminary campaigns and expeditions in the West need not here be detailed, as they were not decisive. One, however, led by Sherman himself, from Vicksburg to Meridian, must be mentioned since, during the month of February, it destroyed about 100 miles of the several railroads centering at the latter place, and rendered the whole railroad system of Mississippi practically useless to the Confederates, thus contributing essentially to the success of his future operations. Sherman prepared himself by uniting at Chattanooga, the best material of the three Union armies, that of the Cumberland, that of the Tennessee, and that of the Ohio, forming a force of nearly 100,000 men with 254 guns. They were seasoned veterans, whom three years of campaigning had taught how to endure every privation and avail themselves of every resource. They were provided with every essential supply, but carried with them not a pound of useless baggage or impedimenta that could retard the rapidity of their movements. Sherman had received no specific instructions from Grant, except to fight the enemy and damage the war resources of the South. But the situation before him clearly indicated the city of Atlanta, Georgia, as his first objective and as his necessary route the railroad leading thither from Chattanooga. It was obviously a difficult line of approach, for it traversed a belt of the Alleghenies forty miles in width, and, in addition to the natural obstacles they presented, the Confederate commander, anticipating his movement, had prepared elaborate defensive works at the several most available points. As agreed upon with Grant, Sherman began his march on May 5, 1864, the day following that on which Grant entered upon his wilderness campaign in Virginia. These pages do not afford space to describe his progress. It is enough to say that with his double numbers, he pursued the policy of making strong demonstrations in front with effective flank movements to threaten the railroad in the Confederate rear, by which means he forced back the enemy successively from point to point until by the middle of July he was in the vicinity of Atlanta, having during his advance made only one serious front attack, in which he met a costly repulse. His progress was by no means one of mere strategical maneuver. Sherman says that during the month of May, across nearly 100 miles of as difficult country as was ever fought over by the civilized armies, the fighting was continuous, almost daily, among trees and bushes, on ground where one could rarely see 100 yards ahead. However skillful and meritorious may have been the retreat into which Johnston had been forced, it was so unwelcome to the Richmond authorities and damaging to the Confederate cause that about the middle of July, Jefferson Davis relieved him and appointed one of his corps commanders, General J.B. Hood, in his place, whose personal qualities and free criticism of his superior led them to expect a change from a defensive to an aggressive campaign. Responding to this expectation, Hood almost immediately took the offensive and made vigorous attacks on the Union positions, but met disastrous repulse and found himself fully occupied in guarding the defenses of Atlanta. For some weeks, each army tried ineffectual methods to seize the other's railroad communications. But, toward the end of August, Sherman's flank movements gained such a hold of the Macon Railroad at Jonesboro, 25 miles south of Atlanta, as to endanger Hood's security. And, when, in addition, a detachment sent to dislodge Sherman was defeated, Hood had no alternative but to order an evacuation. On September 3rd, Sherman telegraphed to Washington, quote, Atlanta is ours, and fairly won, 
Since May 5th, we have been in one constant battle or skirmish and need rest, end quote. The fall of Atlanta was a heavy blow to the Confederates. They had, during the war, transformed it into a city of mills, foundries, and workshops, from which they drew supplies, ammunition, and equipments, and upon which they depended largely for the manufacture and repair of arms. But perhaps even more important than the military damage to the South resulting from its capture was its effect upon Northern politics. Until then, the presidential campaign in progress throughout the free states was thought by many to involve fluctuating chances under the heavy losses and apparently slow progress of both eastern and western armies. But the capture of Atlanta instantly infused new zeal and confidence among the Union voters, and from that time onward the re-election of Mr. Lincoln was placed beyond reasonable doubt. Sherman personally entered the city on September 8th and took prompt measures to turn it into a purely military post. He occupied only the inner line of its formidable defenses, but so strengthened them as to make the place practically impregnable. He proceeded at once to remove all its non-combatant inhabitants with their effects, arranging a truce with Hood, under which he furnished transportation to the South for all those whose sympathies were with the Confederate cause, and sent to the North those who preferred that destination. Hood raised a great outcry against what he called such barbarity and cruelty, but Sherman replied that war is war, and if the rebel families wanted peace, they and their relatives must stop fighting. Quote, God will judge us in due time, and he will pronounce whether it be more humane to fight with a town full of women and the families of a brave people at our back, or to remove them in time to places of safety among their own friends and people. End quote. Up to his occupation of Atlanta, Sherman's further plans had neither been arranged by Grant nor determined by himself, and for a while remained somewhat undecided. For the time being, he was perfectly secure in the new stronghold he had captured and completed, but his supplies depended upon a line of about 120 miles of railroad from Atlanta to Chattanooga, and very near 150 miles more from Chattanooga to Nashville. Hood, held at bay at Lovejoy Station, was not strong enough to venture a direct attack or undertake a siege, but chose the more feasible policy of operating systematically against Sherman's long line of communications. In the course of some weeks, both sides grew weary of the mere waste of time and military strength consumed in attacking and defending railroad stations, and interrupting and reestablishing the regularities of provision trains. Toward the end of September, Jefferson Davis visited Hood and in rearranging some army assignments, united Hood's and an adjoining Confederate department under the command of Beauregard, partly with a view to adding the counsels of the latter to the always energetic and bold, but sometimes rash military judgment of Hood. Between these two, Hood's eccentric and futile operations against Sherman's communications were gradually shaded off into a plan for a Confederate invasion of Tennessee. Sherman, on his part, finally matured his judgment that instead of losing a thousand men a month merely defending the railroad without other advantage, he would divide his army, send back a portion of it under the command of General Thomas to defend the state of Tennessee against the impending invasion, and abandoning the whole line of railroad from Chattanooga to Atlanta, and cutting entirely loose from his base of supplies, march with the remainder to the sea. Living upon the country, and, quote, making the interior of Georgia feel the weight of the war, end quote. Grant did not immediately fall in with Sherman's suggestion, and Sherman prudently waited until the Confederate plan of invading Tennessee became further developed. It turned out as he had hoped and expected. Having gradually ceased his raids upon the railroad, Hood, by the end of October, moved westward to Tuscumbia on the Tennessee River, 
where he gathered an army of about 35,000, to which a cavalry force under Forrest of 10,000 more was soon added. Under Beauregard's orders to assume the offensive, he began a rapid march northward, and for a time with a promise of cutting off some advanced Union detachments. We need not follow the fortunes of this campaign further than to state that the Confederate invasion of Tennessee ended in disastrous failure. It was severely checked at the Battle of Franklin on November 30th, and when in spite of this reverse, Hood pushed forward and set his army down before Nashville as if for attack or siege, the Union army, concentrated and reinforced to about 55,000, was ready. A severe storm of rain and sleet held the confronting armies in forced immobility for a week. But on the morning of December 15, 1864, General Thomas moved forward to an attack, in which, on that and the following day, he inflicted so terrible a defeat upon his adversary that the Confederate army not only retreated in rout and panic, but soon literally went to pieces in disorganization and disappeared as a military entity from the Western conflict. Long before this, Sherman had started on his famous march to the sea. His explanations to Grant were so convincing that the general-in-chief, on November 2nd, telegraphed him, Quote, go on as you propose, end quote. In anticipation of this permission, he had been preparing himself ever since Hood left him a clear path by starting westward on his campaign of invasion. From Atlanta, he sent back his sick and wounded and surplus stores to Chattanooga, withdrew the garrisons, burned the bridges, broke up the railroad, and destroyed the mills, foundries, shops, and public buildings in Atlanta. With 60,000 of his best soldiers and 65 guns, he started on November 15th on his march of 300 miles to the Atlantic. They carried with them 20 days' supplies of provisions, 5 days' supply of forage, and 200 rounds of ammunition, of which each man carried 40 rounds. With perfect confidence in their leader, with perfect trust in each other's valor, endurance, and good comradeship, in the fine weather of the southern autumn, and singing the inspiring melody of John Brown's body, Sherman's army began its marching through Georgia as gaily as if it were starting on a holiday. And, indeed, it may almost be said such was their experience in comparison with the hardships of war which many of these veterans had seen in their varied campaigning. They marched as nearly as might be in four parallel columns abreast, making an average of about 15 miles a day. Kilpatrick's admirable cavalry kept their front and flanks free from the improvised militia and irregular troopers of the enemy. Carefully organized foraging parties brought in their daily supply of miscellaneous provisions, corn, meat, poultry, and sweet potatoes, of which the season had yielded an abundant harvest along their route. The Confederate authorities issued excited proclamations and orders, calling on the people to, quote, fly to arms, end quote, and to, quote, assail the invader in front, flank, and rear, by night and by day, end quote. But no rising occurred that in any way checked the constant progress of the march. The southern whites were, of course, silent and sullen, but the Negroes received the Yankees with demonstrations of welcome and goodwill, and in spite of Sherman's efforts, followed in such numbers as to embarrass his progress. As he proceeded, he destroyed the railroads by filling up cuts, burning ties, heating the rails red-hot and twisting them around trees and to irreparable spirals. Threatening the principal cities to the right and left, he marched skillfully between and past them. He reached the outer defenses of Savannah on December 10th, easily driving before him about 10,000 of the enemy. On December 13th, he stormed Fort McAllister and communicated with the Union fleet, 
through Asaba Sound, reporting to Washington that his march had been most agreeable, that he had not lost a wagon on the trip, that he had utterly destroyed over 200 miles of rails, and consumed stores and provisions that were essential to Lee's and Hood's armies. With pardonable exultation, General Sherman telegraphed to President Lincoln on December 22nd, quote, I beg to present to you as a Christmas gift the city of Savannah with 150 heavy guns and plenty of ammunition, also about 25,000 bales of cotton, end quote. He had reason to be gratified with the warm acknowledgment which President Lincoln wrote him in the following letter. My dear General Sherman, many, many thanks for your Christmas gift, the capture of Savannah. When you were about leaving Atlanta for the Atlantic coast, I was anxious, if not fearful. But feeling that you were the better judge, and remembering that nothing risked, nothing gained, I did not interfere. Now the undertaking being a success, the honor is all yours, for I believe none of us went farther than to acquiesce, and, taking the work of General Thomas into the count, as it should be taken, it is indeed a great success. Not only does it afford the obvious and immediate military advantages, but in showing to the world that your army could be divided, putting the stronger part to an important new service, and yet leaving enough to vanquish the old opposing force of the whole, Hood's army, it brings those who sat in darkness to see a great light. But what next? I suppose it will be safe if I leave General Grant and yourself to decide. Please make my grateful acknowledgments to your whole army, officers, and men. End of letter. It was again General Sherman who planned and decided the next step of the campaign. Grant sent him orders to fortify a strong post, leave his artillery and cavalry, and bring his infantry by the sea to unite with the Army of the Potomac before Petersburg. Greatly to Sherman's satisfaction, this order was soon revoked, and he was informed that Grant wished, quote, the whole matter of your future actions should be left entirely to your own discretion. End quote. In Sherman's mind, the next steps to be taken were as clear as daylight. The progress of the war in the West could now be described step by step, and its condition and probable course be estimated with sound judgment. The opening of the Mississippi River in the previous year had cut off from the rebellion the vast resources west of the Great River. Sherman's Meriden campaign in February had rendered useless the railroads of the state of Mississippi. The capture of Atlanta and the march to the sea had ruined the railroads of Georgia, cutting off another huge slice of Confederate resources. The battles of Franklin and Nashville had practically annihilated the principal Confederate army in the West. Sherman now proposed to Grant that he would subject the two Carolinas to the same process by marching his army through the heart of them from Savannah to Raleigh. The game is then up with Lee, he confidently added, unless he comes out of Richmond, avoids you, and fights me, in which case I should reckon on your being on his heels. If you feel confident that you can whip Lee outside of his entrenchments, I feel equally confident that I can handle him in the open country. Grant promptly adopted the plan, and by formal orders directed Sherman to execute it. Several minor western expeditions were organized to contribute to its success. The Union fleet on the coast was held in readiness to cooperate as far as possible with Sherman's advance and to afford him a new base of supply, if at some suitable point he should desire to establish communications with it. When, in the middle of January, 1865, a naval expedition captured Fort Fisher at the mouth of Cape Fear River, an army corps under General Schofield was brought east from Thomas's Army of the Tennessee and sent by the sea to the North Carolina coast to penetrate into the interior and form a junction with Sherman when he should arrive. 
Having had five weeks for rest and preparation, Sherman began the third stage of his campaign on February 1st, with a total of 60,000 men, provisions for 20 days, forage for seven, and a full supply of ammunition for a great battle. This new undertaking proved a task of much greater difficulty and severer hardship than his march to the sea. Instead of the genial autumn weather, the army had now to face the wintry storms that blew in from the neighboring coast. Instead of the dry Georgia uplands, his route lay across a low sandy country cut by rivers with branches at right angles to his line of march and bordered by broad and miry swamps. But this was an extraordinary army which faced exposure, labor, and peril with a determination akin to contempt. Here were swamps and watercourses to be waded waist deep, endless miles of corduroy road to be laid and relaid as course after course sank into the mud under heavy army wagons, frequent headwater channels of rivers to be bridged, the lines of railroads along their route to be torn up and rendered incapable of repair, food to be gathered by foraging, keeping up, meanwhile, a daily average of 10 or 12 miles of marching. Under such conditions, Sherman's army made a midwinter march of 425 miles in 50 days, crossing five navigable rivers, occupying three important cities, and rendering the whole railroad system of South Carolina useless to the enemy. The ten to 15,000 Confederates with which General Hardy had evacuated Savannah and retreated to Charleston could, of course, oppose no serious opposition to Sherman's march. On the contrary, when Sherman reached Columbia, the capital of South Carolina, on February 16th, Hardy evacuated Charleston, which had been defended for four long years against every attack of a most powerful Union fleet, and where the most ingenious siege works and desperate storming assault had failed to wrest Fort Wagner from the enemy. But though Charleston fell without a battle and was occupied by the Union troops on the 18th, the destructive hand of war was at last heavily laid upon her. The Confederate government pertinaciously adhered to the policy of burning accumulations of cotton to prevent it falling into Union hands, and the supply gathered in Charleston to be sent abroad by blockade runners, having been set on fire by the evacuating Confederate officials, the flames not only spread to the adjoining buildings, but grew into a great conflagration that left the heart of the city a waste of blackened walls to illustrate the folly of the first secession ordinance. Columbia, the capital, underwent the same fate, to an even a broader extent. Here the cotton had been piled in a narrow street, and when the torch was applied by similar Confederate orders, the rising wind easily floated the blazing flakes to the near roofs of buildings. On the night following Sherman's entrance, the wind rose to a gale, and neither the efforts of the citizens nor the ready help of Sherman's soldiers were able to check the destruction. Confederate writers long nursed the accusation that it was the Union Army which burned the city as a deliberate act of vengeance. Contrary proof is furnished by the orders of Sherman, leaving for the sufferers a generous supply of food, as well as by the careful investigation by the Mixed Commission on American and British Claims under the Treaty of Washington. Still pursuing his march, Sherman arrived at Cheraw March 3rd and opened communication with General Terry, who had advanced from Fort Fisher to Wilmington. Hitherto, his advance had been practically unopposed, but now he learned that General Johnston had once more been placed in command of the Confederate forces and was collecting an army near Raleigh, North Carolina. Well knowing the ability of this general, Sherman became more prudent in his movements, but Johnston was able to gather a force of only 25 or 30,000 men, of which the troops Hardy brought from Charleston formed the nucleus and the two minor engagements on March 16th and 19th did little to impede Sherman's advance to Goldsboro, where he arrived on March 23rd, forming a junction with the Union Army sent by sea under Schofield that had reached the same point the previous day. 
The third giant stride of Sherman's great campaign was thus happily accomplished. His capture of Atlanta, his march to the sea and capture of Savannah, his progress through the Carolinas, and the fall of Charleston formed an aggregate expedition covering nearly a thousand miles with military results that rendered rebellion powerless in the central states of the Southern Confederacy. Several Union cavalry raids had accomplished similar destruction of Confederate resources in Alabama and the country bordering on East Tennessee. Military affairs were plainly in a condition which justified Sherman in temporarily devolving his command on General Schofield and hurrying by sea to make a brief visit for urgent consultation with General Grant at his headquarters before Richmond and Petersburg. End of chapter 29「Letter to Military Governors Letter to Shepley Amnesty Proclamation December 8, 1863 Instructions to Banks Banks' Action in Louisiana Louisiana Abolishes Slavery Arkansas Abolishes Slavery Reconstruction in Tennessee Missouri Emancipation Lincoln's Letter to Drake Missouri Abolishes Slavery Emancipation in Maryland. Maryland abolishes slavery. To subdue the Confederate armies and establish order under martial law was not the only task before President Lincoln. As rapidly as rebel states or portions of states were occupied by Federal troops, it became necessary to displace usurping Confederate officials and appoint in their stead loyal state, county, and subordinate officers to restore the administration of local civil law under the authority of the United States. In western Virginia, the people had spontaneously effected this reform, first by repudiating the Richmond Succession Ordinance and organizing a provisional state government, and second by adopting a new constitution and obtaining admission to the Union as the new state of West Virginia. In Missouri, the state convention, which refused to pass a succession ordinance, affected the same object by establishing a provisional state government. In both these states, the whole process of what, in subsequent years, was comprehensively designated Reconstruction, was carried on by popular local action, without any federal initiative or interference other than prompt federal recognition and substantial military support and protection. But in other seceded states, there was no such groundwork of loyal popular authority upon which to rebuild the structure of civil government. Therefore, when portions of Tennessee, Louisiana, Arkansas, and North Carolina came under federal control, President Lincoln, during the first half of 1862, appointed military governors to begin the work of temporary civil administration. He had a clear and consistent constitutional theory under which this could be done. In his first inaugural, he announced the doctrine that the union of these states is perpetual and unbroken. His special message to Congress on July 4, 1861, added the supplementary declaration that the states have their status in the union and they have no other legal status. The same message contained the further definition. The people of Virginia have thus allowed this giant insurrection to make its nest within her borders, and this government has no choice left but to deal with it where it finds it, and it has the less regret, as the loyal citizens have, in due form, claimed its protection. Those loyal citizens this government is bound to recognize and protect, 
as being Virginia. The action of Congress entirely conformed to this theory. That body admitted to seats senators and representatives from the provisional state governments of West Virginia and Missouri, and also allowed Senator Andrew Johnson of Tennessee to retain his seat, and admitted Horace Maynard and Andrew J. Clements as representatives of the same state, though since their election, Tennessee had undergone the usual secession usurpation, and had as yet organized no loyal provisional government. The progress of the Union armies was so far checked during the second half of 1862 that military Governor Phelps, appointed for Arkansas, did not assume his functions, and military Governor Stanley wielded but slight authority in North Carolina. Senator Andrew Johnson, appointed military governor of Tennessee, established himself at Nashville, the capital, and though Union control of Tennessee fluctuated greatly, he was able, by appointing loyal state and county officers, to control the administration of civil government in considerable districts under substantial federal jurisdiction. In the state of Louisiana, the process of restoring federal authority was carried on a step farther, owing largely to the fact that the territory occupied by the Union Army, though quite limited, comprising only the city of New Orleans and a few adjacent parishes, was more securely held, and its hostile frontier less disturbed. It soon became evident that considerable Union sentiment yet existed in the captured city and surrounding districts, and when some of the loyal citizens began to manifest impatience at the restraints of martial law, President Lincoln, in a frank letter, pointed the way to a remedy. The people of Louisiana, he wrote under date of July 28, 1862, who wish protection to person and property, have but to reach forth their hands and take it. Let them in good faith reinaugurate the national authority and set up a state government conforming thereto under the Constitution. They know how to do it, and can have the protection of the army while doing it. The army will be withdrawn so soon as such state government can dispense with its presence, and the people of the state can then, upon the old constitutional terms, govern themselves to their own liking. At about this date, there occurred the serious military crisis in Virginia and the battles of the peninsula of the second bull run and of antietam necessarily compelled the postponement of minor questions but during this period the president's policy on the slavery question reached its development and solution and when on september twenty two he issued his preliminary proclamation of emancipation it also paved the way for a further defining of his policy of reconstruction that proclamation announced the penalty of military emancipation against all states in rebellion on the succeeding first day of january but also provided that if the people thereof were represented in congress by properly elected members they should be deemed not in rebellion and thereby escape the penalty wishing now to prove the sincerity of what he said in the greeley letter that his paramount object was to save the union and not either to slave or destroy slavery he wrote a circular letter to the military governors and commanders in Louisiana, Tennessee, and Arkansas, instructing them to permit and aid the people within the districts held by them to hold elections for members of Congress and perhaps a legislature, state officers, and United States senators. In all available ways, he wrote, give the people a chance to express their wishes at these elections, follow forms of law as far as convenient but at all events get the expression of the largest number of the people possible. All see how such action will connect with and affect the proclamation of September 22. Of course the men elected should be gentlemen of character, willing to swear support to the Constitution as of old and known to be above reasonable suspicion of duplicity. But the President wished this to be a real and not a sham proceeding as he explained a month later in a letter to Governor Shepley. We do not particularly need members of Congress from there to enable us to get along with legislation here. 
What we do want is the conclusive evidence that respectable citizens of Louisiana are willing to be members of Congress and to swear support to the Constitution, and that other respectable citizens there are willing to vote for them and send them. To send a parcel of northern men here as representatives elected, as would be understood, and perhaps really so, at the point of the bayonet, would be disgraceful and outrageous. And were I a member of Congress here, I would vote against admitting any such man to a seat. Thus instructed, Governor Shepley caused an election to be held in the first and second congressional districts of Louisiana on December 3, 1862, at which members of Congress were chosen. No federal office holder was a candidate, and about one half the usual vote was polled. The House of Representatives admitted them to seats after full scrutiny, the chairman of the committee declaring this had every essential of a regular election in a time of most profound peace, with the exception of the fact that the proclamation was issued by the military instead of the civil governor of Louisiana. Military affairs were of such importance and absorbed so much attention during the year 1863, both at Washington and at the headquarters of the various armies, that the subject of Reconstruction was of necessity somewhat neglected. The military governor of Louisiana, indeed, ordered a registration of loyal voters about the middle of June for the purpose of organizing a loyal state government, but its only result was to develop an inevitable antagonism and contest between conservatives who desired that the old constitution of Louisiana prior to the rebellion should be revived, by which the institution of slavery, as then existing, would be maintained, and the Free State Party, which demanded that an entirely new constitution be framed and adopted in which slavery should be summarily abolished. The conservatives asked President Lincoln to adopt their plan. While the President refused this, he, in a letter to General Banks, dated August 5, 1863, suggested the middle course of gradual emancipation. For my own part, he wrote, I think I shall not, in any event, retract the Emancipation Proclamation, nor, as executive, ever return to slavery any person who is freed by the terms of that proclamation, or by any of the acts of Congress. If Louisiana shall send members to Congress, their admission to seats will depend, as you know, upon the respective houses and not upon the president i would be glad for her to make a new constitution recognizing the emancipation proclamation and adopting emancipation in those parts of the state to which the proclamation does not apply and while she is at it i think it would not be objectionable for her to adopt some practical system by which the two races could gradually live themselves out of their old relation to each other and both come out better prepared for the new. Education for young blacks should be included in the plan. After all, the power or element of contract may be sufficient for this probationary period, and by its simplicity and flexibility may be the better. During the autumn months the President's mind dwelt more and more on the subject of Reconstruction, and he matured a general plan which he laid before Congress in his annual message to that body on December 8, 1863. He issued, on the same day, a proclamation of amnesty, on certain conditions, to all persons in rebellion, except certain specified classes, who should take a prescribed oath of allegiance. The proclamation further provided that whenever a number of persons so amnestied in any rebel state, equal to one-tenth the vote cast at the presidential election of 1860, should re-establish a state government which shall be Republican, and in no wise contravening said oath. Such would be recognized as the true government of the state. The annual message discussed and advocated the plan at length, but also added, saying that Reconstruction will be accepted if presented in a specified way, it is not said it will never be accepted in any other way. This plan of reconstructing what came to be called 10% states met much opposition in Congress, and that body, reversing its action in former instances, long refused admission to members and senators 
from states similarly organized, but the point needs no further mention here. A month before the amnesty proclamation the President had written to General Banks, expressing his great disappointment that the Reconstruction in Louisiana had been permitted to fall in abeyance by the leading Union officials there, civil and military. I do, however, he wrote, urge both you and them to lose no more time. Governor Shepley has special instructions from the War Department. I wish him, these gentlemen's and others cooperating, without waiting for more territory, to go to work and give me a tangible nucleus which the remainder of the state may rally around as fast as it can, and which I can at once recognize and sustain as the true state government. He urged that such reconstruction should have in view a new free state constitution, for, said he, if a few professedly loyal men shall draw the disloyal about them, and colorably set up a state government, repudiating the Emancipation Proclamation and reestablishing slavery, I cannot recognize or sustain their work. I have said, and say again, that if a new state government, acting in harmony with this government, and consistently with general freedom, shall think best to adopt a reasonable temporary arrangement in relation to the landless and houseless freed people, I do not object but my word is out to be for and not against them on the question of their permanent freedom. General Banks, in reply, excused this in action by explaining that the military governor and others had given him to understand that they were exclusively charged with the work of reconstruction in Louisiana. To this the President rejoined under date of December 24, 1863, I have all the while intended you to be master, as well in regard to reorganizing a state government for Louisiana, as in regard to the military matters of the department, and hence my letters on Reconstruction have nearly, if not quite, all been addressed to you. My error has been that it did not occur to me that Governor Shepley or anyone else would set up a claim to act independently of you. I now distinctly tell you that you are master of all, and that I wish you to take the case as you find it, and give us a free state reorganization of Louisiana in the shortest possible time. Under this explicit direction of the President, and basing his action on martial law as the fundamental law of the state, the General caused a governor and state officials to be elected on February 22, 1864. To override the jealousy and quarrels of both the conservative and free state parties, he set out in his proclamation that the officials to be chosen should, until others are appointed by competent authority, constitute the civil government of the state under the Constitution and laws of Louisiana, except so much of the said Constitution and laws as recognize, regulate, or relate to slavery, which, being inconsistent with the present condition of public affairs, and plainly inapplicable to any class of persons now existing within its limits, must be suspended, and they are therefore and hereby declared to be an operative and void. The newly elected governor was inaugurated on March 4, with imposing public ceremonies, and the president also invested him with the powers exercised hereto by the military governor of Louisiana. General Banks further caused delegates to a state convention to be chosen who, in a session extending from April 6 to July 25, perfected and adopted a new constitution, which was again adopted by popular vote on September 5 following. General Banks reported the constitution to be one of the best ever penned. It abolishes slavery in the state and forbids the legislature to enact any law recognizing property in man. The emancipation is instantaneous and absolute, without condition or compensation, and nearly unanimous. The state of Arkansas had been forced into rebellion by military terrorism, and remained under Confederate domination only because the Union armies could afford the latent loyal sentiment of the state no effective support until the fall of Vicksburg and the opening of the Mississippi. After that decisive victory, General Steele marched a Union column of about 13,000 from Helena to Little Rock, 
the capital, which surrendered to him on the evening of September 10, 1863. By December, eight regiments of Arkansas citizens had been formed for service in the Union Army, and, following the amnesty proclamation of December 8, the reorganization of a loyal state government was speedily brought about, mainly by spontaneous popular action, of course under the direction and with the assistance of General Steele. In response to a petition, President Lincoln sent General Steele on January 20, 1864, a letter repeating substantially the instructions he had given General Banks for Louisiana. Before these could be carried out, popular action had assembled at Little Rock on January 8, 1864, a formal delegate convention composed of 44 delegates who claimed to represent 22 out of the 54 counties of the state. On January 22, this convention adopted an amended constitution which declared the act of secession null and void, abolished slavery immediately and unconditionally, and wholly repudiated the Confederate debt. The convention appointed a provisional state government, and under its schedule an election was held on March 14, 1864. During the three days on which the polls were kept open, under the orders of General Steele, who, by the President's suggestion, adopted the convention program, a total vote of 12,179 was cast for the Constitution, and only 226 against it, while the provisional governor was also elected for a new term, together with members of Congress and a legislature, which in due time chose United States Senators. By this time, Congress had manifested its opposition to the President's plan, but Mr. Lincoln stood firm, and on June 29, wrote to General Steele, I understand that Congress declines to admit to seats the persons sent as Senators and Representatives from Arkansas. These persons apprehend that in consequence you may not support the new state government there as you otherwise would. My wish is that you give that government and the people there the same support and protection that you would if the members had been admitted, because in no event, nor in any view of the case, can this do any harm, while it would be the best you can do toward suppressing the rebellion. While military governor Andrew Johnson had been the earliest to begin the restoration of loyal federal authority in the state of Tennessee, the course of campaign and battle in that state delayed its completion to a later period than the others. The invasion of Tennessee by the Confederate General Bragg in the summer of 1862, and the long delay of the Union General Rosencrans to begin an active campaign against him during the summer of 1863, kept civil reorganization in a very uncertain and chaotic condition. When at length Rosecrans advanced and occupied Chattanooga, President Lincoln deemed it a propitious time to vigorously begin reorganization, and under date of September 11, 1863, he wrote the military governor emphatic suggestions that the reinauguration must not be such as to give control of the state and its representation in Congress to the enemies of the Union, driving its friends there into political exile. You must have it otherwise. Let the reconstruction be the work of such men only as can be trusted for the Union. Exclude all others, and trust that your government, so organized, will be recognized here as being the one of Republican form to be guaranteed to the state, and to be protected against invasion and domestic violence. It is something on the question of time to remember that it cannot be known who is next to occupy the position I now hold, nor what he will do. I see that you have declared in favor of emancipation in Tennessee, for which may God bless you. Get emancipation into your new state government, constitution, and there will be no such word as fail for your case. In another letter of September 19, the President sent the governor specific authority to execute the scheme outlined in his letter of advice, but no substantial success had yet been reached in the process of reconstruction in Tennessee 
during the year 1864, when the Confederate Army under Hood turned northward from Atlanta to begin its third and final invasion of the state. This once more delayed all work of reconstruction until the Confederate Army was routed and dispersed by the Battle of Nashville on December 15, 1864. Previous popular action had called a state convention which, taking immediate advantage of the expulsion of the enemy, met in Nashville on January 9, 1865, in which 58 counties and some regiments were represented by about 467 delegates. After six days of deliberation, the convention adopted a series of amendments to the Constitution, the main ordinance of which provided that slavery and involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, are hereby forever abolished and prohibited throughout the state. These amendments were duly adopted at a popular election held on February 22nd, and the complete organization of a loyal state government under them followed in due course. The state of Missouri needed no reconstruction. It has already been said that her local affairs were administered by a provisional state government instituted by the state convention chosen by popular election before the rebellion broke out. In this state, therefore, the institution of slavery was suppressed by the direct action of the people, but not without a long and bitter conflict of party factions and military strife. There existed here two hostile currents of public opinion. One, the intolerant pro-slavery prejudices of its rural population, and other, the progressive and liberal spirit dominant in the city of St. Louis, with its heavy German population, which, as far back as 1856, had elected to Congress a candidate who boldly advocated gradual emancipation. St. Louis, with outlying cities and towns, supplying during the whole rebellion the dominating influence that held the state in the Union, and at length transformed her from a slave to a free state. Missouri suffered severely in the war, but not through important campaigns or great battles. Persistent secession conspiracy, the Kansas episodes of border strife, and secret orders of Confederate agents from Arkansas instigating unlawful warfare made Missouri a hotbed of guerrilla uprisings and of relentless neighborhood feuds, in which armed partisan conflict often degenerated into shocking barbarity and the pretense of war into the malicious execution of private vengeance. President Lincoln drew a vivid picture of the chronic disorders in Missouri in reply to complaints demanding the removal of General Schofield from local military command. We are in civil war. In such cases, there is always a main question, but in this case, that question is a perplexing compound, union and slavery. It thus becomes a question not of two sides merely, but of at least four sides, even among those who are for the Union, saying nothing of those who are against it. Thus, those who are for the Union with, but not without slavery, those for it without, but not with, those for it with or without, but prefer it with, and those for it with or without, but prefer it without. Among these again is a subdivision of those who are for gradual, but not for immediate, and those who are for immediate, but not for gradual extinction of slavery. It is easy to conceive that all, all these shades of opinion, and even more, may be sincerely entertained by honest and truthful men. Yet, all being for the Union, by reason of these differences, each will prefer a different way of sustaining the Union. At once sincerity is questions, and motives are assailed. Actual war coming, blood grows hot, and blood is spilled. Thought is forced from old channels into confusion. Deception breeds and thrives. Confidence dies, and universal suspicion reigns. Each man feels an impulse to kill his neighbor, lest he be first killed by him. Revenge and retaliation follow. And all this, as said before, 
may be among honest men only. But this is not all. Every foul bird comes abroad, and every dirty reptile rises up. These add crime to confusion. Strong measures, deemed indispensable, but harsh at best, such man make worse by maladministration. Murders for old grudges, and murders for pelf, proceed under any cloak that will best cover for the occasion. These causes amply account for what has occurred in Missouri, without ascribing it to the weakness or wickedness of any general. The newspaper files, those chroniclers of current events, will show that the evils now complained of were quite as prevalent under Fremont, Hunter, Halleck, and Curtis as under Schofield. I do not feel justified to enter upon the broad field you present in regard to the political differences between radicals and conservatives. From time to time I have done and said what appeared to me proper to do and say. The public knows it all, it obliges nobody to follow me, and I trust it obliges me to follow nobody. The radicals and conservatives each agree with me in some things and disagree in others. I could wish both to agree with me in all things, for then they would agree with each other, and would be too strong for any foe from any quarter. They, however, choose to do otherwise, and I do not question their right. I, too, shall do what seems to be my duty. I hold whoever commands in Missouri, or elsewhere, responsible to me, and not to either radicals or conservatives. It is my duty to hear all, but at last I must, within my sphere, judge what to do, and what to forbear. It is some consolation to history that out of this blood and travail grew the political regeneration of the state. Slavery and emancipation never gave each other a moment's truce. The issue was raised to an acute stage by Fremont's proclamation in August 1861. Though that ill-advised measure was revoked by President Lincoln, the friction and irritation of war kept it alive. And in the following year, a member of the Missouri State Convention offered a bill to accept and apply President Lincoln's plan of compensated abolishment. Further effort was made in this direction in Congress, where in January 1863, the House passed a bill appropriating $10 million, and in February, the Senate another bill appropriating $15 million to aid compensated abolishment in Missouri. But the stubborn opposition of three pro-slavery Missouri members of the House prevented action on the latter bill or any compromise. The question, however, continually grew among the people of Missouri and made such advance that parties, accepting the main point as already practically decided at length, only divided upon the mode of procedure. The conservatives wanted the work to be done by the old state convention. The radicals desired to submit it to a new convention fresh from the people. Legislative agreement having failed, the provisional governor called the old state convention together. The convention leaders who controlled that body inquired of the president whether he would sustain their action. To this he made answer in a letter to Schofield dated June 22, 1863. Your dispatch, asking in substance whether, in case Missouri shall adopt gradual emancipation, the general government will protect slave owners in that species of property during the short time it shall be permitted by the state to exist within it, has been received. Desirous as I am that emancipation shall be adopted by Missouri, and believing as I do that gradual can be made better than immediate for both black and white, except when military necessity changes the case, my impulse is to say that such protection would be given. I cannot know exactly what shape an act of emancipation may take. If the period from the initiation to the final end should be comparatively short, and the act should prevent persons being sold during that period into more lasting slavery, the whole would be easier. I do not wish to pledge the general government to the affirmative support of even temporary slavery beyond what can be fairly claimed under the Constitution. I suppose, however, this is not desired, but that it is desired for the military force of the United States while in Missouri, 
to not be used in subverting the temporarily reserved legal rights in states during the progress of emancipation. This I would desire also. Proceeding with its work, the old state convention, which had hitherto made a most honorable record, neglected a great opportunity. It indeed adopted an ordinance of gradual emancipation on July 1, 1863, but of such an uncertain and dilatory character that public opinion in the state promptly rejected it. By the death of the provisional governor on January 31, 1864, the conservative party of Missouri lost its most trusted leader, and thereafter the radicals succeeded to the political power of the state. At the presidential election of 1864, that party chose a new state convention, which met in St. Louis on January 6, 1865, and on the sixth day of its session, January 11, formally adopted an ordinance of immediate emancipation. Maryland, like Missouri, had no need of reconstruction, except for the Baltimore riot and the arrest of her succession legislature during the first year of the war, her state government continued its regular functions. But a strong popular undercurrent of virulent secession sympathy among a considerable minority of her inhabitants was only held in check by the military power of the Union. And for two years, emancipation found no favor in the public opinion of the state. Her representatives, like those of most other border states, coldly refused President Lincoln's earnest plea to accept compensated abolishment. And a bill in Congress to give Maryland $10 million for that object was at once blighted by the declaration of one of her leading representatives that Maryland did not ask for it. Nevertheless, the subject could no more be ignored there than in the other states. And after the President's Emancipation Proclamation, an Emancipation Party developed itself in Maryland. There was no longer any evading the practical issue when, by the President's direction, the Secretary of War issued a military order early in October 1863 regulating the raising of colored troops in certain border states, which decreed that slaves might be enlisted without consent of their owners, but provided compensation in such cases. At the November election of that year, the Emancipation Party of Maryland elected its ticket by an overwhelming majority, and a legislature that enacted laws under which a state convention was chosen to amend the Constitution. Of the delegates elected on April 6, 1864, 61 were emancipationists, and only 35 opposed. After two months' debate, this convention by nearly two-thirds adopted an article that hereafter in this state there shall neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except in punishment of crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, and all persons held to service or labor as slaves are hereby declared free. This decisive test of a popular vote accepting the amended Constitution as a whole remained, however, yet to be undergone. President Lincoln willingly complied with a request to throw his official voice and influence in favor of the measure, and wrote, on October 10, 1864, A convention of Maryland has framed a new Constitution for the state. A public meeting is called for this evening at Baltimore to aid in securing its ratification by the people, and you ask a word from me for the occasion. I presume the only feature of the instrument about which there is serious controversy is that which provides for the extinction of slavery. It needs not to be a secret, and I presume it is no secret, that I wish success to this provision. I desire it on every consideration. I wish all men to be free. I wish the material prosperity of the already free, which I feel sure the extinction of slavery would bring. I wish to see in process of disappearing that only thing which ever could bring this nation to civil war. I attempt no argument. Argument upon the question is already exhausted by the abler, better informed, and more immediately interested sons of Maryland herself. I only add that I shall be gratified exceedingly if the good people of the state shall, by their votes, ratify the new Constitution. At the election, which was held on October 12 and 13, stubborn Maryland conservatism, whose roots reached far back to the colonial days, made its last desperate stand, and the Constitution was ratified 
by a majority of only 375 votes, out of a total of nearly 60,000. But the result was accepted as decisive, and in due time the governor issued his proclamation declaring the new constitution legally adopted. End of chapter 30. Recording by Alana Jordan. Chapter 31 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. By John G. Nicolay. Chapter 31 Shaping of the Presidential Campaign Criticisms of Mr. Lincoln Chase's Presidential Ambitions The Pomeroy Circular Cleveland Connection Attempt to Nominate Grant Meeting of Baltimore Convention Lincoln's Letter to Schurz Platform of Republican Convention Lincoln Renominated Refuses to Indicate Preference for Vice President Johnson Nominated for Vice President Lincoln's Speech to Committee of Notification Reference to Mexico in his Letter of Acceptance The French in Mexico the final shaping of the campaign, the definition of the issues, the wording of the platforms, and the selection of the candidates, had grown much more out of national politics than out of mere party combination or personal intrigues. The success of the war and the fate of the Union, of course, dominated every other consideration. And next to this, the treatment of the slavery question became in a hundred forms almost a direct personal interest. Mere party feeling, which had utterly vanished for a few months in the first grand uprising of the North, had been once more awakened by the first Bull Run defeat, and from that time onward was heard in a loud and constant criticism of Mr. Lincoln and the acts of his supporters whenever they touched the institution of slavery. The Democratic Party, which had been allied with the Southern politicians and the interests of that institution through so many decades, quite naturally took up its habitual role of protest that slavery should receive no hurt or damage from the incidents of war where, in the border states, it still had constitutional existence among loyal Union men. On the other hand, among Republicans who had elected Mr. Lincoln, and who, as a partisan duty, endorsed and sustained his measures, Fremont's proclamation of military emancipation in the first year of the war excited the over-hasty zeal of anti-slavery extremists, and developed a small but very active faction which harshly denounced the President when Mr. Lincoln revoked that premature and ill-considered measure. No matter what the President subsequently did about slavery, the Democratic press and partisans always assailed him for doing too much, while the Fremont press and partisans accused him of doing too little. Meanwhile, personal considerations were playing their minor but not unimportant parts. When McClellan was called to Washington, enduring all the hopeful promise of the great victories he was expected to win, a few shrewd New York Democratic politicians grouped themselves about him and put him in training as the future Democratic candidate for president, and the general fell easily into their plans and ambitions. Even after he had demonstrated his military incapacity, when he had reaped defeat instead of victory, and earned humiliation instead of triumph, his partisan adherents clung to the desperate hope that though they could not win applause for him as a conqueror, they might yet create public sympathy in his behalf as a neglected and persecuted genius. The cabinets of presidents frequently develop rival presidential aspirants, and that of Mr. Lincoln was no exception. 
considering the strong men who composed it, the only wonder is that there was so little friction among them. They disagreed constantly and heartily on minor questions, both with Mr. Lincoln and with each other, but their great devotion to the Union, coupled with his kindly forbearance, and the clear vision which assured him mastery over himself and others, kept peace and even personal affection in his strangely assorted official family. The man who developed the most serious presidential aspirations was Salmon P. Chase, his Secretary of the Treasury, who listened to and actively encouraged the overtures of a small faction of the Republican Party which rallied about him at the end of the year 1863. Pure and disinterested, and devoted with all his energies and powers to the cause of the Union, he was yet singularly ignorant of the current public thought, and absolutely incapable of judging men in their true relations. He regarded himself as the friend of Mr. Lincoln, and made strong protestations to him and to others of this friendship. But he held so poor an opinion of the President's intellect and character, compared with his own, that he could not believe the people blind enough to prefer the President to himself. He imagined that he did not covet advancement, and was anxious only for the public good, yet in the midst of his enormous labors found time to write letters to every part of the country, protesting his indifference to the presidency, but indicating his willingness to accept it, and painting pictures so dark of the chaotic state of affairs in the government, that the irresistible inference was that only he could save the country. From the beginning, Mr. Lincoln had been aware of this quasi-candidacy, which continued all through the winter. Indeed, it was impossible to remain unconscious of it, although he discouraged all conversation on the subject and refused to read letters relating to it. He had his own opinion of the taste and judgment displayed by Mr. Chase in his criticisms of the President and his colleagues in the Cabinet, but he took no note of them. "'I have determined,' he said, to shut my eyes so far as possible, to everything of the sort. Mr. Chase makes a good secretary, and I shall keep him where he is. If he becomes president, all right. I hope we may never have a worse man. And he went on, appointing Mr. Chase's partisans and adherents to places in the government. Although his own renomination was a matter in regard to which he refused to talk much, even with intimate friends, he was perfectly aware of the true drift of things. In capacity of appreciating popular currents, Chase was a child beside him, and he allowed the opposition to himself and his own cabinet to continue, without question or remark, all the more patiently because he knew how feeble it really was. The movement in favor of Mr. Chase culminated in the month of February 1864, in a secret circular signed by Senator Pomeroy of Kansas, and widely circulated through the Union, which criticized Mr. Lincoln's tendency toward compromises and temporary expedients, explained that even if his re-election were desirable, it was practically impossible in the face of the opposition that had developed, and lauded Chase as the statesman best fitted to rescue the country from present perils and guard it against future ills. Of course, copies of this circular soon reached the White House, but Mr. Lincoln refused to look at them, and they accumulated unread in the desk of his secretary. Finally, it got into print, whereupon Mr. Chase wrote to the President to assure him he had no knowledge of the letter before seeing it in the papers. To this, Mr. Lincoln replied, I was not shocked or surprised by the appearance of the letter, because I had had knowledge of Mr. Pomeroy's committee, and of secret issues which I supposed came from it, for several weeks. I have known just as little of these things as my friends have allowed me to know. I fully concur with you that neither of us can be justly held responsible for what our respective friends may do without our instigation or countenance. Whether you shall remain at the head of the Treasury Department is a question which I will not allow myself to consider from any standpoint other than my judgment of the public service, and, in that view, I do not perceive occasion for a change. Even before the President wrote this letter, Mr. Chase's candidacy had passed out of sight. 
In fact, it never really existed, save in the imagination of the Secretary of the Treasury and a narrow circle of his adherents. He was by no means the choice of the body of radicals who were discontented with Mr. Lincoln because of his deliberation in dealing with the slavery question, or of those others who thought he was going entirely too fast and too far. Both these factions, alarmed at the multiplying signs which foretold his triumphant renomination, issued calls for a mass convention of the people to meet at Cleveland, Ohio, on May 31, a week before the assembling of the Republican National Convention at Baltimore, to unite in a last attempt to stem the tide in his favor. Democratic newspapers naturally made much of this, heralding it as a hopeless split in the Republican ranks, and printing fictitious dispatches from Cleveland reporting that city thronged with influential and earnest delegates. Far from this being the case, there was no crowd and still less enthusiasm. Up to the very day of its meeting, no place was provided for the sessions of the convention, which finally came together in a small hall whose limited capacity proved more than ample for both delegates and spectators. Though organization was delayed nearly two hours in the vain hope that more delegates would arrive, the men who had been counted upon to give character to the gathering remained notably absent. The delegates prudently refrained from counting their meager number, and after preliminaries of a more or less farcical nature, voted for a platform differing little from that afterward adopted at Baltimore, listened to the reading of a vehement letter from Wendell Phillips denouncing Mr. Lincoln's administration and counseling the choice of Fremont for president, nominated that general by acclamation, with General John Cochran of New York for his running mate, christened themselves the Radical Democracy, and adjourned. The press generally greeted the convention and its work with a chorus of ridicule, though certain Democratic newspapers, from motives harmlessly transparent, gave it solemn and unmeasured praise. General Fremont, taking his candidacy seriously, accepted the nomination, but three months later, finding no response from the public, withdrew from the contest. At this foredoomed Cleveland meeting, a feeble attempt had been made by the men who considered Mr. Lincoln too radical to nominate General Grant for president instead of Fremont. But he had been denounced as a Lincoln hireling, and his name unceremoniously swept aside. During the same week, another effort in the same direction was made in New York, though the committee having the matter in charge made no public avowal of its intention beforehand, merely calling a meeting to express the gratitude of the country to the general for his signal services and even inviting Mr. Lincoln to take part in the proceedings. This he declined to do, but wrote, I approve, nevertheless, whatever may tend to strengthen and sustain General Grant and the noble armies now under his direction. My previous high estimate of General Grant has been maintained and heightened by what has occurred in the remarkable campaign he is now conducting, while the magnitude and difficulty of the task before him do not prove less than I expected. He and his brave soldiers are now in the midst of their great trial, and I trust that at your meeting you will so shape your good words that they may turn to men and guns, moving to his and their support. With such gracious approval of the movement, the meeting naturally fell into the hands of the Lincoln men. General Grant, neither at this time nor at any other, gave the least countenance to the efforts which were made to array him in political opposition to the president. These various attempts to discredit the name of Mr. Lincoln and nominate someone else in his place caused hardly a ripple on the great current of public opinion. Death alone could have prevented his choice by the Union Convention. So absolute and universal was the tendency that most of the politicians made no effort to direct or guide it, they simply exerted themselves to keep in the van and not be overwhelmed. The convention met on June 7, but irregular nominations of Mr. Lincoln for president had begun as early as January 6, when the first state convention of the year was held in New Hampshire. From one end of the country to the other, 
such spontaneous nominations had joyously echoed his name. Only in Missouri did it fail overwhelming adhesion, and even in the Missouri Assembly the resolution in favor of his renomination was laid upon the table by a majority of only eight. The current swept on irresistibly throughout the spring. A few opponents of Mr. Lincoln endeavored to postpone the meeting of the National Convention until September, knowing that their only hope lay in some possible accident of the summer. But though supported by so powerful an influence as the New York Tribune, the National Committee paid no attention to this appeal. Indeed, they might as well have considered the request of a committee of prominent citizens to check an impending thunderstorm. Mr. Lincoln took no measures whatever to promote his own candidacy. While not assuming airs of reluctance or bashfulness, he discouraged on the part of strangers any suggestion as to his re-election. Among his friends he made no secret of his readiness to continue the work he was engaged in, if such should be the general wish. A second term would be a great honor and a great labor, which together, perhaps, I would not decline if tendered, he wrote Elihu B. Washburn. He not only opposed no obstacle to the ambitions of Chase, but received warnings to beware of Grant in the same serene manner, answering tranquilly, If he takes Richmond, let him have it. And he discouraged office holders, civil or military, who showed any special zeal in his behalf. To General Schurz, who wrote asking permission to take an active part in the presidential campaign, he replied, Allow me to suggest that if you wish to remain in the military service, it is very dangerous for you to get temporarily out of it, because with a major general once out, it is next to impossible for even the president to get him in again. Of course, I would be very glad to have your service for the country in the approaching political canvas, but I fear we cannot properly have it without separating you from the military. And in a later letter he added, I perceive no objection to your making a political speech when you are where one is to be made. But quite surely, speaking in the North and fighting in the South at the same time are not possible nor could I be justified to detail any officer to the political campaign during its continuance, and then return him to the army. Not only did he firmly take this stand as to his own nomination, but enforced it even more rigidly in cases where he learned that federal office holders were working to defeat the return of certain Republican congressmen. In several such instances, he wrote instructions of which the following is a type. Complaint is made to me that you are using your official power to defeat Judge Kelly's renomination to Congress. The correct principle, I think, is that all our friends should have absolute freedom of choice among our friends. My wish, therefore, is that you will do just as you think fit with your own suffrage in the case, and not constrain any of your subordinates to do other than he thinks fit with his. He made, of course, no long speeches during the campaign, and in his short addresses at sanitary fairs, in response to visiting delegations, or on similar occasions where custom and courtesy decreed that he must say something, preserved his mental balance undisturbed, speaking heartily and to the point, but skillfully avoiding the perils that beset the candidate who talks. When at last the Republican Convention came together on June 7, 1864, it had less to do than any other convention in our political history, for its delegates were bound by a peremptory mandate. It was opened by brief remarks from Senator Morgan of New York, whose significant statement that the convention would fall far short of accomplishing its great mission unless it declared for a constitutional amendment prohibiting African slavery was loudly cheered. In their speeches on taking the chair, both the temporary chairman, Rev. Robert J. Breckinridge of Kentucky, and the permanent chairman, William Dennison of Ohio, treated Mr. Lincoln's nomination as a foregone conclusion, and the applause which greeted his name showed that the delegates did not resent this disregard of customary etiquette. There were, in fact, but three tasks before the convention— 
to settle the status of contesting delegations, to agree upon a platform, and to nominate a candidate for vice president. The platform declared in favor of crushing rebellion and maintaining the integrity of the Union, commending the government's determination to enter into no compromise with the rebels. It applauded President Lincoln's patriotism and fidelity in the discharge of his duties, and stated that only those in harmony with these resolutions ought to have a voice in the administration of the government. This, while intended to win support of radicals throughout the Union, was aimed particularly at Postmaster General Blair, who had made many enemies. It approved all acts directed against slavery, declared in favor of a constitutional amendment forever abolishing it, claimed full protection of the laws of war for colored troops, expressed gratitude to the soldiers and sailors of the Union, pronounced in favor of encouraging foreign immigration, of building a Pacific Railway, of keeping inviolate the faith of the nation, pledged to redeem the national debt, and vigorously reaffirmed the Monroe Doctrine. Then came the nominations. The only delay in registering the will of the convention occurred as a consequence of the attempt of members to do it by irregular and summary methods. When Mr. Delano of Ohio made the customary motion to proceed to the nomination, Simon Cameron moved as a substitute the renomination of Lincoln and Hamlin by acclamation. A long wrangle ensued on the motion to lay this substitute on the table, which was finally brought to an end by the cooler heads, who desired that whatever opposition to Mr. Lincoln there might be in the convention should have the fullest opportunity of expression. The nominations, therefore, proceeded by call of states in the usual way. The interminable nominating speeches of recent years had not yet come into fashion. B.C. Cook, the chairman of the Illinois delegation, merely said, the state of Illinois again presents to the loyal people of this nation for President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. God bless him. Others who seconded the nomination were equally brief. Every state gave its undivided vote for Lincoln, with the exception of Missouri, which cast its vote under positive instructions, as the chairman stated, for Grant. But before the result was announced, John F. Hume of Missouri moved that Mr. Lincoln's nomination be declared unanimous. This could not be done until the result of the balloting was made known. 484 for Lincoln, 22 for Grant. Missouri then changed its vote, and the secretary read the grand total of 506 for Lincoln, the announcement being greeted with a storm of cheering which lasted many minutes. The principal names mentioned for the vice presidency were Hannibal Hamlin, the actual incumbent, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, and Daniel S. Dickinson of New York. Besides these, General L. H. Rousseau had the vote of his own state, Kentucky. The radicals of Missouri favored General B. F. Butler, who had a few scattered votes also from New England. Among the principal candidates, however, the voters were equally enough divided to make the contest exceedingly spirited and interesting. For several days before the convention met, Mr. Lincoln had been besieged by inquiries as to his personal wishes in regard to his associate on the ticket. He had persistently refused to give the slightest intimation of such wish. His private secretary, Mr. Nicolay, who was at Baltimore in attendance at the convention, was well acquainted with this attitude. But at last, overborne by the solicitations of the chairman of the Illinois delegation, who had been perplexed at the advocacy of Joseph Holt by Leonard Sweat, one of the president's most intimate friends, Mr. Nicolay wrote to Mr. Hay, who had been left in charge of the executive office in his absence. Cook wants to know, confidentially, whether Sweat is all right whether in urging Holt for vice president he reflects the president's wishes, whether the president has any preference, either personal or on the score of policy, or whether he wishes not even to interfere by a confidential intimation. Please get this information for me if possible. The letter was shown to the president, who endorsed upon it, 
Sweat is unquestionably all right. Mr. Holt is a good man, but I had not heard or thought of him for V.P. Wish not to interfere about V.P. Cannot interfere about platform. Convention must judge for itself. This positive and final instruction was sent at once to Mr. Nicolay, and by him communicated to the President's most intimate friends in the convention. It was therefore with minds absolutely untrammeled by even any knowledge of the President's wishes that the convention went about its work of selecting his associate on the ticket. It is altogether probable that the ticket of 1860 would have been nominated without a contest had it not been for the general impression, in and out of the convention, that it would be advisable to select as a candidate for the vice presidency a war Democrat. Mr. Dickinson, while not putting himself forward as a candidate, had sanctioned the use of his name on the special ground that his candidacy might attract to the support of the Union Party many Democrats who would have been unwilling to support a ticket avowedly Republican. But these considerations weighed with still greater force in favor of Mr. Johnson, who was not only a Democrat, but also a citizen of a slave state. The first ballot showed that Mr. Johnson had received 200 votes, Mr. Hamlin 150, and Mr. Dickinson 108. And before the result was announced, almost the whole convention turned their votes to Johnson, whereupon his nomination was declared unanimous. The work was so quickly done that Mr. Lincoln received notice of the action of the convention only a few minutes after the telegram announcing his own renomination had reached him. Replying next day to a committee of notification, he said in part, I will neither conceal my gratification nor restrain the expression of my gratitude that the Union people, through their convention, in the continued effort to save and advance the nation, have deemed me not unworthy to remain in my present position. I know no reason to doubt that I shall accept the nomination tendered, and yet perhaps I should not declare definitely before reading and considering what is called the platform. I will say now, however, I approve the declaration in favor of so amending the Constitution as to prohibit slavery throughout the nation. When the people in revolt, with a hundred days of explicit notice that they could within those days resume their allegiance without the overthrow of their institutions, and that they could not resume it afterward, elected to stand out. Such amendment to the Constitution as is now proposed became a fitting and necessary conclusion to the final success of the Union cause. In the joint names of liberty and union, let us labor to give it legal form and practical effect. In his letter of June 29, formally accepting the nomination, the President observed the same wise rule of brevity which he had followed four years before. He made but one specific reference to any subject of discussion. While he accepted the convention's resolution reaffirming the Monroe Doctrine, he gave the convention and the country distinctly to understand that he stood by the action already adopted by himself and the Secretary of State. He said, there might be misunderstanding were I not to say that the position of the government in relation to the action of France in Mexico, as assumed through the State Department and approved and endorsed by the Convention among the measures and acts of the executive, will be faithfully maintained so long as the state of facts shall leave that position pertinent and applicable. This resolution, which was, in truth, a more vigorous assertion of the Monroe Doctrine than the author of that famous tenet ever dreamed of making, had been introduced in the convention by the radicals as a covert censure of Mr. Lincoln's attitude toward the French invasion of our sister republic, but through skillful wording of the platform had been turned by his friends into an endorsement of the administration. And indeed, this was most just since from the beginning President Lincoln and Mr. Seward had done all in their power to discourage the presence of foreign troops on Mexican territory. When a joint expedition by England, France, and Spain had been agreed upon to seize certain Mexican ports in default of a money indemnity demanded by those countries for outrages against their subjects, 
England had invited the United States to be a party to the convention. Instead, Mr. Lincoln and Mr. Seward attempted to aid Mexico with a sufficient sum to meet these demands, and notified Great Britain of their intention to do so, and the motives which prompted them. The friendly assistance came to naught. But as the three powers vigorously disclaimed any design against Mexico's territory or her form of government, the United States saw no necessity for further action, beyond a clear definition of its own attitude, for the benefit of all the parties. This it continued to repeat after England withdrew from the expedition, and Spain, soon recalling her troops, left Napoleon III to set Archduke Maximilian on his shadowy throne, and to develop in the heart of America his scheme of an empire friendly to the South. At the moment the government was unable to do more, though recognizing the veiled hostility of Europe which thus manifested itself in a movement on what may be called the right flank of the Republic. While giving utterance to no expressions of indignation at the aggressions, or of gratification at disaster which met the aggressor, the President and Mr. Seward continued to assert, at every proper opportunity, the adherence of the American government to its traditional policy of discouraging European intervention in the affairs of the New World. End of chapter 31Chapter 32 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. By John G. Nicolay. Chapter 32 The Bogus Proclamation. The Wade Davis Manifesto. Resignation of Mr. Chase. Fessenden succeeds him. The Greeley Peace Conference. Jaques Gilmore Mission. Letter of Raymond. Bad Outlook for the Election. Mr. Lincoln on the Issues of the Campaign President's Secret Memorandum Meeting of Democratic National Convention McClellan Nominated His Letter of Acceptance Lincoln Re-elected His Speech on Night of Election The Electoral Vote Annual Message of December 6th 1864. Resignation of McClellan from the Army. The seizure of the New York Journal of Commerce and New York World in May 1864 for publishing a forged proclamation calling for 400,000 more troops had caused great excitement among the critics of Mr. Lincoln's administration. The terrible slaughter of Grant's opening campaign against Richmond rendered the country painfully sensitive to such news at the moment, and the forgery, which proved to be the work of two young bohemians of the press, accomplished its purpose of raising the price of gold and throwing the stock exchange into a temporary fever. Telegraphic announcement of the imposture soon quieted the flurry, and the quick detection of the guilty parties reduced the incident to its true rank. But the fact that the fiery Secretary of War had meanwhile issued orders for the suppression of both newspapers and the arrest of their editors was never forgiven nor forgotten. The editors were never incarcerated, and the journals resumed publication after an interval of only two days, but the incident was vigorously employed during the entire summer as a means of attack upon the administration. Violent opposition to Mr. Lincoln came also from those members of both houses of Congress who disapproved his attitude on Reconstruction. Though that part of his message on December 8, 1863, relating to the formation of loyal state governments in districts which had been in rebellion, 
at first received enthusiastic commendation from both conservatives and radicals, it was soon evident that the millennium had not yet arrived, and that in a Congress composed of men of such positive convictions and vehement character, there were many who would not submit permanently to the leadership of any man, least of all to that of one so reasonable, so devoid of malice, as the President. Henry Winter Davis at once moved that that part of the message be referred to a special committee of which he was chairman, and on February 15 reported a bill whose preamble declared the Confederate States completely out of the Union, prescribing a totally different method of reestablishing loyal state governments, one of the essentials being the prohibition of slavery. Congress rejected the preamble, but after extensive debate accepted the bill, which breathed the same spirit throughout. The measure was also finally acceded to in the Senate, and came to Mr. Lincoln for signature in the closing hours of the session. He laid it aside and went on with other business, despite the evident anxiety of several friends, who feared his failure to endorse it would lose the Republicans many votes in the Northwest. In stating his attitude to his cabinet, he said, This bill and the position of these gentlemen seem to me in asserting that the insurrectionary states are no longer in the Union, to make the fatal admission that states, whenever they please, may of their own motion dissolve their connection with the Union. Now we cannot survive that admission, I am convinced. If that be true, I am not president. These gentlemen are not Congress. I have laboriously endeavored to avoid that question ever since it first began to be mooted, and thus to avoid confusion and disturbance in our own councils. It was to obviate this question that I earnestly favored the movement for an amendment to the Constitution abolishing slavery, which passed the Senate and failed in the House. I thought it much better, if it were possible, to restore the Union without the necessity of a violent quarrel among its friends as to whether certain states have been in or out of the Union during the war, a merely metaphysical question, and one unnecessary to be forced into discussion. But though every member of the Cabinet agreed with him, he foresaw the importance of the step he had resolved to take, and its possible disastrous consequences to himself. When someone said that the threats of the radicals were without foundation, and that the people would not bolt their ticket on a question of metaphysics, he answered, If they choose to make a point upon this, I do not doubt that they can do harm. They have never been friendly to me. At all events, I must keep some consciousness of being somewhere near right. I must keep some standard or principle fixed within myself. Convinced after fullest deliberation, that the bill was too restrictive in its provisions, and yet unwilling to reject whatever of practical good might be accomplished by it, he disregarded precedence, and acting on his lifelong rule of taking the people into his confidence, issued a proclamation on July 8, giving a copy of the Bill of Congress, reciting the circumstances under which it was passed, and announcing that while he was unprepared by formal approval of the bill to be inflexibly committed to any single plan of restoration, or to set aside the free state governments already adopted in Arkansas and Louisiana, or to declare that Congress was competent to decree the abolishment of slavery, yet he was fully satisfied with the plan as one very proper method of reconstruction, and promised executive aid to any state that might see fit to adopt it. The great mass of Republican voters who cared little for the metaphysics of the case accepted this proclamation, as they had accepted that issued six months before, as the wisest and most practicable method of handling the question. But among those already hostile to the President, and those whose devotion to the cause of freedom was so ardent as to make them look upon him as lukewarm, the exasperation which was already excited increased. The indignation of Mr. Davis and of Mr. Wade, who called the bill up in the Senate, at seeing their work thus brought to nothing, could not be restrained. And together they signed and published, in the New York Tribune of August 5, 
the most vigorous attack ever directed against the president from his own party. Insinuating that only the lowest motives dictated his action, since by refusing to sign the bill he held the electoral votes of the rebel states at his personal dictation, calling his approval of the bill of Congress as a very proper plan for any state choosing to adopt it, a studied outrage, and admonishing the people to consider the remedy of these usurpations, and having found it, to fearlessly execute it. Congress had already repealed the fugitive slave law, and to the voters at large who joyfully accepted the Emancipation Proclamation, it mattered very little whether the institution came to its inevitable end, in the fragments of territory where it yet remained, by virtue of Congressional Act or Executive Decree. This tempest over the method of Reconstruction had, therefore, little bearing on the presidential campaign, and appealed more to individual critics of the president than to the mass of the people. Mr. Chase entered in his diary, The president pocketed the great bill. He did not venture to veto, and so put it in his pocket. It was a condemnation of his amnesty proclamation and of his general policy of Reconstruction, rejecting the idea of possible Reconstruction with slavery, which neither the President nor his chief advisers have, in my opinion, abandoned. Mr. Chase was no longer one of the chief advisers. After his withdrawal from his hopeless contest for the presidency, his sentiments towards Mr. Lincoln took on a tinge of bitterness which increased until their friendly association in the public service became no longer possible. And on June 30 he sent the President his resignation, which was accepted. There is reason to believe that he did not expect such a prompt severing of their official relations, since more than once in the months of friction which preceded this culmination, he had used a threat to resign as means to carry some point in controversy. Mr. Lincoln, on accepting his resignation, sent the name of David Todd of Ohio to the Senate as his successor but receiving a telegram from Mr. Todd, declining on the plea of ill health, substituted that of William Pitt Fessenden, chairman of the Senate Committee on Finance, whose nomination was instantly confirmed and commanded general approval. Horace Greeley, editor of the powerful New York Tribune, had become one of those patriots whose discouragement and discontent led them, during the summer of 1864, to give ready hospitality to any suggestions to end the war. In July, he wrote to the President, forwarding the letter of one William Cornell Jewett of Colorado, which announced the arrival in Canada of two ambassadors from Jefferson Davis with full powers to negotiate a peace. Mr. Greeley urged in his over-fervid letter of transmittal that the President make overtures on the following plan of adjustment. First, the Union to be restored and declared perpetual. Second, slavery to be utterly and forever abolished. Third, a complete amnesty for all political offenses. Fourth, payment of $400 million to the slave states, pro rata, for their slaves. Fifth, slave states to be represented in proportion to their total population. Sixth, a national convention to be called at once. Though Mr. Lincoln had no faith in Jewett's story, and doubted whether the embassy had any existence, he determined to take immediate action on this proposition. He felt the unreasonableness and injustice of Mr. Greeley's letter, which in effect charged his administration with a cruel disinclination to treat with the rebels, and resolved to convince him at least and perhaps others, that there was no foundation for these reproaches. So he arranged that the witness of his willingness to listen to any overtures that might come from the South should be Mr. Greeley himself, and answering his letter at once on July 9, said, If you can find any person anywhere professing to have any proposition of Jefferson Davis in writing for peace, embracing the restoration of the Union and abandonment of slavery, 
whatever else it embraces, say to him he may come to me with you, and that if he really brings such proposition, he shall at least have safe conduct with the paper, and without publicity if he chooses, to the point where you shall have met him, the same if there be two or more persons. This ready acquiescence evidently surprised and somewhat embarrassed Mr. Greeley, who replied by several letters of different dates, but made no motion to produce his commissioners. At last, on the 15th, to end a correspondence which promised to be indefinitely prolonged, the President telegraphed him, I was not expecting you to send me a letter, but to bring me a man or men. Mr. Greeley then went to Niagara and wrote from there to the alleged commissioners Clement C. Clay and James P. Holcomb, offering to conduct them to Washington, but neglecting to mention the two conditions, restoration of the Union and abandonment of slavery, laid down in Mr. Lincoln's note of the ninth and repeated by him on the 15th. Even with this great advantage, Clay and Holcomb felt themselves too devoid of credentials to accept Mr. Grilly's offer, but replied that they could easily get credentials, or that other agents could be accredited, if they could be sent to Richmond armed with the circumstances disclosed in this correspondence. This, of course, meant that Mr. Lincoln should take the initiative in suing the Richmond authorities for peace on terms proposed by them. The essential impossibility of these terms was not, however, apparent to Mr. Greeley, who sent them on to Washington, soliciting fresh instructions. With unwearied patience, Mr. Lincoln drew up a final paper, to whom it may concern, formally restating his position, and dispatched Major Hay with it to Niagara. This ended the conference the Confederates charging the President through the newspapers with a sudden and entire change of views, while Mr. Greeley, being attacked by his colleagues of the press for his action, could defend himself only by implied censure of the President, utterly overlooking the fact that his own original letter had contained the identical propositions Mr. Lincoln insisted upon. The discussion grew so warm that both he and his assailants had at last joined in a request to Mr. Lincoln to permit the publication of the correspondence. This was, of course, an excellent opportunity for the President to vindicate his own proceeding. But he rarely looked at such matters from the point of view of personal advantage, and he feared that the passionate, almost despairing appeals of the most prominent Republican editor of the North for peace at any cost disclosed in the correspondence, would deepen the gloom in the public mind and have an injurious effect upon the Union cause. The spectacle of the veteran journalist, who was justly regarded as the leading controversial writer on the anti-slavery side, ready to sacrifice everything for peace and frantically denouncing the government for refusing to surrender the contest, would have been, in its effect upon public opinion, a disaster equal to the loss of a great battle. He therefore proposed to Mr. Greeley, in case the letters were published, to omit some of the most vehement passages, and took Mr. Greeley's refusal to assent to this as a veto on their publication. It was characteristic of him that, seeing the temper in which Mr. Greeley regarded the transaction, he dropped the matter and submitted in silence to the misrepresentations to which he was subjected by reason of it. Some thought he erred in giving any hearing to the rebels. Some criticized his choice of a commissioner. And the opposition naturally made the most of his conditions of negotiation and accused him of embarking in a war of extermination in the interests of the Negro. Though making no public effort to set himself right, he was keenly alive to their attitude. To a friend he wrote, Saying reunion and abandonment of slavery would be considered, if offered, is not saying that nothing else or less would be considered, if offered. Allow me to remind you that no one, having control of the rebel armies, or, in fact, having any influence whatever in the rebellion, has offered, or intimated, a willingness to a restoration of the Union, in any event 
or on any condition whatever. If Jefferson Davis wishes for himself, or for the benefit of his friends at the North, to know what I would do if he were to offer peace and reunion, saying nothing about slavery, let him try me. If the result of Mr. Greeley's Niagara efforts left any doubt that peace was at present unattainable, the fact was demonstrated beyond question by the published report of another unofficial and volunteer negotiation which was proceeding at the same time. In May 1863, James F. J. Quest, D.D., a Methodist clergyman of piety and religious enthusiasm, who had been appointed by Governor Yates, colonel of an Illinois regiment, applied for permission to go south, urging that by virtue of his church relations he could, within ninety days, obtain acceptable terms of peace from the Confederates. The military superiors to whom he submitted the request forwarded it to Mr. Lincoln with a favorable endorsement, and the President replied, consenting that they grant him a furlough if they saw fit, but saying, he cannot go with any government authority whatever. This is absolute and imperative. Eleven days later, he was back again within Union lines, claiming to have valuable unofficial proposals for peace. President Lincoln paid no attention to his request for an interview, and in course of time he returned to his regiment. Nothing daunted, however, a year later he applied for and received permission to repeat his visit, this time in company with J.R. Gilmore, a lecturer and writer, but, as before, expressly without instruction or authority from Mr. Lincoln. They went to Richmond and had an extended interview with Mr. Davis, during which they proposed to him a plan of adjustment as visionary as it was unauthorized, its central feature being a general election to be held over the whole country, north and south, within sixty days, on the two propositions, peace with disunion and southern independence, or peace with union, emancipation, no confiscation, and universal amnesty. The majority vote to decide, and the governments at Washington and Richmond to be finally bound by the decision. The interview resulted in nothing but a renewed declaration from Mr. Davis that he would fight for separation to the bitter end, a declaration which, on the whole, was of service to the Union cause, since, to a great extent, it stopped the clamor of the peace factionists during the presidential campaign. Not entirely, however. There was still criticism enough to induce Henry J. Raymond, chairman of the executive committee of the Republican Party, to write a letter on August 22, suggesting to Mr. Lincoln that he ought to appoint a commission in due form to make proffers of peace to Davis on the sole condition of acknowledging the supremacy of the Constitution, all other questions to be settled in a convention of the people of all the states. Mr. Lincoln answered this patiently and courteously, framing, to give a point to his argument, an experimental draft of instructions with which he proposed, in case such proffers were made, to send Mr. Raymond himself to the rebel authorities. On seeing these in black and white, Raymond, who had come to Washington to urge his project, readily agreed with the President and Secretaries Seward, Stanton, and Fessenden that to carry it out would be worse than losing the presidential contest it would be ignominiously surrendering it in advance. Nevertheless, wrote an inmate of the White House, the visit of himself and committee here did great good. They found the President and Cabinet much better informed than themselves, and went home encouraged and cheered. The Democratic managers had called the National Convention of their party to meet on the 4th of July, 1864, but after the nomination of Fremont at Cleveland and of Lincoln at Baltimore, it was thought prudent to postpone it to a later date, in the hope that something in the chapter of accidents might arise to the advantage of the opposition. It appeared for a while as if this maneuver were to be successful. The military situation was far from satisfactory. 
The terrible fighting of Grant's army in Virginia had profoundly shocked and depressed the country, and its movement upon Petersburg, so far without decisive results, had contributed little hope or encouragement. The campaign of Sherman in Georgia gave as yet no positive assurance of the brilliant results it afterward attained. The Confederate raid into Maryland and Pennsylvania in July was the cause of great annoyance and exasperation. This untoward state of things in the field of military operations found its exact counterpart in the political campaign. Several circumstances contributed to divide and discourage the administration party. The resignation of Mr. Chase had seemed to not a few leading Republicans a presage of disintegration in the government. Mr. Greeley's mission at Niagara Falls had unsettled and troubled the minds of many. The Democrats, not having as yet appointed a candidate or formulated a platform, were free to devote all their leisure to attacks upon the administration. The rebel emissaries in Canada, being in thorough concert with the leading peace men of the North, redoubled their efforts to disturb the public tranquility, and not without success. In the midst of these discouraging circumstances, the manifesto of Wade and Davis had appeared to add its depressing influence to the general gloom. Mr. Lincoln realized to the full the tremendous issues of the campaign. Asked in August by a friend who noted his worn looks, if he could not go away for a fortnight's rest, he replied, I cannot fly from my thoughts. My solicitude for this great country follows me wherever I go. I do not think it is personal vanity or ambition, though I am not free from these infirmities. But I cannot but feel the weal or woe of this great nation will be decided in November. There is no program offered by any wing of the Democratic Party, but that must result in the permanent destruction of the Union. But Mr. President, his friend objected, General McClellan is in favor of crushing out this rebellion by force. He will be the Chicago candidate. Sir, the slightest knowledge of arithmetic will prove to any man that the rebel armies cannot be destroyed by democratic strategy. It would sacrifice all the white men of the North to do it. There are now in the service of the United States nearly 150,000 able-bodied colored men, most of them under arms, defending and acquiring Union territory. The democratic strategy demands that these forces be disbanded and that the masters be conciliated by restoring them to slavery. You cannot conciliate the South if you guarantee to them ultimate success. And the experience of the present war proves their success is inevitable if you fling the compulsory labor of millions of black men into their side of the scale. Abandon all the posts now garrisoned by black men. Take 150,000 men from our side and put them in the battlefield or cornfield against us, and we would be compelled to abandon the war in three weeks. My enemies pretend I am now carrying on this war for the sole purpose of abolition. So long as I am president, it shall be carried on for the sole purpose of restoring the Union. But no human power can subdue this rebellion without the use of the emancipation policy and every other policy calculated to weaken the moral and physical forces of the rebellion. Let my enemies prove to the country that the destruction of slavery is not necessary to a restoration of the Union. I will abide the issue. The political situation grew still darker. When at last, toward the end of August, the general gloom had enveloped even the President himself, his action was most original and characteristic. Feeling that the campaign was going against him, he made up his mind deliberately as to the course he should pursue, and laid down for himself the action demanded by his conviction of duty. He wrote on August 23 the following memorandum. This morning, as for some days past, it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be re-elected. Then it will be my duty to so cooperate with the President-elect as to save the Union between the election and the inauguration. 
as he will have secured his election on such ground that he cannot possibly save it afterwards. He then folded and pasted the sheet in such manner that its contents could not be read, and as the cabinet came together he handed this paper to each member successively, requesting them to write their names across the back of it. In this peculiar fashion he pledged himself and the administration to accept loyally the anticipated verdict of the people against him, and to do their utmost to save the Union in the brief remainder of his term of office. He gave no intimation to any member of his cabinet of the nature of the paper they had signed until after his re-election. The Democratic Convention was finally called to meet in Chicago on August 29. Much had been expected by the Peace Party from the strength and audacity of its adherents in the Northwest. And, indeed, the day of the meeting of the convention was actually the date appointed by rebel emissaries in Canada for an outbreak which should affect that revolution in the northwestern states which had long been their chimerical dream. This scheme of the American Knights, however, was discovered and guarded against through the usual treachery of some of their members, and it is doubtful if the Democrats reaped any real, permanent advantage from the delay of their convention. On coming together, the only manner in which the peacemen and war Democrats could arrive at any agreement was by mutual deception. The war Democrats, led by the delegation from New York, were working for a military candidate, while the peace Democrats, under the leadership of Vallandigham, who had returned from Canada and was allowed to remain at large, through the half-contemptuous and half-calculated leniency of the government he defied, bent all their energies to a clear statement of their principles in the platform. Both got what they desired. General McClellan was nominated on the first ballot, and Vallandigham wrote the only plank worth quoting in the platform. It asserted that after four years of failure to restore the Union by the experiment of war, during which the Constitution itself has been disregarded in every part, public welfare demands that immediate efforts be made for a cessation of hostilities. It is altogether probable that this distinct proposition of surrender to the Confederates might have been modified or defeated in full convention if the war Democrats had had the courage of their convictions. But they were so intent upon the nomination of McClellan that they considered the platform of secondary importance, and the fatal resolutions were adopted without debate. Mr. Vallandigham, having thus taken possession of the convention, next adopted the candidate, and put the seal of his sinister approval on General McClellan by moving that his nomination be made unanimous, which was done amid great cheering. George H. Pendleton was nominated for vice president, and the convention adjourned, not sine die as is customary, but subject to be called at any time and place the Executive National Committee shall designate. The motives of this action were not avowed, but it was taken as a significant warning that the leaders of the Democratic Party held themselves ready for any extraordinary measures which the exigencies of the time might provoke or invite. The New Yorkers, however, had the last word, for Governor Seymour, in his letter as chairman of the committee to inform McClellan of his nomination, assured him that those for whom we speak were animated with the most earnest, devoted, and prayerful desire for the salvation of the American Union. And the general, knowing that the poison of death was in the platform, took occasion in his letter of acceptance to renew his assurances of devotion to the Union, the Constitution, the laws, and the flag of his country. After having thus absolutely repudiated the platform upon which he was nominated, he coolly concluded, Believing that the views here expressed are those of the convention and the people you represent, I accept the nomination. His only possible chance of success lay, of course, in his war record. His position as a candidate on the platform of dishonorable peace would have been no less desperate than ridiculous. But the stars in their courses fought against the Democratic candidates. Even before the convention that nominated them, Farragut had won the splendid victory of Mobile Bay, 
During the very hours when the streets of Chicago were blazing with Democratic torches, Hood was preparing to evacuate Atlanta, and the same newspaper that printed Vallandigham's peace platform announced Sherman's entrance into the manufacturing metropolis of Georgia. The darkest hour had passed. Dawn was at hand, and amid the thanksgivings of a grateful people and the joyful salutes of great guns, the presidential campaign began. When the country awoke to the true significance of the Chicago platform, the successes of Sherman excited the enthusiasm of the people, and the Unionists, arousing from their midsummer languor, began to show their confidence in the Republican candidate. The hopelessness of all efforts to undermine him became evident. The electoral contest began with the picket firing in Vermont and Maine in September, was continued in what might be called the Grand Guard fighting in October in the great states of Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana, and the final battle took place all along the line on November 8. To Mr. Lincoln, this was one of the most solemn days of his life. Assured of his personal success, and made devoutly confident by the military successes of the last few weeks that the day of peace and the reestablishment of the Union was at hand, he felt no elation and no sense of triumph over his opponents. The thoughts that filled his mind were expressed in the closing sentences of the little speech he made in response to a group of serenaders that greeted him when, in the early morning hours, he left the War Department, where he had gone on the evening of election to receive the returns. I am thankful to God for this approval of the people, but while deeply grateful for this mark of their confidence in me, if I know my heart, my gratitude is free from any taint of personal triumph. I do not impugn the motives of any one opposed to me. It is no pleasure to me to triumph over any one, but I give thanks to the Almighty for this evidence of the people's resolution to stand by free government and the rights of humanity. Lincoln and Johnson received a popular majority of 411,281 and 212 out of 233 electoral votes, only those of New Jersey, Delaware, and Kentucky, 21 in all, being cast for McClellan. In his annual message to Congress, which met on December 5, President Lincoln gave the best summing up of the results of the election that has ever been written. The purpose of the people within the loyal states to maintain the integrity of the Union was never more firm nor more nearly unanimous than now. No candidate for any office whatever, high or low, has ventured to seek votes on the avowal that he was for giving up the Union. There have been much impugning of motives and much heated controversy as to the proper means and best mode of advancing the Union cause, but on the distinct issue of Union or no Union, the politicians have shown their instinctive knowledge that there is no diversity among the people. In affording the people the fair opportunity of showing one to another and to the world this firmness and unanimity of purpose, the election has been of vast value to the national cause. On the day of the election, General McClellan resigned his commission in the Army, and the place thus made vacant was filled by the appointment of General Philip H. Sheridan, a fit type and illustration of the turn in the tide of affairs, which was to sweep from that time rapidly onward, to the great decisive national triumph. End of chapter 32。Chapter 33 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 33 the 13th 
Amendment The President's Speech on Its Adoption The Two Constitutional Amendments of Lincoln's Term Lincoln on Peace and Slavery in His Annual Message of December 6, 1864 Blair's Mexican Project The Hampton Roads Conference a joint resolution proposing an amendment to the Constitution prohibiting slavery throughout the United States had passed the Senate on April 8, 1864, but had failed of the necessary two-thirds vote in the House. The two most vital thoughts which animated the Baltimore Convention when it met in June had been the renomination of Mr. Lincoln and the success of this constitutional amendment. The first was recognized as a popular decision needing only the formality of an announcement by the convention, and the full emphasis of speech and resolution had therefore been centered on the latter as the dominant and aggressive reform upon which the party would stake its political fortunes in the presidential campaign. Mr. Lincoln had himself suggested to Mr. Morgan the wisdom of sounding that keynote in his opening speech before the convention and the great victory gained at the polls in November not only demonstrated his sagacity, but enabled him to take up the question with confidence among his recommendations to Congress in the annual message of December 6, 1864. Relating the fate of the measure at the preceding session, he said, Without questioning the wisdom or patriotism of those who stood in opposition, I venture to recommend the reconsideration and passage of the measure at the present session. Of course, the abstract question is not changed, but an intervening election shows, almost certainly, that the next Congress will pass the measure if this does not. Hence, there is only a question of time as to when the proposed amendment will go to the states for their action. And as it is to so go at all events, May we not agree that the sooner the better? It is not claimed that the election has imposed a duty on members to change their views or their votes any further than, as an additional element to be considered, their judgment may be affected by it. It is the voice of the people, now for the first time heard upon the question. In a great national crisis like ours, Unanimity of action among those seeking a common end is very desirable, almost indispensable, and yet no approach to such unanimity is attainable unless some deference shall be paid to the will of the majority, simply because it is the will of the majority. In this case, the common end is the maintenance of the Union, and among the means to secure that end, such will, through the election, is most clearly declared in favor of such constitutional amendment. The joint resolution was called up in the House on January 6, 1865, and general discussion followed from time to time, occupying perhaps half the days of that month. As at the previous session, the Republicans all favored, while the Democrats mainly opposed it, but important exceptions among the latter showed what immense gains the proposition had made in popular opinion and in congressional willingness to recognize and embody it. The logic of events had become more powerful than party creed or strategy. For fifteen years the Democratic Party had stood as sentinel and bulwark to slavery, and yet, despite its alliance and championship, the peculiar institution was being consumed in the fire of war. It had withered in popular elections, been paralyzed by confiscation laws, crushed by executive decrees, trampled upon by marching Union armies. More notable than all, the agony of dissolution had come upon it in its final stronghold, the constitutions of the slave states. Local public opinion had throttled it in West Virginia, in Missouri, in Arkansas, in Louisiana, in Maryland, and showed the same spirit of change was upon Tennessee, and even showing itself in Kentucky. The Democratic Party did not, and could not, 
shut its eyes to the accomplished facts. The issue was decided on the afternoon of January 31, 1865. The scene was one of unusual interest. The galleries were filled to overflowing, and members watched the proceedings with unconcealed solicitude. Up to noon, said a contemporaneous report, the pro-slavery party are said to have been confident of defeating the amendment, and after that time had passed, one of the most earnest advocates of the measure said, "'Tis the toss of a copper." At four o'clock the House came to a final vote, and the roll call showed, yeas, 119, nays, 56, not voting, 8. Scattering murmurs of applause followed affirmative votes from several Democratic members. But when the Speaker finally announced the result, members on the Republican side of the House sprang to their feet and, regardless of parliamentary rules, applauded with cheers and hand clappings, an exhibition of enthusiasm quickly echoed by the spectators in the crowded galleries, where waving of hats and handkerchiefs and similar demonstrations of joy lasted for several minutes. A salute of 100 guns soon made the occasion the subject of comment and congratulation throughout the city. On the following night, a considerable procession marched with music to the executive mansion to carry popular greetings to the president. In response to their calls, he appeared at the window and made a brief speech, of which only an abstract report was preserved but which is nevertheless important as showing the searching analysis of cause and effect this question had undergone in his mind, the deep interest he felt in it, and the far-reaching consequences he attached to the measure and its success. The occasion was one of congratulation to the country and to the whole world, but there is a task yet before us, to go forward and have consummated by the votes of the states that which Congress had so nobly begun yesterday. He had the honor to inform those present that Illinois had already today done the work. Maryland was about half through, but he felt proud that Illinois was a little ahead. He thought this measure was very fitting, if not an indispensable adjunct to the winding up of the great difficulty. He wished the reunion of all the states perfected, and so effected as to remove all causes of disturbance in the future. And to attain this end, it was necessary that the original disturbing cause should, if possible, be rooted out. He thought all would bear him witness that he had never shrunk from doing all that he could to eradicate slavery by issuing an Emancipation Proclamation. But that proclamation falls far short of what the amendment will be when fully consummated. A question might be raised whether the proclamation was legally valid. It might be urged that it only aided those that came into our lines, and that it was inoperative as to those who did not give themselves up, or that it would have no effect upon the children of slaves born hereafter. In fact, it would be urged that it did not meet the evil. But this amendment is a king's cure-all for all the evils. It winds the whole thing up. He would repeat that it was the fitting, if not the indispensable adjunct to the consummation of the great game we are playing. Widely divergent views were expressed by able constitutional lawyers as to what would constitute a valid ratification of the 13th Amendment some contending that ratification by three-fourths of the loyal states would be sufficient, others that three-fourths of all the states, whether loyal or insurrectionary, was necessary. Mr. Lincoln, in a speech on Louisiana Reconstruction, while expressing no opinion against the first proposition, nevertheless declared with great argumentative force that the latter would be unquestioned and unquestionable, and this view appears to have governed the action of his successor. As Mr. Lincoln mentioned with just pride, Illinois was the first state to ratify the amendment. On December 18, 1865, Mr. Seward, who remained as Secretary of State in the cabinet of President Johnson, made official proclamation that the legislatures of 27 states, 
constituting three-fourths of the 36 states of the Union, had ratified the amendment, and that it had become valid as a part of the Constitution. Four of the states constituting this number, Virginia, Louisiana, Tennessee, and Arkansas, were those whose Reconstruction had been effected under the direction of President Lincoln. Six more states subsequently ratified the amendment, Texas ending the list in February 1870. The profound political transformation which the American Republic had undergone can perhaps best be measured by contrasting the two constitutional amendments which Congress made it the duty of the Lincoln administration to submit officially to the states. The first, signed by President Buchanan as one of his last official acts, and accepted and endorsed by Lincoln in his inaugural address, was in these words, No amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give to Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state. Between Lincoln's inauguration and the outbreak of war, the Department of State transmitted this amendment to the several states for their action, and had the South shown a willingness to desist from secession and accept it as a peace offering, there is little doubt that it would have become a part of the Constitution. But the thunder of Beauregard's guns drove away all possibility of such a ratification, and within four years the Lincoln administration set forth the amendment of 1865, sweeping out of existence by one sentence the institution to which it had in its first proposal offered a virtual claim to perpetual recognition and tolerance. The new birth of freedom, which Lincoln invoked for the nation in his Gettysburg Address, was accomplished. The closing paragraphs of President Lincoln's message to Congress on December 6, 1864, were devoted to a summing up of the existing situation. The verdict of the ballot box had not only decided the continuance of a war administration and war policy, but renewed the assurance of a public sentiment to sustain its prosecution. Inspired by this majestic manifestation of the popular will, he was able to speak of the future with hope and confidence. But with characteristic prudence and good taste, he uttered no word of boasting and indulged in no syllable of acrimony. On the contrary, in terms of fatherly kindness, he again offered the rebellious states the generous conditions he had previously tendered them. The national resources, then, are unexhausted and, as we believe, inexhaustible. The public purpose to reestablish and maintain the national authority is unchanged and, as we believe, unchangeable. The manner of continuing the effort remains to choose. On careful consideration of all the evidence accessible, it seems to me that no attempt at negotiation with the insurgent leader could result in any good. He would accept nothing short of severance of the Union, precisely what we will not and cannot give. His declarations to this effect are explicit and oft-repeated. What is true, however, of him who heads the insurgent cause is not necessarily true of those who follow. Although he cannot reaccept the Union, they can. Some of them, we know, already desire peace and reunion. The number of such may increase. They can, at any moment, have peace simply by laying down their arms and submitting to the national authority under the Constitution. After so much, the government could not, if it would, maintain war against them. The loyal people would not sustain or allow it. If questions should remain, we would adjust them by the peaceful means of legislation, conference, courts, and votes, operating only in constitutional and lawful channels. In presenting the abandonment of armed resistance to the national authority, on the part of the insurgents, as the only indispensable condition to ending the war on the part of the government, 
I retract nothing heretofore said as to slavery. I repeat the declaration made a year ago that, while I remain in my present position, I shall not attempt to retract or modify the Emancipation Proclamation, nor shall I return to slavery any person who is free by the terms of that proclamation, or by any of the acts of Congress. If the people should, by whatever mode or means, make it an executive duty to re-enslave such persons, another, and not I, must be their instrument to perform it. In stating a single condition of peace, I mean simply to say that the war will cease on the part of the government whenever it shall have ceased on the part of those who began it. The country was about to enter upon the fifth year of actual war, but all indications were pointing to a speedy collapse of the rebellion. This foreshadowed disaster to the Confederate armies gave rise to another volunteer peace negotiation, which, from the boldness of its animating thought and the prominence of its actors, assumes a special importance. The veteran politician, Francis P. Blair, Sr., who, from his long political and personal experience in Washington, knew, perhaps better than almost anyone else, the individual characters and tempers of Southern leaders, conceived that the time had come when he might take up the role of successful mediator between the North and the South. He gave various hints of his desire to President Lincoln, but received neither encouragement nor opportunity to unfold his plans. "'Come to me after Savannah Falls,' was Lincoln's evasive reply. On the surrender of that city, Mr. Blair hastened to put his design into execution, and with a simple card from Mr. Lincoln, dated December 28, saying, "'Allow the bearer, F. P. Blair, Sr., to pass our lines,' go south, and return, as his only credential, set out for Richmond. From General Grant's camp, he forwarded two letters to Jefferson Davis. One, a brief request to be allowed to go to Richmond in search of missing title papers, presumably taken from his Maryland home during Early's raid. The other, a long letter, explaining the real object of his visit but stating with the utmost candor that he came wholly unaccredited, save for permission to pass the lines, and that he had not offered the suggestions he wished to submit in person to Mr. Davis to anyone in authority at Washington. After some delay, he found himself in Richmond, and was accorded a confidential interview by the rebel president on January 12, 1865, when he unfolded his project, which proved to be nothing less than a proposition that the Union and Confederate armies cease fighting each other and unite to drive the French from Mexico. He supported this daring idea in a paper of some length, pointing out that as slavery, the real cause of the war, was hopelessly doomed, nothing now remained to keep the two sections of the country apart except the possible intervention of foreign soldiery. Hence, all considerations pointed to the wisdom of dislodging the French invaders from American soil, and thus baffling the designs of Napoleon to subject our southern people to the Latin race. He who expels the Bonaparte Habsburg dynasty from our southern flank, the paper said further, will ally his name with those of Washington and Jackson as the defender of the liberty of the country. If in delivering Mexico he should model its states in form and principle to adapt them to our Union, and add a new southern constellations to its benignant sky while rounding off our possessions on the continent at the Isthmus, he would complete the work of Jefferson, who first set one foot of our colossal government on the Pacific by a stride from the Gulf of Mexico. I then said to him, There is my problem, Mr. Davis. Do you think it possible to be solved? After consideration, he said, I think so. I then said, You see that I made the great point of this matter that the war is no longer made for slavery, but monarchy. You know that if the war is kept up and the Union kept divided, armies must be kept afoot on both sides, and this state of things has never continued long without resulting in monarchy on one side or the other, and 
and on both generally. He assented to this. The substantial accuracy of Mr. Blair's report is confirmed by the memorandum of the same interview which Jefferson Davis wrote at the time. In this conversation, the rebel leader took little pains to disguise his entire willingness to enter upon the wild scheme of military conquest and annexation, which could easily be read between the lines of a political crusade to rescue the Monroe Doctrine from its present peril. If Mr. Blair felt elated at having so quickly made a convert of the Confederate president, he was further gratified at discovering yet more favorable symptoms in his official surroundings at Richmond. In the three or four days he spent at the rebel capital, he found nearly every prominent personage convinced of the hopeless condition of the rebellion, and even eager to seize upon any contrivance to help them out of their direful prospects. But the government councils at Washington were not ruled by the spirit of political adventure. Abraham Lincoln had a loftier conception of patriotic duty and a higher ideal of national ethics. His whole interest in Mr. Blair's mission lay in the rebel despondency it disclosed, and the possibility it showed of bringing the Confederates to an abandonment of their resistance. Mr. Davis had, indeed, given Mr. Blair a letter to be shown to President Lincoln, stating his willingness, notwithstanding the rejection of our former offers, to appoint a commissioner to enter into negotiations with a view to secure peace to the two countries. This was, of course, the old impossible attitude. In reply, the President wrote Mr. Blair on January 18 the following note. Sir, you have shown me Mr. Davis's letter to you of the twelfth instant. You may say to him that I have constantly been, am now, and shall continue ready to receive any agent whom he, or any other influential person now resisting the national authority, may informally send to me, with the view of securing peace to the people of our one common country. With this, Mr. Blair returned to Richmond, giving Mr. Davis such excuses as he could hastily frame why the President had rejected his plan for a joint invasion of Mexico. Jefferson Davis, therefore, had only two alternatives before him, either to repeat his stubborn ultimatum of separation and independence, or frankly to accept Lincoln's ultimatum of reunion. The principal Richmond authorities knew, and some of them admitted, that their Confederacy was nearly in collapse. Lee sent a dispatch saying he had not two days' rations for his army. Richmond was already in a panic at rumors of evacuation. Flour was selling at a thousand dollars a barrel in Confederate currency. The recent fall of Fort Fisher had closed the last avenue through which blockade runners could bring in foreign supplies. Governor Brown of Georgia was refusing to obey orders from Richmond and characterizing them as despotic. Under such circumstances, a defiant cry of independence would not reassure anybody. Nor, on the other hand, was it longer possible to remain silent. Mr. Blair's first visit had created general interest. When he came a second time, wonder and rumor rose to a fever heat. Impelled to take action, Mr. Davis had not the courage to be frank. After consultation with his cabinet, a peace commission of three was appointed, consisting of Alexander H. Steffens, vice president, R.M.T. Hunter, senator and ex-secretary of state, and John A. Campbell, assistant secretary of war, all of them convinced that the rebellion was hopeless, but unwilling to admit the logical consequences and necessities. The drafting of instructions for their guidance was a difficult problem, since the explicit condition prescribed by Mr. Lincoln's note was that he would receive only an agent sent him with a view of securing peace to the people of our one common country. The rebel Secretary of State proposed, in order to make the instructions as vague and general as possible, the simple direction to confer upon the subject to which it relates. But his chief refused the suggestion, and wrote the following instruction which carried a palpable contradiction on its face. 
in conformity with the letter of Mr. Lincoln, of which the foregoing is a copy, you are requested to proceed to Washington City for informal conference with him upon the issues involved in the existing war and for the purpose of securing peace to the two countries. With this, the commissioners presented themselves at the Union lines on the evening of January 29, but instead of showing their double-meaning credential, asked admission in accordance with an understanding claimed to exist with Lieutenant General Grant. Mr. Lincoln, being apprised of the application, promptly dispatched Major Thomas T. Eckert of the War Department with written directions to admit them under safe conduct if they would say in writing that they came for the purpose of an informal conference on the basis of his note of January 18 to Mr. Blair. The commissioners, having meantime reconsidered the form of their application and addressed a new one to General Grant which met the requirements, were provisionally conveyed to Grant's headquarters, and on January 31, the President commissioned Secretary Seward to meet them, saying in his written instructions, You will make known to them that three things are indispensable, to wit, first, the restoration of the national authority throughout all the states. Second, no receding by the executive of the United States on the slavery question from the position assumed thereon in the late annual message to Congress, and in preceding documents. Third, no cessation of hostility short of an end of the war, and the disbanding of all forces hostile to the government. You will inform them that all propositions of theirs not inconsistent with the above, will be considered and passed upon in a spirit of sincere liberality. You will hear all that they may choose to say and report it to me. You will not assume to definitely consummate anything. Mr. Seward started on the morning of February 1, and simultaneously with his departure, the President repeated to General Grant the munition already sent him two days before. Let nothing which is transpiring change hinder or delay your military movements or plans. Major Eckert had arrived while Mr. Seward was yet on the way, and on seeing Jefferson Davis's instructions, promptly notified the commissioners that they could not proceed further without complying strictly with President Lincoln's terms. Thus, at half-past nine on the night of February 1, their mission was practically at an end, though next day they again recanted and accepted the President's conditions in writing. Mr. Lincoln, on reading Major Eckert's report on the morning of February 2, was about to recall Secretary Seward by telegraph when he was shown a confidential despatch from General Grant to the Secretary of War, stating his belief that the intention of the commissioners was good, and their desire for peace sincere, and regretting that Mr. Lincoln could not have an interview with them. This communication served to change his purpose, resolving not to neglect the indications of sincerity here described. He telegraphed at once, Say to the gentlemen I will meet them personally at Fortress Monroe as soon as I can get there, and joined Secretary Seward that same night. On the morning of February 3, 1865, the rebel commissioners were conducted on board the River Queen, lying at anchor near Fort Monroe, where President Lincoln and Secretary Seward awaited them. It was agreed beforehand that no writing or memorandum should be made at the time, so the record of the interview remains only in the separate accounts which the rebel commissioners wrote out afterward from memory, neither Mr. Seward nor President Lincoln ever having made any report in detail. In a careful analysis of these reports, the first striking feature is the difference of intention between the parties. It is apparent that Mr. Lincoln went honestly and frankly to offer them the best terms he could to secure peace and reunion, but not to abate no jot of official duty or personal dignity, while the main thought of the commissioners was to evade the express condition on which they had been admitted to conference to seek to postpone the vital issue, 
and to propose an armistice by debating a mere juggling expedient against which they had in a private agreement with one another already committed themselves. At the first hint of Blair's Mexican project, however, Mr. Lincoln firmly disclaimed any responsibility for the suggestion or any intention of adopting it, and during the four hours' talk led the conversation continually back to the original object of the conference. But though he patiently answered the many questions addressed him by the commissioners, as to what would probably be done on various important subjects that must arise at once if the Confederate States consented, carefully discriminating in his answers between what he was authorized under the Constitution to do as executive, and what would devolve upon coordinate branches of the government, the interview came to nothing. The commissioners returned to Richmond in great disappointment and communicated the failure of their efforts to Jefferson Davis, whose chagrin was equal to their own. They had all caught eagerly at the hope that this negotiation would somehow extricate them from the dilemmas and dangers of their situation. Davis took the only course open to him after refusing the honorable peace Mr. Lincoln had tendered. He transmitted the commissioner's report to the rebel Congress, with a brief and dry message stating that the enemy refused any terms except those the conqueror might grant, and then arranged as vigorous an effort as circumstances permitted once more to fire the southern heart. A public meeting was called, where the speeches, judging from the meager reports printed, were as denunciatory and bellicose as the bitterest Confederate could desire. Davis particularly is represented to have excelled himself in defiant heroics. Sooner than we should ever be united again, he said, he would be willing to yield up everything he had on earth, if it were possible, he would sacrifice a thousand lives. And he further announced his confidence that they would yet compel the Yankees in less than twelve months to petition us for peace on our own terms. This extravagant rhetoric would seem merely grotesque, were it not embittered by the reflection that it was the signal which carried many additional thousands of brave soldiers to death, in continuing a palpably hopeless military struggle. End of chapter 33Chapter 34 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. By John G. Nicolay. Chapter 34 Blair Chase, Chief Justice Speed succeeds Bates. McCullough succeeds Fessenden. Resignation of Mr. Usher. Lincoln's offer of four hundred million dollars. The second inaugural. Lincoln's literary rank. His last speech. The principal concession in the Baltimore platform made by the friends of the administration to their opponents, the radicals, was the resolution which called for harmony in the cabinet. The president at first took no notice, either publicly or privately, of this resolution, which was in effect a recommendation that he dismiss those members of his council who were stigmatized as conservatives and the first cabinet change which actually took place after the adjournment of the convention filled the radical body of his supporters with dismay, since they had looked upon Mr. Chase as their special representative in government. The publication of the Wade Davis Manifesto still further increased their restlessness and brought upon Mr. Lincoln a powerful pressure from every quarter to satisfy radical demands by dismissing Montgomery Blair, his postmaster general. Mr. Blair had been one of the founders of the Republican Party, 
and in the very forefront of opposition to slavery extension, but had gradually attracted to himself the hostility of all the radical Republicans in the country. The immediate cause of this estrangement was the bitter quarrel that developed between his family and General Fremont in Missouri, a quarrel in which the Blairs were undoubtedly right in the beginning, but which broadened and extended until it landed them finally in the Democratic Party. The President considered the dispute one of form rather than substance, and having a deep regard not only for the Postmaster General but for his brother, General Frank Blair, and for his distinguished father, was most reluctant to take action against him. Even in the bosom of government, however, a strong hostility to Mr. Blair manifested itself. As long as Chase remained in the cabinet, there was a smoldering hostility between them, and his attitude toward Seward and Stanton was one of increasing enmity. General Halleck, incensed at some caustic remarks Blair was reported to have made about the defenders of the Capitol after Early's raid, during which the family estate near Washington had suffered, sent an angry note to the War Department, wishing to know if such wholesale denouncement had the President's sanction, adding that either the names of the officers accused should be stricken from the rolls, or the slanderer dismissed from the Cabinet. Mr. Stanton sent the letter to the President without comment. This was too much, and the Secretary received an answer on the very same day, written in Mr. Lincoln's most masterful manner. Whether the remarks were really made I do not know, nor do I suppose such knowledge is necessary to a correct response. If they were made, I do not approve them. And yet, under the circumstances, I would not dismiss a member of the cabinet, therefore. I do not consider what may have been hastily said in a moment of vexation at so severe a loss is sufficient ground for so grave a step. I propose continuing to be myself the judge as to when a member of the cabinet shall be dismissed. Not content with this, the President, when the cabinet came together, read them this impressive little lecture. I must myself be the judge how long to retain in and when to remove any of you from his position. It would greatly pain me to discover any of you endeavoring to procure another's removal, or in any way to prejudice him before the public. Such endeavor would be a wrong to me, and, much worse, a wrong to the country. My wish is that on this subject no remark be made nor question asked by any of you, here or elsewhere, now or hereafter. This is one of the most remarkable speeches ever made by a president. The tone of authority is unmistakable. Washington was never more dignified. Jackson was never more peremptory. The feeling against Mr. Blair and the pressure upon the president for his removal increased throughout the summer. All through the period of gloom and discouragement, he refused to act, even when he believed the verdict of the country likely to go against him, and was assured on every side that such a concession to the radical spirit might be greatly to his advantage. But after the turn had come and the prospective triumph of the Union cause became evident, he felt that he ought no longer to retain in his cabinet a member who, whatever his personal merits, had lost the confidence of the great body of Republicans, and on September 9 wrote a kindly note requesting his resignation. Mr. Blair accepted his dismissal in a manner to be expected from his manly and generous character, not pretending to be pleased, but assuming that the President had good reason for his action. And on turning over his office to his successor, ex-Governor William Dennison of Ohio, went at once to Maryland and entered into the campaign, working heartily for Mr. Lincoln's re-election. After the death of Judge Taney in October, Mr. Blair for a while indulged the hope that he might be appointed Chief Justice, a position for which his natural abilities and legal acquirements eminently fitted him. But Mr. Chase was chosen, to the bitter disappointment of Mr. Blair's family, though even this did not shake their steadfast loyalty to the Union cause or their personal friendship for the President. Immediately after his second inauguration, 
Mr. Lincoln offered Montgomery Blair his choice of the Spanish or Austrian mission, an offer which he peremptorily, though respectfully, declined. The appointment of Mr. Chase as Chief Justice had probably been decided on in Mr. Lincoln's own mind from the first, though he gave no public intimation of his decision before sending the nomination to the Senate on December 6. Mr. Chase's partisans claimed that the President had already virtually promised him the place. His opponents counted upon the ex-secretary's attitude of criticism to work against his appointment. But Mr. Lincoln sternly checked all presentations of this personal argument, nor were the prayers of those who urged him to overlook the harsh and indecorous things Mr. Chase had said of him at all necessary. To one who spoke in this latter strain, the President replied, Oh, as to that I care nothing. Of Mr. Chase's ability, and of his soundness on the general issues of the war, there is, of course, no question. I have only one doubt about his appointment. He is a man of unbounded ambition, and has been working all his life to become president. That he never can be. And I fear that if I make him chief justice, he will simply become more restless and uneasy, and neglect the place in his strife and intrigue to make himself president. If I were sure that he would go on the bench and give up his aspirations, and do nothing but make himself a great judge, I would not hesitate a moment. He wrote out Mr. Chase's nomination with his own hand, and sent it to the Senate the day after Congress came together. It was confirmed at once without reference to a committee, and Mr. Chase, on learning of his new dignity, sent the President a cordial note, thanking him for the manner of his appointment, and adding, I prize your confidence and goodwill more than any nomination to office. But Mr. Lincoln's fears were better founded than his hopes. Though Mr. Chase took his place on the bench with a conscientious desire to do his whole duty in his great office, he could not dismiss the political affairs of the country from his mind, and still considered himself called upon to counteract the mischievous tendencies of the President toward conciliation and hasty reconstruction. The reorganization of the cabinet went on by gradual disintegration rather than any brusque or even voluntary action on the part of Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Bates, the attorney general, growing weary of the labors of his official position, resigned toward the end of November. Mr. Lincoln, on whom the claim of localities always had great weight, unable to decide upon another Missourian fitted for the place, offered it to Joseph Holt of Kentucky, who declined and then to James Speed, also a Kentuckian of high professional and social standing, the brother of his early friend Joshua F. Speed. Soon after the opening of the new year, Mr. Fessenden, having been again elected to the Senate from Maine, resigned his office as Secretary of the Treasury. The place thus vacated instantly excited a wide and spirited competition of recommendations. The President wished to appoint Governor Morgan of New York, who declined, and the choice finally fell upon Hugh McCullough of Indiana, who had made a favorable record as Comptroller of the Currency. Thus, only two of Mr. Lincoln's original cabinet, Mr. Seward and Mr. Wells, were in office at the date of his second inauguration, and still another change was in contemplation. Mr. Usher of Indiana, who had for some time discharged the duties of Secretary of the Interior, desiring, as he said, to relieve the President from any possible embarrassment which might arise from the fact that two of his cabinet were from the same state, sent in his resignation, which Mr. Lincoln endorsed, to take effect May 15, 1865. The tragic events of the future were mercifully hidden. Mr. Lincoln, looking forward to four years more of personal leadership, was planning yet another generous offer to shorten the period of conflict. His talk with the commissioners at Hampton Roads had probably revealed to him the undercurrent of their hopelessness and anxiety, and he had told them that personally he would be in favor of the government paying a liberal indemnity for the loss of slave property on absolute cessation of the war and the voluntary abolition of slavery by the southern states. 
This was indeed going to the extreme of magnanimity, but Mr. Lincoln remembered that the rebels, notwithstanding all their offenses and errors, were yet American citizens, members of the same nation, brothers of the same blood. He remembered, too, that the object of the war, equally with peace and freedom, was the maintenance of one government and the perpetuation of one union. Not only must hostility cease, but dissension, suspicion, and estrangement be eradicated. Filled with such thoughts and purposes, he spent the day after his return from Hampton Roads in considering and perfecting a new proposal, designed as a peace offering to the states in rebellion. On the evening of February 5, 1865, he called his cabinet together and read to them the draft of a joint resolution and proclamation embodying this idea, offering the southern states $400 million, or a sum equal to the cost of the war for 200 days, on condition that hostilities cease by the 1st of April, 1865, to be paid in 6% government bonds pro rata on their slave populations as shown by the census of 1860, one half on April 1, the other half only upon condition that the 13th Amendment be ratified by a requisite number of states before July 1, 1865. It turned out that he was more humane and liberal than his constitutional advisers. The endorsement in his own handwriting on the manuscript draft records the result of his appeal and suggestion. February 5, 1865. Today, these papers, which explain themselves, were drawn up and submitted to the cabinet, and unanimously disapproved by them. A. Lincoln. With the words, You are all opposed to me, sadly uttered, the President folded up the paper and ceased the discussion. The formal inauguration of Mr. Lincoln for his second presidential term took place at the appointed time, March 4, 1865. There is little variation in the simple but impressive pageantry with which the official ceremony is celebrated. The principal novelty commented upon by the newspapers was the share which the hitherto enslaved race had for the first time in this public and political drama. Civic associations of Negro citizens joined in the procession, and a battalion of Negro soldiers formed part of the military escort. The weather was sufficiently favorable to allow the ceremonies to take place on the eastern portico of the capital, in view of a vast throng of spectators. The central act of the occasion was President Lincoln's second inaugural address, which enriched the political literature of the Union with another masterpiece, and deserves to be quoted in full. He said, Fellow countrymen, At this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first. Then a statement, somewhat in detail, of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper. Now at the expiration of four years, during which public declarations have been constantly called forth on every point and phase of the great contest, which still absorbs the attention and engrosses the energies of the nation, little that is new could be presented. The progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself. And it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, 
but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was, somehow, the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union, even by war. While the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with, or even before, the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph, and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible, and prayed to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not, that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said three thousand years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. The address being concluded, Chief Justice Chase administered the oath of office, and listeners who heard Abraham Lincoln for the second time repeat, I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, went from the impressive scene to their several homes with thankfulness and with confidence that the destiny of the country and the liberty of the citizen were in safe keeping. The Fiery Trial through which he had hitherto walked, showed him possessed of the capacity, the courage, and the will to keep the promise of his oath. Among the many criticisms passed by writers and thinkers upon the second inaugural, none will so interest the reader as that of Mr. Lincoln himself, written about ten days after its delivery, in the following letter to a friend. Dear Mr. Weed, Every one likes a compliment. Thank you for yours on my little notification speech and on the recent inaugural address. I expect the latter to wear as well, perhaps better than, anything I have produced. But I believe it is not immediately popular, 
men are not flattered by being shown that there has been a difference of purpose between the Almighty and them. To deny it, however, in this case, is to deny that there is a God governing the world. It is a truth which I thought needed to be told, and, as whatever of humiliation there is in it falls most directly on myself, I thought others might afford for me to tell it. Nothing would have more amazed Mr. Lincoln than to hear himself called a man of letters, but this age has produced few greater writers. Emerson ranks him with Aesop. Montalembert commends his style as a model for the imitation of princes. It is true that in his writings the range of subjects is not great. He was chiefly concerned with the political problems of the time and the moral considerations involved in them. But the range of treatment is remarkably wide, running from the wit, the gay humor, the florid eloquence of his stump speeches, to the marvelous sententiousness and brevity of the address at Gettysburg, and the sustained and lofty grandeur of his second inaugural. While many of his phrases have already passed into the daily speech of mankind, a careful student of Mr. Lincoln's character will find this inaugural address instinct with another meaning, which, very naturally, the President's own comment did not touch. The eternal law of compensation, which it declares and applies to the sin and fall of American slavery, in a diction rivaling the fire and dignity of the old Hebrew prophecies, may, without violent inference, be interpreted to foreshadow an intention to renew at a fitting moment the brotherly goodwill gift to the South which has already been treated of. Such an inference finds strong corroboration in the sentences which close the last public address he ever made. On Tuesday evening, April 11, a considerable assemblage of citizens of Washington gathered at the executive mansion to celebrate the victory of Grant over Lee. The rather long and careful speech which Mr. Lincoln made on that occasion was, however, less about the past than the future. It discussed the subject of Reconstruction as illustrated in the case of Louisiana, showing also how that issue was related to the questions of emancipation, the condition of the freedmen, the welfare of the South, and the ratification of the constitutional amendment. So new and unprecedented is the whole case, he concluded, that no exclusive and inflexible plan can safely be prescribed as to details and collaterals. Such exclusive and inflexible plan would surely become a new entanglement. Important principles may and must be inflexible. In the present situation, as the phrase goes, it may be my duty to make some new announcement to the people of the South. I am considering, and shall not fail to act when satisfied that action will be proper. Can anyone doubt that this new announcement which was taking shape in his mind would again have embraced and combined justice to the blacks and generosity to the whites of the South with union and liberty for the whole country? End of chapter 34。Chapter 35 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay, Chapter 35 Description of Confederate Currency Rigor of Conscription Dissatisfaction with the Confederate Government Lee, General-in-Chief J. E. Johnston reappointed to oppose Sherman's March Value of Slave Property Gone in Richmond Davis's Recommendation of Emancipation Benjamin's last dispatch to Slidell. Condition of the army when Lee took command. Lee attempts negotiations with Grant. Lincoln's directions. Lee and Davis agree upon line of retreat. Assault on Fort Stedman. Five Forks. 
Evacuation of Petersburg. Surrender of Richmond. Pursuit of Lee. Surrender of Lee. Burning of Richmond. Lincoln in Richmond. From the hour of Mr. Lincoln's re-election, the Confederate cause was doomed. The cheering of the troops which greeted the news from the north was heard within the lines at Richmond and at Petersburg, and although the leaders maintained their attitude of defiance, the impression rapidly gained ground among the people that the end was not far off. The stimulus of hope being gone, they began to feel the pinch of increasing want. Their currency had become almost worthless. In October, a dollar in gold was worth thirty-five dollars in Confederate money. With the opening of the new year, the price rose to sixty dollars, and despite the efforts of the Confederate Treasury, which would occasionally rush into the market and beat down the price of gold ten or twenty per cent a day, the currency gradually depreciated until a hundred for one was offered and not taken. It was natural for the citizens of Richmond to think that monstrous prices were being extorted for food, clothing, and supplies, when in fact they were paying no more than was reasonable. To pay a thousand dollars for a barrel of flour was enough to strike a householder with terror, but ten dollars is not a famine price. High prices, however, even if paid in dry leaves, are a hardship when dry leaves are not plentiful and there was scarcity even of Confederate money in the South. At every advance of Grant's lines a new alarm was manifested in Richmond, the first proof of which was always of fresh rigor in enforcing the conscription laws and the arbitrary orders of the frightened authorities. After the capture of Fort Harrison, north of the James, squads of guards were sent into the streets with directions to arrest every able-bodied man they met. It is said that the medical boards were ordered to exempt no one capable of bearing arms for ten days. Human nature will not endure such a strain as this, and desertion grew too common to punish. As disaster increased, the Confederate government steadily lost ground in the confidence and respect of the Southern people. Mr. Davis and his counselors were doing their best, but they no longer got any credit for it. From every part of the Confederacy came complaints of what was done, demands for what was impossible to do. Some of the states were in a condition near to counter-revolution. A slow paralysis was benumbing the limbs of the insurrection, and even at the heart its vitality was plainly declining. The Confederate Congress, which had hitherto been the mere register of the President's will, now turned upon him. On January 19 it passed a resolution making Lee general-in-chief of the army. This Mr. Davis might have borne with patience, although it was intended as a notification that his meddling with military affairs must come to an end. But far worse was the bitter necessity put upon him, as a sequel to this act, of reappointing General Joseph E. Johnston to the command of the army which was to resist Sherman's victorious march to the north. Mr. Seddon, rebel secretary of war, thinking his honor impugned by a vote of the Virginia delegation in Congress, resigned. Warnings of serious demoralization came daily from the army, and disaffection was so rife in official circles in Richmond that it was not thought politic to call public attention to it by measures of repression. It is curious and instructive to note how the act of emancipation had by this time virtually enforced itself in Richmond. The value of slave property was gone. It is true that a slave was still occasionally sold at a price less than one-tenth of what he would have brought before the war, but servants could be hired of their nominal owners for almost nothing, merely enough to keep up a show of vassalage. In effect, anyone could hire a negro for his keeping, which was all that anybody in Richmond, black or white, got for his work. Even Mr. Davis had at least become docile to the stern teaching of events. In his message of November, he had recommended the employment of forty thousand slaves in the army, not as soldiers, it is true, save in the last extremity, with emancipation to come. 
On December 27, Mr. Benjamin wrote his last important instruction to John Slidell, the Confederate commissioner in Europe. It is nothing less than a cry of despair. Complaining bitterly of the attitude of foreign nations while the South is fighting the battles of England and France against the North, he asks, quote, are they determined never to recognize the Southern Confederacy until the United States assent to such action on their part? End of quote. And with a frantic offer to submit to any terms which Europe might impose as the price of recognition, and a scarcely veiled threat of making peace with the North unless Europe should act speedily, the Confederate Department of State closed its four years of fruitless activity. Lee assumed command of all the Confederate armies on February 9. His situation was one of unprecedented gloom. The day before he had reported that his troops, who had been in line of battle for two days at Hatcher's Run, exposed to the bad winter weather, had been without meat for three days. A prodigious effort was made, and the danger of starvation, for the moment, averted, but no permanent improvement resulted. The armies of the Union were closing in from every point of the compass. Grant was every day pushing his formidable left wing nearer the only roads by which Lee could escape. Thomas was threatening the Confederate communications from Tennessee. Sheridan was riding for the last time up the Shenandoah Valley to abolish Early, while from the south the redoubtable columns of Sherman were moving northward with the steady pace and irresistible progress of a tragic fate. A singular and significant attempt at negotiation was made at this time by General Lee. He was so strong in the confidence of the people of the South, and the government at Richmond was so rapidly becoming discredited, that he could doubtless have obtained the popular support and compelled the assent of the executive to any measures he thought proper for the attainment of peace. From this it was easy for him and for others to come to the wholly erroneous conclusion that General Grant held a similar relation to the government and people of the United States. General Lee seized upon the pretext of a conversation reported to him by General Longstreet as having been held with General E. O. C. Ord under an ordinary flag of truce for the exchange of prisoners, to address a letter to Grant sanctioned by Mr. Davis, saying he had been informed that General Ord had said General Grant would not decline an interview with a view, quote, to a satisfactory adjustment of the present unhappy difficulties by means of a military convention, end of quote, provided Lee had authority to act. He therefore proposed to meet General Grant with the hope that, it may be found practicable to submit the subjects of controversy to a convention of the kind mentioned, professing himself authorized to do whatever the result of the proposed interview may render necessary. Grant at once telegraphed these overtures to Washington. Stanton received the despatch at the Capitol, where the President was, according to his custom, passing the last night of the session of Congress, for the convenience of signing bills. The secretary handed the telegram to Mr. Lincoln, who read it in silence. He asked no advice or suggestion from anyone about him, but, taking up a pen, wrote with his usual slowness and precision a despatch in Stanton's name, which he showed to Seward, and then handed to Stanton to be signed and sent. The language is that of an experienced ruler, perfectly sure of himself, and of his duty. Quote, the President directs me to say that he wishes you to have no conference with General Lee, unless it be for capitulation of General Lee's army, or on some minor or purely military matter. He instructs me to say that you are not to decide, discuss, or confer upon any political questions. Such questions the President holds in his own hands, and will submit them to no military conferences or conventions. Meanwhile, you are to press to the utmost your military advantages. End of quote. 
Grant answered Lee that he had no authority to accede to his proposition, and explained that General Ord's language must have been misunderstood. This closed to the Confederate authorities the last avenue of hope of any compromise by which the alternative of utter defeat or unconditional surrender might be avoided. Early in March, General Lee visited Richmond for conference with Mr. Davis on the measures to be adopted in the crisis which he saw was imminent. He had never sympathized with the slight Congress had intended to put upon Mr. Davis when it gave him supreme military authority, and continued to the end to treat his president as commander-in-chief of the forces. There is direct contradiction between Mr. Davis and General Lee as to how Davis received this statement of the necessities of the situation. Mr. Davis says he suggested immediate withdrawal from Richmond, but that Lee said his horses were too weak for the roads in their present condition, and that he must wait. General Lee, on the other hand, is quoted as saying that he wished to retire behind the Staunton River, from which point he might have indefinitely protracted the war, but that the President overruled him. Both agreed, however, that sooner or later Richmond must be abandoned, and that the next move should be to Danville. But before he turned his back forever upon the lines he had so stoutly defended, Lee resolved to dash once more at the toils by which he was surrounded. He placed half his army under the command of General John B. Gordon, with orders to break through the Union lines at Fort Stedman and take possession of the high ground behind them. A month earlier Grant had foreseen some such move on Lee's part, and had ordered General Park to be prepared to meet an assault on his center, and to have his commanders ready to bring all their resources to bear on the point in danger, adding, quote, with proper alacrity in this respect, I would have no objection to seeing the enemy get through. End of quote. This characteristic phrase throws the strongest light both on Grant's temperament and on the mastery of his business at which he had arrived. Under such generalship, an army's lines are a trap into which entrance is suicide. The assault was made with great spirit at half past four on the morning of March 25. Its initial success was due to a singular cause. The spot chosen was a favorite point for deserters to pass into the Union lines, which they had of late been doing in large numbers. When Gordon's skirmishes, therefore, came stealing through the darkness, they were mistaken for an unusually large party of deserters, and they overpowered several picket posts without firing a shot. The storming party, following at once, took the trenches with a rush, and in a few minutes had possession of the main line on the right of the fort, and next, of the fort itself. It was hard in the semi-darkness to distinguish friends from foes, and for a time General Park was unable to make headway. But with the growing light his troops advanced from every direction to mend the breach, and, making short work of the Confederate detachments, recaptured the fort, opening a cross-fire of artillery so withering that few of the Confederates could get back to their own lines. This was, moreover, not the only damage the Confederates suffered. Humphreys and Wright, on the Union left, rightly assuming that Park could take care of himself, instantly searched the lines in their front to see if they had been essentially weakened to support Gordon's attack. They found they had not, but, in gaining this knowledge, captured the enemy's entrenched picket lines in front of them, which, being held, gave inestimable advantage to the Union army in the struggle of the next week. Grant's chief anxiety for some time had been lest Lee should abandon his lines, but, though burning to attack, he was delayed by the same bad roads which kept Lee in Richmond, and by another cause. He did not wish to move until Sheridan had completed the work assigned him in the Shenandoah Valley and joined either Sherman or the army at Petersburg. On March 24, however, at the very moment Gordon was making his plans for next day sortie, Grant issued his order for the great movement to the left which was to finish the war. He intended to begin on the 29th, 
but Lee's departure dash of the 25th convinced him that not a moment was to be lost. Sheridan reached City Point on the 26th. Sherman came up from North Carolina for a brief visit next day. The President was also there, and an interesting meeting took place between these famous brothers-in-arms and Mr. Lincoln. After which Sherman went back to Goldsboro, and Grant began pushing his army to the left with even more than his usual iron energy. It was a great army, the result of all the power and wisdom of the government, all the devotion of the people, all the intelligence and teachableness of the soldiers themselves, and all the ability which a mighty war had developed in the officers. In command of all was Grant, the most extraordinary military temperament this country has ever seen. The numbers of the respective armies in this last grapple have been the occasion of endless controversy. As nearly as can be ascertained, the grand total of all arms on the Union side was 124,700. On the Confederate side, 57,000. Grant's plan, as announced in his instructions of March 24, was at first to dispatch Sheridan to destroy the South Side and Danville Railroads, at the same time moving a heavy force to the left to ensure the success of this raid, and then to turn Lee's position. But his purpose developed from hour to hour, and before he had been away from his winter headquarters one day, he gave up this comparatively narrow scheme, and adopted the far bolder plan which he carried out to his immortal honor. He ordered Sheridan not to go after the railroads, but to push for the enemy's right rear, writing him, quote, I now feel like ending the matter. We will act all together as one army here, until it is seen what can be done with the enemy. End of quote. On the 30th, Sheridan advanced to Five Forks, where he found a heavy force of the enemy. Lee, justly alarmed by Grant's movements, had dispatched a sufficient detachment to hold that important crossroads, and taken personal command of the remainder on White Oak Ridge. A heavy rainstorm, beginning on the night of the 29th and continuing more than 24 hours, greatly impeded the march of the troops. On the 31st, Warren, working his way toward the White Oak Road, was attacked by Lee and driven back on the main line, but rallied, and in the afternoon drove the enemy again into his works. Sheridan, opposed by Pickett with a large force of infantry and cavalry, was also forced back, fighting obstinately as far as Dinwiddie Courthouse, from which point he hopefully reported his situation to Grant at dark. Grant, more disturbed than Sheridan himself, rained orders and suggestions all night to effect a concentration at daylight on that portion of the enemy in front of Sheridan. But Pickett, finding himself out of position, silently withdrew during the night, and resumed his strongly entrenched post at Five Forks. Here Sheridan followed him on April 1, and repeated the successful tactics of his Shenandoah Valley exploits so brilliantly that Lee's right was entirely shattered. This battle of Five Forks should have ended the war. Lee's right was routed. His line had been stretched westward until it broke. There was no longer any hope of saving Richmond or even of materially delaying its fall. But Lee apparently thought that even the gain of a day was of value to the Richmond government, and what was left of his army of northern Virginia was still so perfect in discipline that it answered with unabated spirit every demand made upon it. Grant, who feared Lee might get away from Petersburg and overwhelm Sheridan on the White Oak Road, directed that an assault be made all along the line at four o'clock in the morning of the second. His officers responded with enthusiasm, and Lee, far from dreaming of attacking anyone after the stunning blow he had received the day before, made what hasty preparations he could to resist them. It is painful to record the hard fighting which followed. Wright, in his assault in front of Forts Fisher and Walsh, lost eleven hundred men in fifteen minutes of murderous conflict that made them his own and other commands fared scarcely better, 
Union and Confederate troops alike displaying a gallantry distressing to contemplate when one reflects that, the war being already decided, all this heroic blood was shed in vain. The Confederates, from the Appomattox to the Weldon Road, fell slowly back to their inner line of works, and Lee, watching the formidable advance before which his weakened troops gave way, sent a message to Richmond announcing his purpose of concentrating on the Danville Road, and made preparations for the evacuation, which was now the only resort left him. Some Confederate writers expressed surprise that General Grant did not attack and destroy his Lee army on April 2, but this is a view, after the fact, easy to express. The troops on the Union left had been on foot for eighteen hours, had fought an important battle, marched and countermarched many miles, and were now confronted by Longstreet's fresh corps behind formidable works, while the attitude of the force under Gordon on the south side of the town was such as to require the close attention of Park. Grant, anticipating an early retirement of Lee from his citadel, wisely resolved to avoid the waste and bloodshed of an immediate assault on the inner lines of Petersburg. He ordered Sheridan to get upon Lee's line of retreat, sent Humphreys to strengthen him, then, directing a general bombardment for five o'clock next morning, and an assault at six, gave himself and his soldiers a little of the rest they had so richly earned, and so seriously needed. He had telegraphed during the day to President Lincoln, who was still at City Point, the news as it developed from hour to hour. Prisoners he regarded as so much net gain. He was weary of slaughter, and wanted the war ended with as little bloodshed as possible, and it was with delight that he summed up on Sunday afternoon, quote, The whole captures, since the army started out gunning, will not amount to less than twelve thousand men, and probably fifty pieces of artillery. End of quote. Lee bent all his energies to saving his army and leading it out of its untenable position on the James to a point from which he could effect a junction with Johnston in North Carolina. The place selected for this purpose was Burkeville, at the crossing of the South Side and Danville Roads, fifty miles southwest of Richmond, whence a short distance would bring him to Danville, where the desired junction could be made. Even yet he was able to cradle himself in the illusion that it was only a campaign that had failed, and that he might continue the war indefinitely in another field. At nightfall all his preparations were completed, and dismounting at the mouth of the road, leading to Amelia Court House, the first point of rendezvous, where he had directed supplies to be sent, he watched his troops file noiselessly by in the darkness. By three o'clock the town was abandoned. At half-past four it was formally surrendered. Meade, reporting the news to Grant, received orders to march his army immediately up the Appomattox, and, divining Lee's intentions, Grant also sent word to Sheridan to push with all speed to the Danville Road. Thus flight and pursuit began almost at the same moment. The swift-footed army of northern Virginia was racing for its life, and Grant, inspired with more than his habitual tenacity and energy, not only pressed his enemy in the rear, but hung upon his flank, and strained every nerve to get in his front. He did not even allow himself the pleasure of entering Richmond, which surrendered to Weitzel early on the morning of the third. All that day Lee pushed forward toward Amelia Courthouse. There was little fighting except among the cavalry. A terrible disappointment awaited Lee on his arrival at Amelia Courthouse on the fourth. He had ordered supplies to be forwarded there, but his half-starved troops found no food awaiting them and nearly twenty-four hours were lost in collecting subsistence for men and horses. When he started again on the night of the fifth, the whole pursuing force was south and stretching out to the west of him. Burkeville was in Grant's possession. The way to Danville was barred. The supply of provisions to the south cut off. He was compelled to change his route to the west, and started for Lynchburg, which he was destined never to reach.
It had been the intention to attack Lee at Amelia Court House on the morning of April 6, but, learning of his turn to the west, Meade, who was immediately in pursuit, quickly faced his army about and followed. A running fight ensued for fourteen miles, the enemy, with remarkable quickness and dexterity, halting and partly entrenching themselves from time to time, and the national forces driving them out of every position. The Union cavalry, meanwhile, harassing the moving left flank of the Confederates and working havoc on the trains. They also caused a grievous loss to history by burning Lee's headquarters baggage with all its wealth of returns and reports. At Sailor's Creek, a rivulet running north into the Appomattox, Ewell's corps was brought to bay and important fighting occurred. The days lost to Lee, there and elsewhere, amounting to eight thousand in all, with several of his generals among the prisoners. This day's work was of incalculable value to the national arms. Sheridan's unerring eye appreciated the full importance of it, his hasty report ending with the words, quote, If the thing is pressed, I think that Lee will surrender. End of quote. Grant sent the despatch to President Lincoln, who instantly replied, Let the thing be pressed. In fact, after nightfall of the 6th, Lee's army could only flutter like a wounded bird with one wing shattered. There was no longer any possibility of escape. But Lee found it hard to relinquish the illusion of years, and as soon as night came down, he again began his weary march westward. A slight success on the next day once more raised his hopes, but his optimism was not shared by his subordinates and a number of his principal officers, selecting General Pendleton as their spokesman, made known to him on the 7th their belief that further resistance was useless and advised surrender. Lee told them that they had yet too many men to think of laying down their arms, but in answer to a courteous summons from Grant sent that same day, inquired what terms he would be willing to offer. Without waiting for a reply, he again put his men in motion, and during all of the 8th the chase and pursuit continued through a part of Virginia green with spring, and until then unvisited by hostile armies. Sheridan, by unheard-of exertions, at last accomplished the important task of placing himself squarely on Lee's line of retreat. About sunset of the 8th, his advance captured Appomattox Station and four trains of provisions. Shortly after, a reconnaissance revealed the fact that Lee's entire army was coming up the road. Though he had nothing but cavalry, Sheridan resolved to hold the inestimable advantage he had gained, and sent a request to Grant to hurry up the required infantry support, saying that if it reached him that night they, quote, might perhaps finish the job in the morning. End of quote. He ended with singular prescience, referring to the negotiations which had been opened. Quote, I do not think Lee means to surrender until compelled to do so. End of quote. This was strictly true. When Grant replied to Lee's question about terms, saying that the only condition he insisted upon was that the officers and men surrendered should be disqualified from taking up arms again until properly exchanged, Lee disclaimed any intention to surrender his army, but proposed to meet Grant to discuss the restoration of peace. It appears from his own report that even on the night of the 8th he had no intention of giving up the fight. He expected to find only cavalry before him next morning, and thought his remnant of infantry could break through while he himself was amusing Grant with platonic discussions in the rear. But on arriving at the rendezvous he had suggested, he received Grant's courteous but decided refusal to enter into a political negotiation, and also the news that a formidable force of infantry barred the way and covered the adjacent hills and valley. The marching of the Confederate army was over forever, and Lee, suddenly brought to a sense of his real situation, sent orders to cease hostilities, and wrote another note to Grant, asking an interview for the purpose of surrendering his army. The meeting took place at the house of Wilmer McLean, in the edge of the village of Appomattox, on April 9, 1865. 
Lee met Grant at the threshold and ushered him into a small and barely furnished parlor, where were soon assembled the leading officers of the National Army. General Lee was accompanied only by his secretary, Colonel Charles Marshall. A short conversation led up to a request from Lee for the terms on which the surrender of his army would be received. Grant briefly stated them, and then wrote them out. Men and officers were to be paroled, and the arms, artillery, and public property turned over to the officer appointed to receive them. This, he added, will not embrace the side-arms of the officers, nor their private horses or baggage. This done, each officer and man will be allowed to return to their homes, not to be disturbed by United States authority so long as they observe their parole and the laws in force where they may reside. General Grant says in his memoirs that up to the moment when he put pen to paper he had not thought of a word that he should write. The terms he had verbally proposed were soon put in writing, and there he might have stopped. But as he wrote, a feeling of sympathy for his gallant antagonist came over him, and he added the extremely liberal terms with which his letter closed. The sight of Lee's fine sword suggested the paragraph allowing officers to retain their sidearms, and he ended with a phrase he evidently had not thought of, and for which he had no authority, which practically pardoned and amnestied every man in Lee's army a thing he had refused to consider the day before, and which had been expressly forbidden him in the President's order of March 3. Yet so great was the joy over the crowning victory, and so deep the gratitude of the government and people to Grant and his heroic army, that his terms were accepted as he wrote them, and his exercise of the executive prerogative of pardon entirely overlooked. It must be noticed here, however, that a few days later it led the greatest of Grant's generals into a serious error. Lee must have read the memorandum with as much surprise as gratification. He suggested and gained another important concession, that those of the cavalry and artillery who owned their own horses should be allowed to take them home to put in their crops, and wrote a brief reply accepting the terms. He then remarked that his army was in a starving condition, and asked Grant to provide them with subsistence and forage, to which he at once assented, inquiring for how many men the rations would be wanted. Lee answered, about twenty-five thousand, and orders were given to issue them. The number turned out to be even greater, the paroles signed amounting to twenty-eight thousand two hundred and thirty-one. If we add to this the captures made during the preceding week, and the thousands who deserted the failing cause at every by-road leading to their homes, we see how considerable an army Lee commanded when Grant started out gunning. With these brief and simple formalities, one of the most momentous transactions of modern times was concluded. The Union gunners prepared to fire a national salute, but Grant forbade any rejoicing over a fallen enemy who he hoped would be an enemy no longer. The next day he rode to the Confederate lines to make a visit of farewell to General Lee. They parted with courteous good wishes, and Grant, without pausing to look at the city he had taken, or the enormous system of works which had so long held him at bay, hurried away to Washington, intent only upon putting an end to the waste and burden of war. A very carnival of fire and destruction had attended the flight of the Confederate authorities from Richmond. On Sunday night, April 2, Jefferson Davis, with his cabinet and their more important papers, hurriedly left the doomed city on one of the crowded and overloaded railroad trains. The legislature of Virginia and the governor of the state departed in a canal boat toward Lynchburg, and every available vehicle was pressed into service by the frantic inhabitants, all anxious to get away before their capital was desecrated by the presence of Yankee invaders. By the time the military left, early next morning, a conflagration was already under way. The rebel Congress had passed a law ordering government tobacco and other public property to be burned. General Ewell, the military commander, asserts that he took the responsibility of disobeying the law and that they were not fired by his orders. 
However that may be, flames broke out in various parts of the city, while a miscellaneous mob, inflamed by excitement and by the alcohol which had run freely in the gutters the night before, rushed from store to store, smashing in the doors and indulging all the wantonness of pillage and greed. The public spirit was paralyzed, and the whole fabric of society seemed crumbling to pieces, when the convicts from the penitentiary, a shouting, leaping crowd of party-colored demons, overcoming their guard and drunk with liberty, appeared upon the streets, adding their final dramatic horror to the pandemonium. It is quite probable that the very magnitude and rapidity of the disaster served in a measure to mitigate its evil results. The burning of seven hundred buildings, comprising the entire business portion of Richmond warehouses, manufactories, mills, depots, and stores, all within the brief space of a day, was a visitation so sudden, so unexpected, so stupefying, as to overawe and terrorize even wrongdoers, and made the harvest of plunder so abundant as to serve to scatter the mob and satisfy its rapacity to quick repletion. Before a new hunger could arise, assistance was at hand. General Weitzel, to whom the city was surrendered, taking up his headquarters in the house lately occupied by Jefferson Davis, promptly set about the work of relief, organizing efficient resistance to the fire which, up to this time, seemed scarcely to have been attempted, issuing rations to the poor who had been relentlessly exposed to starvation by the action of the rebel Congress, and restoring order and personal authority. That a regiment of black soldiers assisted in this noble work, must have seemed to the white inhabitants of Richmond the final drop in their cup of misery. Into the capital, thus stricken and laid waste, came President Lincoln on the morning of April 4. Never in the history of the world did the head of a mighty nation and the conqueror of a great rebellion enter the captured chief city of the insurgents in such humbleness and simplicity. He had gone two weeks before to City Point for a visit to General Grant, and to his son, Captain Robert Lincoln, who was serving on Grant's staff. Making his home on the steamer which brought him, and enjoying what was probably the most satisfactory relaxation in which he had been able to indulge during his whole presidential service, he had visited the various camps of the great army in company with the general, cheered everywhere by the loving greetings of the soldiers. He had met Sherman when that commander hurried up fresh from his victorious march, and after Grant started on his final pursuit of Lee, the President still lingered, and it was at City Point that he received the news of the fall of Richmond. Between the receipt of this news and the following afternoon, but before any information of the great fire had reached them, a visit was arranged for the President and Rear Admiral Porter. Ample precautions were taken at the start. The President went in his own steamer, the River Queen, with her escort, the Bat, and a tug used at City Point in landing from the steamer. Admiral Porter went in his flagship, the Malvern, and a transport carried a small cavalry escort and ambulances for the party. But the obstructions in the river soon made it impossible to proceed in this fashion. One unforeseen accident after another rendered it necessary to leave behind even the smaller boats until finally the party went on in Admiral Porter's barge, rowed by twelve sailors, and without escort of any kind. In this manner, the President made his advent into Richmond, landing near Libby Prison. As the party stepped ashore, they found a guide among the contrabands who quickly crowded the streets, for the possible coming of the President had been circulated through the city. Ten of the sailors, armed with carbines, were formed as a guard, six in front and four in rear, and between them the President, Admiral Porter, and the three officers who accompanied them walked the long distance, perhaps a mile and a half, to the center of the town. The imagination can easily fill up the picture of a gradually increasing crowd, principally of Negroes, following the little group of Marines and officers, with the tall form of the President in its center and having learned that it was indeed Mr. Lincoln, giving expression to joy and gratitude in the picturesque emotional ejaculations of the colored race. 
It is easy also to imagine the sharp anxiety of those who had the President's safety in charge during this tiresome and even foolhardy march through a city still in flames, whose white inhabitants were sullenly resentful at best, and whose grief and anger might at any moment culminate against the man they looked upon as the incarnation of their misfortunes. But no accident befell him. Reaching General Weitzel's headquarters, Mr. Lincoln rested in the mansion Jefferson Davis had occupied as President of the Confederacy, and after a day of sightseeing, returned to his steamer and to Washington, to be stricken down by an assassin's bullet, literally, in the house of his friends. End of chapter 35. Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois. Chapter 36 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 36 Lincoln's Interviews with Campbell, Withdraws Authority for Meeting of Virginia Legislature, Conference of Davis and Johnston at Greensboro. Johnston asks for an armistice. Meeting of Sherman and Johnston. Their agreement. Rejected at Washington. Surrender of Johnston. Surrender of other Confederate forces. End of the Rebel Navy. Capture of Jefferson Davis. Surrender of E. Kirby Smith. Number of Confederates surrendered and exchanged. Reduction of Federal Army to a Peace Footing. Grand Review of the Army. While in Richmond, Mr. Lincoln had two interviews with John A. Campbell, rebel secretary of war, who had not accompanied the other fleeing officials, preferring instead to submit to federal authority. Mr. Campbell had been one of the commissioners at the Hampton Roads Conference, and Mr. Lincoln now gave him a written memorandum, repeating in substance the terms he had then offered the Confederates. On Campbell's suggestion that the Virginian legislature, if allowed to come together, would at once repeal its ordinance of secession and withdraw all Virginia troops from the field, he also gave permission for its members to assemble for that purpose. But this, being distorted into authority to sit in judgment on the political consequences of the war, was soon withdrawn. Jefferson Davis and his cabinet proceeded to Danville, where, two days after his arrival, the rebel president made still another effort to fire the southern heart, announcing, We have now entered upon a new phase of the struggle. Relieved from the necessity of guarding particular points, our army will be free to move from point to point to strike the enemy, in detail far from his base. Let us but will it, and we are free." and declaring in sonorous periods his purpose never to abandon one foot of ground to the invader. The ink was hardly dry on the document when news came of the surrender of Lee's army, and that the Federal cavalry was pushing southward west of Danville. So the Confederate government again hastily packed its archives and moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, where its headquarters were prudently kept on the train at the depot. Here Mr. Davis sent for Generals Johnston and Beauregard, and a conference took place between them and the members of the fleeing government, a conference not unmixed with embarrassment, since Mr. Davis still willed the success of the Confederacy too strongly to see the true hopelessness of the situation, while the generals and most of his cabinet were agreed that their cause was lost. The Council of War over— General Johnston returned to his army to begin negotiations with Sherman, and on the following day, April 14th, Davis and his party left Greensboro to continue their journey southward. Sherman had returned to Goldsboro from his visit to City Point, and set himself at once to the reorganization of his army and the replenishment of his stores. He still thought there was a hard campaign with desperate fighting ahead of him. Even on April 6th, when he received news of the fall of Richmond, 
and the flight of Lee and the Confederate government, he was unable to understand the full extent of the national triumph. He admired Grant so far as a man might, short of idolatry, yet the long habit of respect for Lee led him to think he would somehow get away and join Johnston in his front with at least a portion of the Army of Northern Virginia. He had already begun his march upon Johnston, when he learned of Lee's surrender at Appomattox. Definitely relieved from apprehension of a junction of the two Confederate armies, he now had no fear except of a flight and dispersal of Johnston's forces into guerrilla bands. If they ran away, he felt he could not catch them. The country was too open. They could scatter and meet again, and so continue a partisan warfare indefinitely. He could not be expected to know that this resolute enemy was sick to the heart of war, and that the desire for more fighting survived only in a group of fugitive politicians flying through the pine forest of the Carolinas from a danger which did not exist. Entering Raleigh on the morning of the 13th, he turned his heads of column southwest, hoping to cut off Johnston's southward march, but made no great haste, thinking Johnston's cavalry superior to his own and desiring Sheridan to join him before he pushed the Confederates to extremities. While here, however, he received a communication from General Johnston, dated the 13th, proposing an armistice to enable the National and Confederate governments to negotiate on equal terms. It had been dictated by Jefferson Davis during the conference at Greensboro, written down by S. R. Mallory, and merely signed by Johnston and was inadmissible and even offensive in its terms. But Sherman, anxious for peace, and himself incapable of discourtesy to a brave enemy, took no notice of its language, and answered so cordially that the Confederates were probably encouraged to ask for better conditions of surrender than they had expected to receive. The two great antagonists met on April 17th, when Sherman offered Johnston the same terms that had been accorded Lee and also communicated the news he had that morning received of the murder of Mr. Lincoln. The Confederate general expressed his unfeigned sorrow at this calamity, which smote the South, he said, as deeply as the North, and in this mood of sympathy the discussion began. Johnston asserted that he would not be justified in such a capitulation as Sherman proposed, but suggested that together they might arrange the terms of a permanent peace. This idea pleased Sherman, to whom the prospect of ending the war without shedding another drop of blood was so tempting that he did not sufficiently consider the limits of his authority in the matter. It can be said, moreover, in extenuation of his course, that President Lincoln's dispatch to Grant on March 3rd, which expressly forbade Grant to decide, discuss, or to confer upon any political question, had never been communicated to Sherman while the very liberality of Grant's terms led him to believe that he was acting in accordance with the views of the administration. But the wisdom of Lincoln's preemptory order was completely vindicated. With the best intentions in the world, Sherman, beginning very properly by offering his antagonist the same terms accorded Lee, ended, after two days' negotiation, by making a treaty of peace with the Confederate States, including a preliminary armistice, the disbandment of the Confederate armies, recognition by the United States executive of the several state governments, re-establishment of the federal courts, and a general amnesty. Not being fully empowered by our respective principles to fulfill these terms, the agreement truthfully concluded, we individually and officially pledge ourselves to promptly obtain the necessary authority. The rebel president, with unnecessary formality, required a report from General Breckinridge, his secretary of war, on the desirability of ratifying this most favorable convention. Scarcely had he given it his endorsement when news came that it had been disapproved at Washington, and that Sherman had been directed to continue his military operations, and the peripatetic government once more took up its southward flight. The moment General Grant read the agreement, he saw it was entirely inadmissible. The new president called his cabinet together, and Mr. Lincoln's instructions of March 3rd to Grant were repeated to Sherman, somewhat tardily, it must be confessed, 
as his rule of action. All this was a matter of course, and General Sherman could not properly, and perhaps would not, have objected to it. But the calm spirit of Lincoln was now absent from the councils of the government, and it was not in Andrew Johnson and Mr. Stanton to pass over a mistake like this, even in the case of one of the most illustrious captains of the age. They ordered Grant to proceed at once to Sherman's headquarters, and to direct operations against the enemy, and what was worse— Mr. Stanton printed in the newspapers the reasons of the government for disapproving the agreement in terms of sharpest censure of General Sherman. This, when it came to his notice some weeks later, filled him with hot indignation, and coupled with some orders, Halleck, who had been made commander of the armies of Potomac and the James, issued to Meade to disregard Sherman's truce and push forward against Johnston roused him to open defiance of the authorities he thought were persecuting him, and made him declare in a report to Grant that he would have maintained his truce at any cost of life. Halleck's order, however, had been nullified by Johnston's surrender, and Grant, suggesting that this outburst was uncalled for, offered Sherman the opportunity to correct the statement. This he refused, insisting that his record stand as written although avowing his readiness to obey all future orders of Grant and the President. So far as Johnston was concerned, the war was indeed over. He was unable to hold his men together. Eight thousand of them left their camps, and went home in the week of the truce, many riding away on the artillery horses and train mules. On notice of federal disapproval of his negotiations with Sherman, he disregarded Jefferson Davis's instructions to disband the infantry, and try to escape with the cavalry and light guns, and answered Sherman's summons by inviting another conference, at which, on April 26th, he surrendered all the forces in his command, on the same terms granted Lee at Appomattox. Sherman, supplying, as did Grant, rations for the beaten army. Thirty-seven thousand men and officers were paroled in North Carolina, exclusive, of course, of the thousands who had slipped away to their homes during the suspension of hostilities. After Appomattox, the rebellion fell to pieces all at once. Lee surrendered less than one-sixth of the Confederates in arms on April ninth. The armies that still remained, though inconsiderable when compared with the mighty host under the national colors, were yet infinitely larger than any Washington ever commanded and capable of strenuous resistance, and of incalculable mischief. But the march of Sherman from Atlanta to the sea, and his northward progress through the Carolinas, had predisposed the great interior region to make an end of strife, a tendency which was greatly promoted by the masterly raid of General J. H. Wilson's cavalry through Alabama, and his defeat of Forrest at Selma. An officer of Taylor's staff came to Canby's headquarters on April 19th to make arrangements for the surrender of all the Confederate forces east of the Mississippi, not already paroled by Sherman and Wilson, embracing some 42,000 men. The terms were agreed upon and signed on May 4th at the village of Citronelle in Alabama. At the same time and place, the Confederate Commodore Farrand surrendered the rear Admiral Thatcher all the naval forces of the Confederacy in the neighborhood of Mobile, a dozen vessels and some hundreds of officers. The rebel navy had practically ceased to exist some months before. The splendid fight in Mobile Bay on August 5, 1864, between Farragut's fleet and the rebel ram Tennessee, with her three attendant gunboats, and Cushing's daring destruction of the powerful Albemarle in Albemarle Sound on October 27, marked its end in Confederate waters. The duel between the Kearsarge and the Alabama off Cherbourg had already taken place. A few more encounters, at or near foreign ports, furnished occasion for personal bravery and subsequent lively diplomatic correspondence and rebel vessels, fitted out under the unduly lenient neutrality of France and England, continued for a time to work havoc with American shipping in various parts of the world. But these two Union successes, and the final capture of Fort Fisher and of Wilmington early in 1865, which closed the last haven for daring blockade-runners, practically silenced the Confederate Navy. 
General E. Kirby Smith commanded all the insurgent forces west of the Mississippi. On him the desperate hopes of Mr. Davis and his flying cabinet were fixed. After the successive surrenders of Lee and Johnston had left them no prospect in the east, they imagined they could move westward, gathering up stragglers as they fled, and crossing the river, joined Smith's forces, and there continued the war. But after a time even this hope failed them. Their escort melted away, members of the cabinet dropped off on various pretexts, and Mr. Davis, abandoning the attempt to reach the Mississippi River, turned again toward the east in an effort to gain the Florida coast and escape by means of a sailing vessel to Texas. The two expeditions sent in pursuit of him by General Wilson did not allow this consummation, which the government at Washington might possibly have viewed with equanimity. His camp near Irwinville, Georgia, was surrounded by Lieutenant Colonel Pritchard's command at dawn on May 10th, and he was captured as he was about to mount horse with a few companions and ride for the coast, leaving his family to follow more slowly. The tradition that he was captured in disguise, having donned female dress in a last desperate attempt to escape, has only this foundation, that Mrs. Davis threw a cloak over her husband's shoulders, and a shawl over his head, on the approach of the Federal soldiers. He was taken to Fortress Monroe, and there kept in confinement for about two years, was arraigned before the United States Circuit Court for the District of Virginia, for the crime of treason and released on bail, and was finally restored to all the duties and privileges of citizenship, except the right to hold office, by President Johnson's proclamation of amnesty of December twenty fifth, 1868. General E. Kirby Smith, on whom Davis's last hopes of success had centered, kept up so threatening an attitude that Sherman was sent from Washington to bring him to reason. But he did not long hold his position of solitary defiance. One more needless skirmish took place near Brazos, Texas, and then Smith followed the example of Taylor and surrendered his entire force, some 18,000, to General Canby on May 26th. 175,000 men in all were surrendered by the different Confederate commanders, and there were, in addition to these, about 90,000 prisoners in national custody during the year. One-third of these were exchanged, and two-thirds released. This was done as rapidly as possible, by successive orders of the War Department, beginning on May ninth and continuing through the summer. The first object of the government was to stop the waste of war. Recruiting ceased immediately after Lee's surrender, and measures were taken to reduce as promptly as possible the vast military establishment. Every chief of bureau was ordered, on April 28th, to proceed at once to the reduction of expenses in his department, to a peace footing, and this before Taylor or Smith had surrendered, and while Jefferson Davis was still at large. The army of a million men was brought down, with incredible ease and celerity, to one of twenty-five thousand. Before the great army melted away into the greater body of citizens, the soldiers enjoyed one final triumph, a march through the capital, undisturbed by death or danger, under the eyes of their highest commanders, military and civilian, and the representatives of the people whose nationality they had saved. Those who witnessed this solemn yet joyous pageant will never forget it, and will pray that their children may never witness anything like it. For two days this formidable host marched the long stretch of Pennsylvania Avenue, starting from the shadow of the dome of the Capitol, and filling that wide thoroughfare to Georgetown with a serried mass, moving with the easy yet rapid pace of veterans in cadence step. As a mere spectacle, this march of the mightiest host the continent has ever seen gathered together was grand and imposing but it was not as a spectacle alone that it affected the beholder most deeply. It was not a mere holiday parade. It was an army of citizens on their way home, after a long and terrible war. Their clothes were torn and pierced with bullets, their banners had been torn with shot and shell, and lashed in the winds of a thousand battles. The very drums and fifes had called out the troops to numberless night alarms, 
and sounded the onset on historic fields. The whole country claimed these heroes as a part of themselves, and now, done with fighting, they were going joyously and peaceably to their homes, to take up again the tasks they had willingly laid down in the hour of their country's peril. The world had many lessons to learn from this great conflict, which liberated a subject people and changed the tactics of modern warfare. But the greatest lesson it taught the nations of waiting Europe was the conservative power of democracy, that a million men, flushed with victory, and with arms in their hands, could be trusted to disband the moment the need for their services was over, and take up again the sober labors of peace. Friends loaded these veterans with flowers as they swung down the avenue, both men and officers, until some were fairly hidden under the fragrant burden. There was laughter and applause. Grotesque figures were not absent, as Sherman's legions passed, with their bummers and their regimental pets. But with all the shouting and the laughter and the joy of this unprecedented ceremony, there was one sad and dominant thought, which could not be driven from the minds of those who saw it, that of the men who were absent, and who had nevertheless richly earned the right to be there. The soldiers in their shrunken companies were conscious of the ever-present memories of the brave comrades who had fallen by the way, and in the whole army there was the passionate and unavailing regret for their wise, gentle, and powerful friend, Abraham Lincoln, gone forever from the house by the avenue, who had called the great host into being, directed the course of the nation during the four years they had been fighting for its preservation, and for whom, more than for any other, this crowning peaceful pageant would have been fraught with deep and happy meaning. End of chapter 36「Chapter thirty seven of a short life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan. A short life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter thirty seven. The fourteenth of April. Celebration at Fort Sumter. Last Cabinet Meeting. Lincoln's Attitude Toward Threats of Assassination. Booth's Plot. Ford's Theater. Fate of the Assassins. The Morning Pageant. Mr. Lincoln returned to Washington, refreshed by his visit to City Point, and cheered by the unmistakable signs that the war was almost over. With that ever-present sense of responsibility which distinguished him, he gave his thoughts to the momentous question of the restoration of the Union and harmony between the lately warring sections. His whole heart was now enlisted in the work of binding up the nation's wounds, and of doing all which might achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace. April 14 was a day of deep and tranquil happiness throughout the United States. It was Good Friday, observed by a portion of the people as an occasion of fasting and religious meditation. Though even among the most devout the great tidings of the preceding week exerted their joyous influence, and changed this period of traditional mourning into an occasion of general thanksgiving, but through the miserere's turned of themselves to te deums. The date was not to lose its awful significance in the calendar, at night it was claimed once more by a world-wide sorrow. The thanksgiving of the nation found its principal expression at Charleston Harbor, where the flag of the Union received that day a conspicuous reparation on the spot where it had first been outraged. At noon, General Robert Anderson raised over Fort Sumter the identical flag lowered and saluted by him four years before the surrender of Lee giving a more transcendent importance to the ceremony, made stately with orations, music, and military display. In Washington it was a day of deep peace and thankfulness. Grant had arrived that morning, and going to the executive mansion had met the cabinet, Friday being their regular day for assembling. He expressed some anxiety as to the news from Sherman, 
which he was expecting hourly. The President answered him in that singular vein of poetic mysticism which, though constantly held in check by his strong common sense, formed such a remarkable element in his character. He assured Grant that the news would come soon and come favorably, for he had last night had his usual dream which preceded great events. He seemed to be, he said, in a singular and indescribable vessel, but always the same, moving with great rapidity toward a dark and indefinite shore. He had had this dream before Antietam, Murfreesboro, Gettysburg, and Vicksburg. The cabinet were greatly impressed by this story, but Grant, most matter-of-fact of created beings, made the characteristic response that Murfreesboro was no victory and had no important results. The President did not argue this point with him, but repeated that Sherman would beat or had beaten Johnston, that his dream must relate to that, since he knew of no other important event likely at present to occur. Questions of trade between the states and of various phases of reconstruction occupied the cabinet on this last day of Lincoln's firm and tolerant rule. The president spoke at some length, disclosing his hope that much could be done to reanimate the states and get their governments in successful operation before Congress came together. He was anxious to close the period of strife without overmuch discussion. Particularly did he desire to avoid the shedding of blood or any vindictiveness of punishment. No one need expect that he would take any part in hanging or killing these men, even the worst of them. Enough lives have been sacrificed, he exclaimed. We must extinguish our resentments if we expect harmony and union. He did not wish the autonomy nor individuality of the states disturbed, and he closed the session by commending the whole subject to the most careful consideration of his advisers. It was, he said, the great question pending. They must now begin to act in the interest of peace. Such were the last words that Lincoln spoke to his cabinet. They dispersed with these sentences of clemency and good will in their ears, never again to meet under his wise and benignant chairmanship. He had told them that morning a strange story, which made some demand upon their faith, but the circumstances under which they were next to come together were beyond the scope of the wildest fancy. The day was one of unusual enjoyment to Mr. Lincoln. His son Robert had returned from the field with General Grant, and the President spent an hour with the young captain in delighted conversation over the campaign. He denied himself generally to the throng of visitors, admitting only a few friends. In the afternoon he went for a long drive with Mrs. Lincoln. His mood, as it had been all day, was singularly happy and tender. He talked much of the past and future. After four years of trouble and tumult, he looked forward to four years of comparative quiet and normal work. After that, he expected to go back to Illinois and practice law again. He was never simpler or gentle than on this day of unprecedented triumph. His heart overflowed with sentiments of gratitude to heaven, which took the shape, usual to generous natures, of love and kindness to all men. From the very beginning of his presidency, Mr. Lincoln had been constantly subject to the threats of his enemies. His mail was infested with brutal and vulgar menace, and warnings of all sorts came to him from zealous or nervous friends. Most of these communications received no notice. In cases where there seemed a ground for inquiry, it was made, as carefully as possible, by the President's private secretary or by the War Department, but always without substantial result. Warnings that appeared most definite when examined proved too vague and confused for further attention. The President was too intelligent not to know that he was in some danger. Madmen frequently made their way to the very door of the executive office, and sometimes into Mr. Lincoln's presence. But he had himself so sane a mind, and a heart so kindly, even to his enemies, that it was hard for him to believe in political hatred so deadly as to lead to murder. He knew, indeed, that incitements to murder him were not uncommon in the South, but as it is the habit of men constitutionally brave, he considered the possibilities of danger remote, and positively refused to torment himself with precautions for his own safety, summing the matter up by saying that both friends and strangers must have daily access to him, 
that his life was therefore in reach of any one, sane or mad, who was ready to murder and be hanged for it, and that he could not possibly guard against all danger unless he shut himself up in an iron box, in which condition he could scarcely perform the duties of a president. He therefore went in and out before the people, always unarmed, generally unattended. He received hundreds of visitors in a day, his breast bare to pistol or knife. He walked at midnight with a single secretary or alone from the executive mansion to the war department and back. He rode through the lonely roads of an uninhabited suburb from the White House to the soldier's home in the dusk of the evening and returned to his work in the morning before the town was astir. He was greatly annoyed when it was decided that there must be a guard at the executive mansion and that a squad of cavalry must accompany him on his daily drive but he was always reasonable and yielded to the best judgment of others. Four years of threats and boastings that were unfounded, and of plots that came to nothing, thus passed away. But precisely at the time when the triumph of the nation seemed assured, and a feeling of peace and security was diffused over the country, one of the conspiracies, apparently no more important than the others, ripened in the sudden heat of hatred and despair. A little band of malignant secessionists, consisting of John Wilkes Booth, an actor of a family of famous players, Lewis Powell, alias Payne, a disbanded rebel soldier from Florida, George Adzerat, formerly a coachmaker, but more recently a spy and blockade runner of the Potomac, David E. Harold, a young druggist's clerk, Samuel Arnold and Michael O'Laughlin, Maryland secessionists and Confederate soldiers, and John H. Surratt, had their ordinary rendezvous at the house of Mrs. Mary E. Surratt, the widowed mother of the last named, formerly a woman of some property in Maryland, but reduced by reverses to keeping a small boarding house in Washington. Booth was the leader of the little coterie. He was a young man of twenty-six, strikingly handsome, with that ease and grace of manner which came to him of right from his theatrical ancestors. He had played for several seasons with only indifferent success, his value as an actor lying rather in his romantic beauty of person than in any talent or industry he possessed. He was a fanatical successionist, and he had imbibed at Richmond and other southern cities where he played a furious spirit of partisanship against Lincoln and the Union Party. After the re-election of Mr. Lincoln, he visited Canada, consorted with the rebel emissaries there, and, whether or not at their instigation, cannot certainly be said, conceived a scheme to capture the President and take him to Richmond. He passed a great part of the autumn and winter pursuing this fantastic enterprise, seeming to be always well supplied with money, but the winter wore away and nothing was accomplished. On March 4, he was at the Capitol and created a disturbance by trying to force his way through the line of policemen who guarded the passage through which the President walked to the east front of the building. His intentions at this time are not known. He afterwards said he lost an excellent chance of killing the President that day. His ascendancy over his fellow conspirators seems to have been complete. After the surrender of Lee, in an access of malice and rage akin to madness he called them together and assigned each his part in the new crime which had risen in his mind out of the abandoned abduction scheme. This plan was as brief and simple as it was horrible. Powell, alias Payne, the stalwart, brutal, simple-minded boy from Florida, was to murder Seward. Atzerat, the comic villain of the drama, was assigned to remove Andrew Johnson. Booth reserved for himself the most conspicuous role of the tragedy. It was Harold's duty to attend him as page and aid him in his escape. Minor parts were given to stage carpenters and other hangers-on, who probably did not understand what it all meant. Harold, Atzerat, and Surratt had previously deposited at a tavern at Surrattsville, Maryland, owned by Mrs. Surratt, but kept by a man named Lloyd, a quantity of arms and materials to be used in the abduction scheme. Mrs. Surratt, being at the tavern on the 11th, warned Lloyd 
to have the shooting irons in readiness, and visiting the place again on the 14th, told him they would probably be called for that night. The preparations for the final blow were made with feverish haste. It was only about noon of the 14th that Booth learned that the President was to go to Ford's Theater that night to see the play Our American Cousin. It has always been a matter of surprise in Europe that he should have been at a place of amusement on Good Friday, but the day was not kept sacred in America except by members of certain churches. The President was fond of the theater. It was one of his few means of recreation. Besides, the town was thronged with soldiers and officers, all eager to see him. By appearing in public, he would gratify many people whom he could not otherwise meet. Mrs. Lincoln had asked General and Mrs. Grant to accompany her. They had accepted, and the announcement that they would be present had been made in the evening papers. But they changed their plans and went north by an afternoon train. Mrs. Lincoln then invited, in their stead, Miss Harris and Major Rathbone, the daughter and the stepson of Senator Ira Harris. Being detained by visitors, the play had made some progress when the President appeared. The band struck up, Hail to the Chief. The actor ceased playing. The audience rose, cheering tumultuously. The President bowed in acknowledgment, and the play went on. From the moment he learned of the President's intention, Booth's every action was alert and energetic. He and his confederates were seen on horseback in every part of the city. He had a hurried conference with Mrs. Surratt before she started for Lloyd's Tavern. He entrusted to an actor named Matthews a carefully prepared statement of his reasons for committing the murder, which he charged him to give to the publisher of the National Intelligencer, but which Matthews in the terror and dismay of the night, burned without showing to anyone. Booth was perfectly at home in Ford's theater. Either by himself or with the aid of friends, he arranged his whole plan of attack and escape during the afternoon. He counted upon address and audacity to gain access to the small passage behind the President's box. Once there, he guarded against interference by an arrangement of a wooden bar to be fastened by a simple mortise in the angle of the wall and the door by which he had entered, so that the door could not be opened from without. He even provided for the contingency of not gaining entrance to the box by boring a hole in its door through which he might either observe the occupants or take aim and shoot. He hired at a livery stable a small fleet horse. A few minutes before ten o'clock, leaving his horse at the rear of the theater in charge of a call-boy, he went to a neighboring saloon, took a drink of brandy, and, entering the theater, passed rapidly to the little hallway leading to the president's box. Showing a card to the servant in attendance, he was allowed to enter, closed the door noiselessly, and secured it with the wooden bar he had previously made ready, without disturbing any of the occupants of the box, between whom and himself yet remained the partition and the door through which he had made the hole. No one, not even the comedian who uttered them, could ever remember the last words of the peace that were spoken that night, the last Abraham Lincoln heard upon the earth. The tragedy in the box turned play and players to the most unsubstantial of phantoms. Here were five human beings in a narrow space, the greatest man of his time, and the glory of the most stupendous success of our history. His wife, proud and happy, a pair of betrothed lovers, with all the promise of felicity that youth, social position, and wealth could give them, and this handsome young actor, the pet of his little world. The glitter of fame, happiness, and ease was upon the entire group, yet in an instant, everything was to be changed. Quick death was to come to the central figure, the central figure of the century's great and famous men. Over the rest hovered fates from which a mother might pray kindly death to save her children in their infancy. One was to wander with a stain of murder upon his soul, in frightful physical pain, with a price upon his head and the curse of a world upon his name. 
until he died a dog's death in a burning barn. The wife was to pass the rest of her days in melancholy and madness, and one of the lovers was to slay the other and end his life a raving maniac. The murderer seemed to himself to be taking part in a play. Hate and brandy had for weeks kept his brain in a morbid state. Holding a pistol in one hand and a knife in the other, he opened the box door, put the pistol to the president's head, and fired. Major Rathbone sprang to grapple with him, and received a savage knife wound in the arm. Then, rushing forward, Booth placed his hand on the railing of the box and vaulted to the stage. It was a high leap, but nothing to such an athlete. He would have got safely away, but for his spur catching in the flag that draped the front of the box. He fell, the torn flag trailing on his spur, but, though the fall had broken his leg, he rose instantly, and brandishing his knife and shouting, Six Semper Tyrannus, fled rapidly across the stage and out of sight. Major Rathbone called, Stop him! The cry rang out, He has shot the President! And from the audience, stupid at first with surprise, and wild afterward with excitement and horror, two or three men jumped upon the stage in pursuit of the assassin. But he ran through the familiar passages, leaped upon his horse, rewarding with a kick and a curse the boy who held him, and escaped into the night. The President scarcely moved, his head drooped forward slightly, his eyes closed. Major Rathbone, not regarding his own grievous hurt, rushed to the door of the box to summon aid. He found it barred, and someone on the outside beating and clamoring for admittance. It was at once seen that the President's wound was mortal. A large Derringer bullet had entered the back of the head on the left side, and, passing through the brain, lodged just behind the left eye. He was carried to a house across the street and laid upon a bed in a small room. Mrs. Lincoln followed, tenderly cared for by Miss Harris. Rathbone, exhausted by loss of blood, fainted and was taken home. Messengers were sent for the cabinet, for the Surgeon General, for Dr. Stone, Mr. Lincoln's family physician, and for others whose official or private relations to the President gave them the right to be there. A crowd of people rushed instinctively to the White House, and bursting through the doors, shouted the dreadful news to Robert Lincoln and Major Hay, who sat together in an upper room. They ran downstairs, and as they were entering a carriage to drive to 10th Street, a friend came up and told them that Mr. Seward and most of the cabinet had been murdered. The news seemed so improbable that they hoped it was all untrue, but, on reaching 10th Street, the excitement and the gathering crowds prepared them for the worst. In a few moments, those who had been sent for, and many others, were assembled in the little chamber where the chief of the state lay in his agony. His son was met at the door by Dr. Stone, who with grave tenderness informed him that there was no hope. The President had been shot a few minutes after 10. The wound would have brought instant death to most men, but his vital tenacity was remarkable. He was, of course, unconscious from the first moment, but he breathed slow and regular respiration throughout the night. As the dawn came and the lamplight grew pale, his pulse began to fail, but his face, even then, was scarcely more haggard than those of the sorrowing men around him. His automatic moaning ceased, a look of unspeakable peace came upon his worn features, and at twenty-two minutes after seven he died. Stanton broke the silence by saying, Now he belongs to the ages. Booth had done his work efficiently. His principal subordinate, Payne, had acted with equal audacity and cruelty, but not with equally fatal result. Going to the home of the Secretary of State, who lay ill in bed, he had forced his way to Mr. Seward's room on the pretext of being a messenger from the physician with a packet of medicine to deliver. The servant at the door tried to prevent him from going upstairs. The secretary's son, Frederick W. Seward, hearing the noise, 
stepped out into the hall to check the intruders. Payne rushed upon him with a pistol, which missed fire, then rained blows with it upon his head, and grappling and struggling, the two came to the secretary's room and fell together through the door. Frederick Seward soon became unconscious and remained so for several weeks, being, perhaps, the last man in the civilized world to learn the strange story of the night. The secretary's daughter and a soldier nurse were in the room. Payne struck them right and left, wounding the nurse with his knife, and then, rushing to the bed, began striking at the throat of the crippled statesman, inflicting three terrible wounds on his neck and cheek. The nurse recovered himself and seized the assassin from behind, while another son, roused by his sister's screams, came into the room and managed at last to force him outside the door, not, however, until he and the nurse had been stabbed repeatedly. Payne broke away at last and ran downstairs, seriously wounding an attendant on the way, reached the door unhurt, sprang upon his horse, and rode leisurely away. When surgical aid arrived, the secretary's house looked like a field hospital. Five of its inmates were bleeding from ghastly wounds, and two of them, among the highest officials of the nation, it was thought might never see the light of another day, though all providentially recovered. The assassin left behind him his hat, which apparently trivial loss cost him and one of his fellow conspirators their lives. Fearing that the lack of it would arouse suspicion, he abandoned his horse, instead of making good his escape, and hid himself in the woods east of Washington for two days. Driven at last by hunger, he returned to the city and presented himself at Mrs. Surratt's house at the very moment when all its inmates had been arrested and were about to be taken to the office of the provost marshal. Payne thus fell into the hands of justice, and the utterance of half a dozen words by him and the unhappy woman whose shelter he sought proved the death warrant of them both. Booth had been recognized by dozens of people as he stood before the footlights and brandished his dagger, but his swift horse quickly carried him beyond any haphazard pursuit. He crossed the Navy Yard Bridge and rode into Maryland, being joined very soon by Harold. The assassin and his wretched acolyte came at midnight to Mrs. Surratt's tavern, and afterward pushed on through the moonlight to the house of an acquaintance of Booth, a surgeon named Mudd, who set Booth's leg and gave him a room where he rested until evening, when Mudd sent them on their desolate way south. After parting with him, they went to the residence of Samuel Cox near Port Tobacco, and were by him given into the charge of Thomas Jones, a contraband trader between Maryland and Richmond, a man so devoted to the interests of the Confederacy that treason and murder seemed everyday incidents to be accepted as natural and necessary. He kept Booth and Harold in hiding at the peril of his life for a week, feeding and caring for them in the woods near his house, watching for an opportunity to ferry them across the Potomac. Doing this while every wood path was haunted by government detectives, well knowing that death would promptly follow his detection, and that a reward was offered for the capture of his helpless charge that would make a rich man of anyone who gave him up. With such devoted aid, Booth might have wandered a long way, but there was no final escape but suicide for an assassin with a broken leg. At each painful move, the chances of discovery increased. Jones was able, after repeated failures, to row his fated guests across the Potomac. Arriving on the Virginia side, they lived the lives of hunted animals for two or three days longer, finding to their horror that they were received by the strongest confederates with more of annoyance than enthusiasm, though none, indeed, offered to betray them. Booth had, by this time, seen the comments of the newspapers on his work, and bitterer than death or bodily suffering was the blow to his vanity. He confided his feelings of wrong to his diary, comparing himself favorably with Brutus and Tell, and complaining, I am abandoned with the curse of Cain upon me, when, if the world knew my heart, that one blow would have made me great. 
On the night of April 25th, he and Harold were surrounded by a party under Lieutenant E. P. Doherty as they lay sleeping in a barn belonging to one garret in Caroline County, Virginia, on the road to Bowling Green. When called upon to surrender, Booth refused. A parley took place, after which Doherty told him he would fire the barn. At this Harold came out and surrendered. The barn was fired, and while it was burning, Booth, clearly visible through the cracks in the building, was shot by Boston Corbett, a sergeant of cavalry. He was hit in the back of the neck, not far from the place where he had shot the president, lingering about three hours in great pain, and died at seven in the morning. The surviving conspirators, with the exception of John H. Surratt, were tried by military commissions sitting in Washington in the months of May and June. The charges against them specified that they were incited and encouraged to treason and murder by Jefferson Davis and the Confederate emissaries in Canada. This was not proved on the trial, though the evidence bearing on the case showed frequent communications between Canada and Richmond and the Booth Coterie in Washington and some transactions in drafts at the Montreal Bank, where Jacob Thompson and Booth both kept accounts. Mrs. Surratt, Payne, Harold, and Atzerat were hanged on August 7. Mudd, Arnold, and O'Laughlin were imprisoned for life at the Tortugas, the term being afterward shortened, and Spangler, the scene-shifter at the theater, was sentenced to six years in jail. John H. Surratt escaped to Canada, and from there to England. He wandered over Europe, and finally was detected in Egypt and brought back to Washington in 1867, where his trial lasted two months and ended in a disagreement of the jury. Upon the hearts of a people glowing with joy of victory, the news of the President's assassination fell as a great shock. It was the first time the telegraph had been called upon to spread over the world tidings of such deep and mournful significance. In the stunning effect of the unspeakable calamity, the country lost sight of the national success of the past week, and it thus came to pass that there was never any organized expression of the general exultation or rejoicing in the North over the downfall of the rebellion. It was unquestionably best that it should be so, and Lincoln himself would not have had it otherwise. He hated the arrogance of triumph, and even in his cruel death he would have been glad to know that his passage to eternity would prevent too loud an exultation over the vanquished. As it was, the South could take no umbrage at a grief so genuine and so legitimate. The people of that section even shared, to a certain degree, and the lamentations over the beer of one whom, in their inmost hearts, they knew to have wished them well. There was one exception to the general grief too remarkable to be passed over in silence. Among the extreme radicals in Congress, Mr. Lincoln's determined clemency and liberality toward the Southern people had made an impression so unfavorable that, though they were naturally shocked at his murder, they did not, among themselves, conceal their gratification that he was no longer in the way. In a political caucus, held a few hours after the President's death, the feeling was nearly universal, to quote the language of one of their most prominent representatives, that the accession of Johnson to the presidency would prove a godsend to the country. In Washington, with this singular exception, the manifestation of public grief was immediate and demonstrative. Within an hour after the body was taken to the White House, the town was shrouded in black. Not only the public buildings, the shops, and the better residences were draped in funeral decorations, but still more touching proof of affection was seen in the poorest classes of houses, where laboring men of both colors found means in their penury to afford some scanty show of mourning. The interest and the veneration of people still centered in the White House, where, under a tall catafalque in the East Room, the late chief lay in the majesty of death, and not at the modest tavern on Pennsylvania Avenue, where the new president had his lodging. 
and where Chief Justice Chase administered the oath of office to him at eleven o'clock on the morning of April 15th. It was determined that the funeral ceremonies in Washington should be celebrated on Wednesday, April 19, and all the churches throughout the country were invited to join at the same time in appropriate observances. The ceremonies in the East Room were brief and simple, the burial service, a prayer, and a short address, while all the pomp and circumstance which the government could command was employed to give a fitting escort from the White House to the Capitol, where the body of the President was to lie in state. The vast procession moved amid the booming of minute guns, and the tolling of all the bells in Washington, Georgetown, and Alexandria, and to associate the pomp of the day with the greatest work of Lincoln's life, a detachment of colored troops marched at the head of the line. As soon as it was announced that Mr. Lincoln was to be buried at Springfield, Illinois, every town and city on the route begged that the train might halt within its limits and give its people the opportunity of testifying their grief and reverence. It was finally arranged that the funeral cortege should follow substantially the same route over which he had come in 1861 to take possession of the office to which he had given a new dignity and value for all time. On April 21, accompanied by a guard of honor, and in a train decked with somber trappings, the journey was begun. At Baltimore, through which, four years before, it was a question whether the president-elect could pass with safety to his life, the coffin was taken with reverent care to the great dome of the exchange where, surrounded with evergreens and lilies, it lay for several hours, the people passing by in mournful throngs. The same demonstration was repeated, gaining continually in intensity of feeling and solemn splendor of display in every city through which the procession passed. The reception in New York was worthy alike of the great city and of the memory of the man they honored, the body lay in state in the city hall, and a half million people passed in deep silence before it. Here General Scott came, pale and feeble, but resolute, to pay his tribute of respect to his departed friend and commander. The train went up the Hudson River by night, and at every town and village on the way vast waiting crowds were revealed by the fitful glare of torches and dirges and hymns were sung. As the train passed into Ohio, the crowds increased in density, and the public grief seemed intensified at every step westward. The people of the great central basin were claiming their own. The day spent at Cleveland was unexampled in the depth of emotion it brought to life. Some of the guard of honor have said that it was at this point they began to appreciate the place which Lincoln was to hold in history. The last stage of this extraordinary progress was completed, and Springfield reached at nine o'clock on the morning of May 3rd. Nothing had been done or thought of for two weeks in Springfield but the preparations for this day, and they had been made with a thoroughness which surprised the visitors from the east. The body lay in state in the capital, which was richly draped from roof to basement in black velvet and silver fringe. Within it was a bower of bloom and fragrance. For twenty-four hours an unbroken stream of people passed through, bidding their friend and neighbor welcome home and farewell, and at ten o'clock on May 4 the coffin lid was closed, and a vast procession moved out to Oak Ridge where the town had set apart a lovely spot for his grave, and where the dead president was committed to the soil of the state which had so loved and honored him. The ceremonies at the grave were simple and touching. Bishop Simpson delivered a pathetic oration. Prayers were offered, and hymns were sung. But the weightiest and most eloquent words uttered anywhere that day were those of the second inaugural which the committee had wisely ordained to be read over his grave, as the friends of Raphael 
chose the incomparable canvas of the transfiguration to be the chief ornament of his funeral. End of chapter 37 Read by Alana Jordan Chapter 38 of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan. A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay. Chapter 38. Lincoln's Early Environment, Its Effect on His Character, His Attitude Toward Slavery and the Slaveholder, His Schooling and Disappointment, His Seeming Failures, His Real Successes, The Final Trial, His Achievements, His Place in History. A child born to an inheritance of want, a boy growing up in a narrow world of ignorance, a youth taking up the burden of coarse manual labor, a man entering on the doubtful struggle of a local backwoods career. These were the beginnings of Abraham Lincoln. If we analyze them under the hard, practical, cynical philosophy, which takes for its motto that nothing succeeds but success, if, however, we adopt a broader philosophy and apply the more genuous and more universal principle that everything succeeds which attacks favorable opportunity with fitting endeavor, then we see that it was the strong vitality, the active intelligence, and the indefinable psychological law of moral growth that assimilates the good and rejects the bad which nature gave this obscure child that carried him to the service of mankind and to the admiration of the centuries with the same certainty with which the acorn grows to be the oak. We see how even the limitations of his environment helped the end. Self-reliance, that most vital characteristic of the pioneer, was his by blood and birth and training, and developed through the privations of his lot and the genius that was in him to the mighty strength needed to guide our great country through the titanic struggle of the Civil War. The sense of equality was his, also by virtue of his pioneer training, a consciousness fostered by life from childhood to manhood, in a state of society where there were neither rich to envy nor poor to despise, where the gifts and hardships of the forest were distributed impartially to each, and where men stood indeed equal before the forces of unsubdued nature. The same great forces taught liberality, modesty, charity, sympathy, in a word, neighborliness. In that hard life, far removed from the artificial aids and comforts of civilization, where all the wealth of Croesus, had a man possessed it, would not have sufficed to purchase relief from danger or help in time of need, neighborliness became of prime importance. A good neighbor doubled his safety and his resources. A group of good neighbors increased his comfort and his prospects in a ratio that grew like the cube root. Here was opportunity to practice that virtue that Christ declared to be next to the love of God, the fruitful injunction to love thy neighbor as thyself. Here, too, in communities far from the customary restraints of organized law, the common native intelligence of the pioneer was brought face to face with primary and practical questions of natural right. These men not only understood, but appreciated the American doctrine of self-government, it was this understanding, this feeling, which taught Lincoln to write, When the white man governs himself, 
that is self-government. But when he governs himself and also governs another man, that is more than self-government. That is depotism. And its philosophic corollary, he who would be no slave must consent to have no slave. Abraham Lincoln sprang from exceptional conditions, was in truth, and the language of Lowell, a new birth of our new soil. But this distinction was not due alone to mere environment. The ordinary man, with ordinary natural gifts, found in Western pioneer communities a development essentially the same as he would have found under colonial or Puritan New England, a commonplace life varying only with the changing ideas and customs of time and locality. But for the man with extraordinary powers of body and mind, for the individual gifted by nature with a genius which Abraham Lincoln possessed, the pioneer condition, with its severe training in self-denial, patience, and industry, was favorable to a development of character that helped, in a preeminent degree, to qualify him for the duties and responsibilities of leadership and government. He escaped the formal conventionalities which beget insincerity and dissimulation. He grew up without being warped by erroneous ideas or false principles, without being dwarfed by vanity or tempted by self-interest. Some pioneer communities carried with them the institution of slavery, and in the slave state of Kentucky Lincoln was born. He remained there only a short time, and we have every reason to suppose that wherever he might have grown to maturity, his very mental and moral fiber would have spurned the doctrine and practice of human slavery. And yet so subtle is the influence of birth and custom that we can trace one lasting effect of this early and brief environment. Though he ever hated slavery, he never hated the slaveholder. This ineradicable feeling of pardon and sympathy for Kentucky and the South played no insignificant part in his dealings with grave problems of statesmanship. He struck slavery its death blow with the hand of war, but he tendered the slaveholder a golden equivalent with the hand of friendship and peace. His advancement in the astonishing career which carried him from obscurity to worldwide fame, from postmaster of New Salem Village to President of the United States, from captain of a backwoods volunteer company to commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy was neither sudden nor accidental nor easy. He was both ambitious and successful, but his ambition was moderate and his success was slow, and because his success was slow, his ambition never outgrew either his judgment or his powers. From the day when he left the paternal roof and launched his canoe on the headwaters of the Sangamon River to begin life on his own account, to the day of his first inauguration, there intervened full thirty years of toil, of study, self-denial, patience, often of effort baffled, of hope deferred, sometimes of bitter disappointment. Given the natural gift of great genius, given the condition of favorable environment, it yet required an average lifetime and faithful, unrelaxing effort to transform the raw country stripling into a competent ruler for this great nation. Almost every success was balanced, sometimes overbalanced, by a seeming failure. Reversing the usual promotion, he went into the Black Hawk War a captain, and, through no fault of his own, came out a private. He rode to the hostile frontier on horseback and trudged home on foot. His store winked out. His surveyor's compass and chain, with which he was earning a scanty living, were sold for debt. He was defeated in his first campaign for the legislature, defeated in his first attempt to be nominated for Congress, defeated in his application to be appointed commissioner of the General Land Office, defeated for the Senate in the Illinois legislature of 1854, when he had 45 votes to begin with, by Trumbull, who had only five votes to begin with, 
defeated in the legislature of 1858 by an antiquated apportionment, when his joint debates with Douglas had won him a popular plurality of nearly 4,000 in a democratic state, defeated in the nomination for vice president on the Fremont ticket in 1856, when a favorable nod from half a dozen wire workers would have brought him success. Failures? Not so. Every seeming defeat was a slow success. He was the growth of the oak and not of Jonah's gourd. Every scaffolding of temporary elevation he pulled down, every ladder of transient expectation which broke under his feet accumulated his strength, and piled up a solid mound which raised him to wider usefulness and clearer vision. He could not become a master workman until he had served a tedious apprenticeship. It was the quarter of a century of reading, thinking, speech-making, and legislating which qualified him for selection as the chosen champion of the Illinois Republicans in the great Lincoln-Douglas joint debates of 1858. It was the great intellectual victory won in these debates, plus the title Honest Old Abe, won by truth and manhood among his neighbors during a whole generation that led the people of the United States to confide to his hands the duties and powers of president. And when, after thirty years of endeavor, success had beaten down defeat, when Lincoln had been nominated, elected, and inaugurated, came the crowning trial of his faith and constancy. When the people, by free and lawful choice, had placed honor and power in his hands, when his signature could convene Congress, approve laws, make ministers, cause ships to sail and armies to move, when he could speak with potential voice to other rulers of other lands, there suddenly came upon the government and the nation the symptoms of a fatal paralysis. Honor seemed to dwindle and power to vanish. Was he then, after all, not to be president? Was patriotism dead? Was the Constitution waste paper? Was the Union gone? The indications were indeed ominous. Seven states were in rebellion. There was treason in Congress treason in the Supreme Court, treason in the Army and Navy. Confusion and discord rent public opinion. To use Lincoln's own forcible simile, sinners were calling the righteous to repentance. Finally, the flag, insulted on the Star of the West, trailed in capitulation at Sumter. And then came the humiliation of the Baltimore riot, and the President practically for a few days a prisoner in the capital of the nation. But his apprenticeship had been served, and there was no more failure. With faith and justice and generosity, he conducted for four long years a civil war whose frontiers stretched from the Potomac to the Rio Grande, whose soldiers numbered a million men on each side, in which, counting skirmishes and battles small and great, was fought an average of two engagements every day, and during which every twenty-four hours saw an expenditure of two millions of money. The labor, the thought, the responsibility, the strain of intellect, and anguish of soul that he gave to this great task, who can measure? The sincerity of the fathers of the Republic was impugned. He justified them. The Declaration of Independence was called a string of glittering generalities and a self-evident lie. He refuted the aspersion. The Constitution was perverted. He corrected the error. The flag was insulted. He redressed the offense. The government was assailed. He restored its authority. Slavery thrust the sword of civil war at the heart of the nation. He crushed slavery and cemented the purified Union in new and stronger bonds. And all the while conciliation was as active as vindication was stern. He reasoned and pleaded with the anger of the South. He gave insurrection time to repent. He forbore to execute retaliation. He offered recompense to slaveholders. He pardoned treason. But what lifetime schooling in disappointment? What but the pioneer's self-reliance and freedom from prejudice? What but the patient faith 
the clear perceptions of natural right, the unwarped sympathy and unbounding charity of this man with spirit so humble and soul so great could have carried him through the labors he wrought to the victory he attained. As the territory may be said to be its body, and its material activities its blood, so patriotism may be said to be the vital breath of a nation. When patriotism dies, the nation dies, and its resources as well as its territory go to other peoples with stronger vitality. Patriotism can in no way be more effectively cultivated than by studying and commemorating the achievements and virtues of our great men, the men who have lived and died for the nation, who have advanced its prosperity, increased its power, added to its glory. In our brief history, the United States can boast of many great men, and the achievement by its sons of many great deeds. And if we accord the first rank to Washington as founder, so must we unhesitatingly give to Lincoln the second place as preserver and regenerator of American liberty. So far, however, from being opposed or subordinated, either to the other, the popular heart has already canonized these two as twin heroes in our national pantheon, as twin stars in the firmament of our national fame. End of chapter 38 End of A Short Life of Abraham Lincoln by John G. Nicolay